the freedom intellectual reconquista, the growing Austrian economics worldwide revolution and resulting dissolution of myths arising from biochemical and socio-economic complexity, germ theory, socialism, anti-Semitism, Zionism. By Jorge Basada and Free Marketeers. Quotes, If you care about your fucking country, read Ludwig von Mises and the Six Lessons of the Austrian Economic School. Renato Sound Money Moicano. The ultimate result of shielding men from the effects of folly, is to fill the world with fools. Herbert Spencer. No one can be perfectly free till all are free, no one can be perfectly moral till all are moral, no one can be perfectly happy till all are happy. Herbert Spencer. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. George Orwell. Many people, especially ignorant people, want to punish you for speaking the truth, for being correct, for being you. Never apologize for being correct, or for being years ahead of your time. If you're right and you know it, speak your mind. Speak your mind. Even if you are a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. Mahatma Gandhi. Give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience, above all liberties. John Milton. Those who make conversations impossible, make escalation inevitable. Stefan Molyneux a constitution, as important as it is, will mean nothing unless the people are yearning for liberty and freedom. U.S. Supreme Court, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression, this right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media, and regardless of frontiers. United Nations, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Majorities are no less exposed, to error and frustration than kings and dictators. That a fact is deemed true by the majority does not prove its truth. Mises. There have always been men who voluntarily renounced many pleasures and satisfactions in order to do what they considered right and moral. Men have preferred martyrdom to the renunciation of what they believed to be true. They have chosen poverty and exile because they wanted to be free in the search for truth and wisdom. All that is noblest in the progress of civilization, welfare, and enlightenment has been the achievement of such men, who braved every danger and defied the tyranny of powerful kings and fanatical masses. Mises. It is difficult to get a man to understand something, when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Upton Sinclair. As should be increasingly clear, economics is a science which can make possible the construction of a social and political system in which human success is a feature of normal, everyday life everywhere. It is truly the humanitarian science, and only those who have studied it well and who are prepared to implement its teachings deserve to be called friends of mankind. The most important charity which true friends of mankind can pursue is to disseminate knowledge of this vital subject as widely and as deeply as they know how. George Reisman. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. F. A. Hayek. We must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, F. A. Hayek. Economic history is a long record of government policies that failed because they were designed with a bold, disregard for the laws of economics. Mises. It is human nature that repeats itself, not history. John Toland. It is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. Voltaire. Society has arisen out of the works of peace, the essence of society is peacemaking. Mises. Most of the tyrants, despots, and dictators are sincerely convinced that their rule is beneficial for the people, that theirs is government for the people. Mises. If trouble must come, let it come in my time, so that my children can live in peace. Thomas Paine. A minority is in a very awkward position. The individuals in it can't afford to be just as good as the individuals in the majority. If they hope to convert the majority they have to be much better, and the smaller the minority, 
the better they have to be. They have to think better. They have to know more. They have to write better. They have to have better controversial manners. Above all, they have to have far more courage. And they have to be infinitely patient. Henry Hazlitt. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus Christ. Preface. This book is a collaborative open source project put together by the Free Marketeers Network. Please note that most of our titles share content. If you would like to learn more, contribute to books, or donate please visit https colon slash slash www.freemarketeers.org Introduction, Without the Wisdom of the Austrians Mankind Drifts Towards Extinction. In August 10, 1915, British physicist Henry Moseley, who would have probably won the Nobel Prize that year, died in perhaps the most disastrous era mankind has thus far made, the First World War, 1914-18. Bright and pious slightly smarter apes that had absorbed, German French British Russian identities, students, fathers engineers, great minds and experts, who even shared a common European Christian faith, reverted to their tribal ape-like nature, and for God, honor, flag and country, slaughtered each other leading to about 18 million deaths and millions more left invalid, 6.5 million just in France. At 7.30 am July 1, 1916 the Battle of the Somme began. On this single day, just the British alone, had about 20,000 fatalities and 35,000 wounded. On that day a British soldier was either killed or wounded on average every second. The honor of a military career would lead to disproportionately higher losses for the upper classes for all belligerents. Germany's top general, Erich Ludendorff would lose two sons, as would future British Prime Minister Andrew Bonner Law. British Prime Minister at the start of the war, Herbert Asquith, lost one. While about 12% of British troops would die in the war, 31% of Oxford's 1913 graduating class would die. This should help abolish the popular naive myth that politicians are quick to bring about wars while wanting to avoid personal loses in them. Nonsense unfortunately, human beings are slightly smarter apes that have been naturally selected to be vicious killers and to enjoy violence. Warfare predation was an important evolutionary strategy and one of the reasons we are social and have evolved big brains to begin with. As Steven Pinker writes, Men go to war to get or keep women not necessarily as a conscious goal of the warriors though often it is exactly that, but as the ultimate payoff that allowed a willingness to fight to evolve. Access to women is the limiting factor on males' reproductive success. Having two wives can double a man's children, having three wives can triple it, and so on. The most common spoils of tribal warfare are women. Raiders kill the men, abduct the nubile women, gang-rape them, and allocate them as wives. To be successful in war hunt you need a strong sense of unity which translates itself into the strong tribalistic nationalist militaristic patriotic tendencies we are so susceptible to and has the planet littered with nuclear weapons and civilized taxpayers believing we must have them. The bond men make as co-warriors may be stronger than male-female love. A female is easily replaceable, another raid, etc., but the loss of that co-warrior that will help get the next female and or defend you when you only get one chance at life is probably even more important. Just like natural selection has shaped us to enjoy sex due to the vital biological evolutionary importance, it has also shaped us to enjoy war violence and easily segregating ourselves into the in-group as good versus out-group them evil. Given its importance, War patriotism easily fills us with a great sense of purpose. England's Prime Minister during World War II and national hero Winston Churchill shows us how inspiring, exciting and purposeful World War I was to him when he mentioned, I think a curse should rest on me dash because I love this war. I know it's smashing and shattering the lives of thousands every moment dash, and yet dash I can't help it dash I enjoy every second of it. Churchill, Churchill wrote to his wife, everything tends towards catastrophe and collapse. I am interested, geared up and happy. Is it not horrible to be built like that? 
Churchill also told Prime Minister Asquith that his life's ambition was, to command great victorious armies in battle. Churchill again, my God! This is living history. Everything we are doing and saying is thrilling. Why I would not be out of this glorious delicious war for anything the world could give me. Churchill, Pomago Asquith, towards the end of World War II, Russia's Red Army, is estimated to have raped over two million German women. Equally human, the Allies Americans weren't much better and generally saw the Japanese as an inferior race and cared little for their suffering or views, as US President who needlessly nuked Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Harry S. Truman, mentions in a letter, the only language they seem to understand is the one we have been using to bombard them. When you have to deal with a beast you have to treat him as a beast. Truman letter to Samuel McCraycovert, General Secretary of the Churches of Christ in America. We shouldn't be shocked when men murder, rape and torture, or masturbate to tentacle porn, the real miracle that has taken thousands of years of cultural legal evolution to create, are the modern cultural values laws ideologies software we absorb that program homo sapiens into respecting the body property thoughts of all human beings regardless of age, sex beliefs, and race. Being the social slightly smarter apes that we are, fellow humans are our biggest assets which helps explain the evolution of altruism compassion, as well as our biggest competitors which helps us understand our horrendous violence towards fellow men. During the early days in the lead-up to World War I there was an atmosphere of joy and excitement, as thousands of young men celebrated and volunteered for the coming war which would bring unity, purpose, and glory. After the war, when much of Europe lay in ruins, many were numb and in a state of stupor wondering how they could have fooled themselves into such needless carnage. Why did this happen? And if it was such a big deal at the time, worth sacrificing so much, how come hardly anybody knows anything about it today? Twenty years later via World War II the tribalistic slaughter led to over 80 million deaths and what followed was a cold war that brought the slightly smarter apes close to nuclear annihilation several times. Why were our great leaders and intellectuals utterly powerless to prevent the World War I and II slaughters and were in fact its promoters? How can mankind today build mind-bogglingly complex microchips, airplanes, satellites, the internet and so much more, yet still not have figured out something as simple as peace and always be one spark away from another worldwide tribalistic tyrannical and chaotic calamity as Covid mania, and the Russia-Ukraine and Israeli Hamas wars are clearly showing. There is something missing from our understanding of how the world works, something as monumental in importance as Darwin's theory of evolution, something that our leading intellectuals and experts have yet to discover and spread accordingly. Fortunately for mankind that something has already been discovered and explained by a group of little-known and widely misunderstood evolutionary intellectuals oftentimes referred to as the Austrian School of Economics. And as 1974 Nobel laureate in economics, F. A. Hayek 1899-1992, writes, their vital insights and fundamental ideas belong fully and wholly to Karl Menger, 1840-1921. Hayek provides a simple answer to the questions above. However, this answer can be a bit hard to swallow for the prideful slightly smarter apes, but swallow it we must if we are to prevent the next World War I-like calamity. The answer is the following, human beings are slightly smarter vicious apes whose instincts are ideally suited to living in small tribes of less than 100 people but find themselves relatively lost in the modern socio-economic order where things like money, profit loss calculation, economic competition, and interest rates coordinate the actions of billions of human beings all over the world to create what the great British 19th century thinker Herbert Spencer referred to as the social organism, which can also be seen as an incredibly complex movie like Matrix that did not exist 20,000 years ago. Tribal warfare, political infighting, coercing each other, rape, and the law of the jungle, are things we have been doing for millions of years and are somewhat intuitive, commercial society, the tolerance and wisdom needed to refrain from coercing others, and understanding the aforementioned economic concepts which have been around for less than a few thousand years, are not. Hayek summarizes, man's instincts, were not made for the kinds of surroundings, and for the numbers, 
in which he now lives. They were adapted to life in the small roving bands or troops in which the human race and its immediate ancestors evolved during the few million years while the biological constitution of Homo sapiens was being formed. Most of us associate natural selection with people like Charles Darwin and the biological world of animals and living things, but natural selection also evolved the socio-economic order and things like religions, laws, customs, language, and especially for our purposes, the many socio-economic institutions that make up our modern economies. And, very importantly, it is also indispensable for understanding our geopolitical conflicts like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as well as their history. In other words, at a fundamental level natural selection creates both the biological as well as the socio-economic orders and is indispensable for understanding how they have come into existence and behave. As Hayek writes, we understand now that all enduring structures above the level of the simplest atoms, and up to the brain and society, are the results of, and can be explained only in terms of, processes of selective evolution. Most people fear the concepts of natural selection and evolution with good reason, we don't really understand them, especially when it comes to the concept of race and socio-economic achievement. Popular phrases associated with evolution like Herbert Spencer's survival of the fittest can scare us and keep us away from learning these vital subjects. Racist and erroneous ideologies like the ones that flourished in Hitler's Germany were also heavily influenced by faulty evolutionary thought and still play a significant role today. Just like the human body organism and the numerous systems that coordinate it like the respiratory nervous digestive systems, are the result of the actions of some 70 trillion human and bacterial cells but obviously not the result of any conscious planning or designing by them, and thanks to the likes of Darwin and a modern understanding of genetics we can understand how natural selection was the inadvertent designer of such systems and complex order. The modern global socio-economic order social organism, is also coordinated by a system, by what economists of the so-called Austrian school like Ludwig von Mises and his great protégé F. A. Hayek, referred to as the market process. The market process and the parts it is composed of like money, prices, economic competition, interest rates, and the legal religious governmental frameworks that sustain it, are indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design, Adam Ferguson, similar to how cells inadvertently unconsciously act to create the systems that coordinate multicellular life. The market process shares this trait with language which is also a complex mechanism that is the result of human action but was not consciously designed or invented by people cells. It took about one billion years for natural selection to evolve the numerous complex biochemical systems that allow single cells to cooperate leading to multicellular animals. Sometimes these mechanisms fail and the cells revert to their solitary ways and replicate wildly, in other words, they become cancerous tribal or uncooperative and prematurely destroy the larger multicellular organism order they were a part of. Similarly, it took about 50,000 years for natural selection to evolve the market process which reordered tribal Homo sapiens into cooperative members of the social organism. Unfortunately, the economically ignorant tribal slightly smarter apes intuitively turn cancerous when they destroy the market process via coercive central planning socialism, because it inadvertently destroys diminishes the freedom of individuals which is vital for the functioning of the social organism. We are members of a matrix or social organism whose workings hardly anyone really understands, unless you have heard of Ludwig von Mises, and whose evolution is understood by an even smaller number of people, Menger and Hayek are needed here. Standing on Karl Menger's and Mises' shoulders, who provided him with a superb explanation of the workings of the economy and thus all aspects of the market process money prices interest rates etc., and much, 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 much more, Hayek would go on to explain how in a few thousand years culture and the market process had co-evolved to transform Homo sapiens, from tribes of slightly smarter vicious apes, into today's massively complex global socio-economic order social organism thus arguably becoming the first person in the history of mankind to provide a complete evolutionary framework for understanding how the entire world works. Ignorance of how the socio-economic order works and has evolved is what keeps plunging the slightly smarter apes, 
regardless of their experts and great leaders, into tribalistic world wars and socio-economic disasters. Notice how all man-made calamities, from religious slaughters, to world wars, to political chaos, are always, always. The result of large groups of Homo sapiens coercing each other via government, forcing each other to go along with the prevailing myths of the times. We have simply not evolved to understand the economic forces that create civilization, the vital need for freedom and privatization, and the immense harm that too much government can do. Supposedly the dodo bird quickly went extinct because it had not evolved to recognize humans as potential dangers, we similarly just line up for central planning and government coordinated self-destruction over and over and over and over. Imagine you had a time machine and went back in time about 300 years to Salem, Massachusetts during the famed Salem Witch Trials, 1692-3, where 19 women were hanged for witchcraft, and told people that the world could function much better if there was no slavery and it should be seen as an abomination, that women should have the same freedoms as men, that homosexuality should be tolerated and seen as part of Homo sapiens, and that six million years ago we had a common ancestor with chimpanzees. People would see you as some devilish monstrosity spreading heretical sinful ideas and quickly conspire to kill you. Even if you succeeded in persuading a few people, the rate at which your ideas could spread would likely be no match for the rate at which existing fallacies, myths and the incentive structure of slave owners, religious leaders and the experts of their day would lead to your death. Would this mean that the people of the time were bad malicious evil? Or members of some vast conspiracy of bad guys or special interests trying to take away your rights and freedoms? Of course not. The people would be fellow Homo sapiens acting based on the prevailing myths and incentive structures of the times. If you believed that they were dumb or malicious you'd be making a monumental error in your efforts to help them overcome existing myths. Even if you didn't get killed, as the superior ideas spread they may end up doing far more harm than good. Perhaps their spread may lead to ultimately unsuccessful slave revolts, or a civil war that ends up making society more susceptible to conquest by an external power like the French or Spanish at the time. Thus the spread of superior ideas or truths can end up doing far, far more harm than good. Knowing the risks, would you attempt to spread the ideas? Would it be immoral for you not to try? How would you attempt to spread them? Had you succeeded, Needless suffering and the cultural intellectual changes that led to more freedom for any individual to live his or her life according to their plans instead of those of another, master, husband, church, government, could have happened much faster. The American Civil War and who knows how many other calamities and suffering could have been avoided. Something along these lines applies to this book and the dilemmas its authors face. Spreading Spencer Menger Mises Hayek Friends ideas is similar to the above example however, instead of attempting to explain today's mainstream superior ideas to tribalistic myth following dangerous slightly smarter apes in the past, we take and apply ideas that are currently ahead of our time and attempt to spread them among today's dangerous slightly smarter apes, who as we will soon show, are as lost in mythology and dangerous as they were 300 years ago. If by our modern standards pretty much everything about how people saw the world 300 years ago could be understood as myths, in other words, as widely held but false beliefs or ideas, why should we not be open to the idea that we too are likewise immersed in mythology? We are. By the time the reader understands the wisdom of the Austrians, one will be able to almost see and understand how the matter and atoms move to create the matrix or social order, how the tribal smarter apes inadvertently created this amazing civilization while remaining as tribalistic, ignorant, and lost in mythology as they were during the Spanish Inquisition. It should be easy to realize that all human beings are such slightly smarter apes who grow up absorbing a continuously evolving culture language identity ideas myth which then leads them to act in ways that lead to disorder via conflict war, or order via peace and prosperity. As Mises tells us, it is ideas that group men into fighting factions, that press the weapons into their hands, and that determine against whom and for whom the weapons shall be used. It is they alone, and not arms, that, 
in the last analysis, turn the scales. When a lion takes over a pride and kills the cubs so that the females will once again be ready to mate, we don't say that the lion is evil, we rightly understand the complex evolutionary factors leading to such actions. It is likewise important to look at our socio-economic disasters using an evolutionary lens that is free of blame and full of sympathy and understanding. Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Churchill, Roosevelt, Fauci, etc. were not evil, which is itself a mythical linguistic construct inherited from more religious times, they were fellow homo sapiens adored by their respective masses who absorbed horrendous ideas or myths propagated by scholars arising from the complexity of the socio-economic order as in the case of socialism, Hitler Lenin Mao Roosevelt etc. and the biochemical order as in the case of Covid mania, and resulting coercive lockdowns and damaging vaccinations and more, Fauci. As Hayek tells us, it is necessary to realize that the sources of many of the most harmful agents in this world are often not evil men but high-minded idealists, and that in particular the foundations of totalitarian barbarism, have been laid by honorable and well-meaning scholars who never recognized the offspring they produced. Hayek, F. A. 1973, p. 70, Hayek again, most people are still unwilling to face the most alarming lesson of modern history, that the greatest crimes of our time have been committed by governments that had the enthusiastic support of millions of people who were guided by moral impulses. It is simply not true that Hitler or Mussolini, Lenin or Stalin, appealed only to the worst instincts of their people, they also appealed to some of the feelings which also dominate contemporary democracies. Mises again, neither as judges allotting praise and blame nor as avengers seeking out the guilty should we face the past. We seek truth, not guilt, we want to know how things came about to understand them, not to issue condemnations. The centuries of slavery, religious slaughters, persecution of minorities, world wars, and all man-made calamities were obviously the result, not of mythical evil or madness, but of the ideas and myths held by the slightly smarter apes at the time and the mistaken need to coerce each other via government, and as long as the public remains lost in erroneous mythology, democracy obviously does little good. Hayek, perhaps the fact that we have seen millions voting themselves into complete dependence on a tyrant has made our generation understand that to choose one's government is not necessarily to secure freedom. Ludwig von Mises' fight against error. It is obvious that we should focus on the ideas instead of vilifying people and assuming sinister motives or madness as the source of our problems, yet the fact that this goes largely unnoticed as we constantly segregate ourselves along political tribal national lines is further evidence that we are such dangerous slightly smarter apes, and just as important, as we will soon show, how little a role reason plays in creating and sustaining civilization. In just two consecutive paragraphs from one of the most insightful sections of Ludwig von Mises' economic treatise Human Action he destroys that they are evil or mad fallacies which dominate all political discourse regardless of whether the subject matter is the economy, science, history, etc. He writes, There is no other means of preventing social disintegration and of safeguarding the steady improvement of human conditions than those provided by reason. Men must try to think through all the problems involved up to the point beyond which a human mind cannot proceed farther. They must never acquiesce in any solutions conveyed by older generations, they must always question anew every theory and every theorem, they must never relax in their endeavors to brush away fallacies and to find the best possible cognition. They must fight error by unmasking spurious doctrines and by expounding truth. The problems involved are purely intellectual and must be dealt with as such. It is disastrous to shift them to the moral sphere and to dispose of supporters of opposite ideologies by calling them villains. It is vain to insist that what we are aiming at is good and what our adversaries want is bad. The question to be solved is precisely what is to be considered as good and what as bad. The rigid, dogmatism peculiar to religious groups and to Marxism results only in irreconcilable conflict. It condemns beforehand all dissenters as evildoers, it calls into question their good faith, it asks them to surrender unconditionally. No social cooperation is possible where such an attitude prevails. 
No better is the propensity, very popular nowadays, to brand supporters of other ideologies as lunatics. Psychiatrists are vague in drawing a line between sanity and insanity. It would be preposterous for laymen to interfere with this fundamental issue of psychiatry. However, it is clear that if the mere fact that a man shares erroneous views and acts according to his errors qualifies him as mentally disabled, it would be very hard to discover an individual to which the epithet sane or normal could be attributed. Then we are bound to call the past generations lunatic because their ideas about the problems of the natural sciences and concomitantly their techniques differed from ours. Coming generations will call us lunatics for the same reason. Man is liable to error. If to err were the characteristic feature of mental disability, then everybody should be called mentally disabled. Civilization can be seen as a sort of bridge which must be engineered understood using the proper materials and mathematics, ideas, if it is to last and become a foundation for a more prosperous future. A faulty understanding and engineering which just patches things only delays a future calamity. Earlier in the same section Mises provides more vital insights, no ideological inconsistency can provide a satisfactory, i.e., working, solution for the problems offered by the facts of the world. The only effect of contradictory ideologies is to conceal the real problems and thus to prevent people from finding in time an appropriate policy for solving them. Inconsistent ideologies may sometimes postpone the emergence of a manifest conflict. But they certainly aggravate the evils which they mask and render a final solution more difficult. They multiply the agonies, they intensify the hatreds, and make peaceful settlement impossible. It is a serious blunder to consider ideological contradictions harmless or even beneficial. An ideological framework that does not incorporate man's evolved nature and the evolution of culture will not help us properly understand and learn from history. As Mises tells us, history speaks only to those people who know how to interpret it on the ground of correct theories. The evolutionary insights of the Austrians are vital for understanding history and the emergence of the fallacies that lead to our conflicts like World War I, due Gentile misunderstandings and related problems like antisemitism and resulting Zionism, World War II, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and all that emerges from it like the current israeli hamas iran war and worldwide polarizations. Even relatively great free market economists who lack such insights can ultimately do far 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 more harm than good if they end up preaching for wars. Hayek explains, nobody can be a great economist who is only an economist, dash, and I am even tempted to add that the economist who is only an economist is likely to become a nuisance if not a positive danger. All acts of violence and especially wars, are ultimately rooted in economic ignorance, and should be treated as such. If fellow homo sapiens fool each other into wars, we must try to understand the complex sequence of thoughts intertwined with a human nature we all share that has led them to believe the myth that war is necessary. Again, this should be obvious in a post-Darwinian world free of naive good versus evil thinking. Consider the following, Israel is one of the most educated countries in the world, third, with the most engineers, doctors, and academics publishing in international scientific journals per capita in the world. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is a secular and very intelligent man who has a degree in architecture from arguably one of the most prestigious and challenging universities in the world, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, yet on Christmas Eve December 24, 2023, in a message to Christians all over the world he said, we're facing monsters. And two weeks later Bibi told the public about a conversation with fellow Jew, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken where he told him that it is not just our war, it's your war as well. This is that war of the sons of light versus the sons of darkness. This is against the axis of evil. The fact that Netanyahu refers to fellow Homo sapiens as monsters and sons of darkness is indicative of just how lost in mythology and dangerous even today's most popular and influential leaders can be. Mises, B. 
being a Jewish intellectual and Nazism socialism's greatest intellectual opponent, was almost apprehended by the Nazis as he cautiously escaped Europe in 1940 when the Nazis quickly overran France and tried to get the Swiss government to hand him over. But regardless of Nazi tyranny, Mises' profound understanding of the world had him blaming, not Hitler, or evil or anti-Semitism or madness, but the fallacies and ultimately economic ignorance that inevitably led to them given Germany's unique historical circumstances. He writes in same section, there are psychiatrists who call the Germans who espoused the principles of Nazism lunatics and want to cure them by therapeutic procedures. Here again we are faced with the same problem. The doctrines of Nazism are vicious, but they do not essentially disagree with the ideologies of socialism, and nationalism as approved by other people's public opinion. What characterized the Nazis was only the consistent application of these ideologies to the special conditions of Germany. Mises, focusing on the actions of individual men is irrelevant compared to the evolutionary processes that create the ideas, incentive structures and circumstances under which he acts. Without the Austrians' evolutionary insights, as Spencer tells us, it is as though a child, seeing for the first time a tree from which a gardener is here cutting off a branch and there pruning away smaller parts, should regard the gardener, the only visible agent, as the creator of the whole structure, knowing nothing about the agency of sun and rain, air and soil. Undeveloped intelligences cannot recognize the results of slow, silent, invisible causes. The complete evolutionary worldview provided by the Austrians, arguably reaching its zenith or completion with F. A. Hayek, is still so ridiculously far ahead of our time and mainstream intellectuals that even today's leading thinkers, like renowned popular science writer Matt Ridley, by their own admission are still catching up with him. Ridley humbly acknowledges this in a 2011 speech where he mentions, as someone who came to Friedrich von Hayek comparatively late in life, I'm still catching up with him, indeed, many of the insights I thought I had discovered in my own readings and writings on the frontier of evolutionary biology and economics it turns out Hayek had long before me, it's Hayek who first puts it all together. Dash Matt Ridley so how did Hayek put it all together? easy. Hayek realized that all living things require precise information to sustain coordinate expand their order. If one understands how information arises and guides the transformations of matter that lead to the biological and social orders, then one understands how the entire living world works. It is that simple. Hayek's focus on information helps us understand not just all life and resulting society, but what Menge Mises Hayek referred to as complex phenomena like the environment, climate, medicine, nutrition, economy, mind, history, etc. Basically, if it is superior information one is looking for, whether it is how to order 8 billion human beings in a manner that maximizes prosperity, our health, how to take care of the environment, or discovering the truth, Hayek's focus on economic competition as a discovery procedure provides us the best mechanism for discovering and spreading such information which includes busting and steering us away from dangerous mythology. The vital lessons in two paragraphs. Let's try to summarize the wisdom of the Austrian school of economics in two paragraphs, albeit very abstract and dense ones whose concepts will be better explained throughout the book. The socio-economic order inadvertently emerges from the tradition of private property. Our freedom to trade our private property with anyone in the planet inadvertently turns mankind into a global supercomputer where people in the private sector via the companies they create are motivated to innovate and copy other competitors' innovations thus inadvertently cooperate to discover and spread superior information with which to serve customers and reorder all of mankind. It is our freedom as consumers to buy the best cars, and as producers to go into the auto manufacturing business, which motivates existing auto manufacturers competitors to innovate compete learn to produce the best cars. Morals are ways of acting, they too are information which also emerges and spreads via economic competition to considerable degrees. It is hard-working, tolerant, courteous people, who thanks to competition, inevitably motivate everyone else to be likewise. As millions of Italians, Britons, Germans and others from all over the world came to America, it was ultimately the competition which grows from private property and thus individual, 
liberty which stripped these people of their otherwise nationalistic, ethnocentric, tribalistic identities and evolved what came to be seen as the classic American character of wanting to be seen as a reputable and honest businessman or professional, who treats everyone with respect and wears a business suit as opposed to older ethnocentric attires. Thus freedom and resulting competitive knowledge discovery, not coercive centralized competitionless monopoly government control by experts or great leaders, as opposed to leading to chaos and justice, is what one, motivates the discovery and spread of superior information and resulting order civilization, two, shields us from being coerced into going along the plans of others, three, civilizes us, and four, discovers the truth. Government is a coercive and competition immune growth whose regulations and bureaucracies paralyze or slow competitive knowledge discovery and inevitably consumes more than it produces and should thus be kept to a minimum, otherwise, as the history of socialist communist governments always shows, the socio-economic order shrinks and dissolves into chaos and war. Coercion, whether it is by the patriarchy, slave master, church, and ultimately government, is not only a burden to those being coerced, but also destroys this wonderful mechanism of competitive knowledge discovery which is what has discovered and spread the superior information which replaced erroneous mythology and continuously reordered mankind into increasingly more technologically advanced, productive, and prosperous states. This helps us understand how as the coercive and thus competitionless monopoly decision-making power of the Catholic Church was reduced, and individual freedom increased in Europe so did emerging competitive knowledge discovery thus taking Western civilization to prominence, but as the social order got mind-bogglingly complex in the late 1800s and socialist central planning mythology arose, freedom and emerging competitive knowledge discovery was destroyed leading to immense suffering in communist countries like the former Soviet Union, and pre-capitalist China. Knowing that private property and emergent freedom, is the simple tradition that leads to a chain reaction of incentives which generates and spreads the information that creates the social order, we can see that over thousands of years those tribes societies whose customs religions myths inadvertently became more peaceful, and thus less violent, extended peace friendship tolerance trade to those outside the tribe, etc., in other words. Those who tended to respect private property and thus individual freedom, and emerging business capitalist culture more and more, would become more productive advanced powerful, and as they were naturally selected relative to other groups, they would inadvertently spread the very customs myths that allowed them to reach such relative heights. Thus the true sort of designer of the market process or free market economy or capitalism was our old friend natural selection or competition acting on groups cultures, inadvertently selecting those customs ideologies myths concepts as if they were fitted genetic mutations. The fact that the market economy order was designed by an evolutionary process, not our reason, helps us understand how we have inadvertently created this amazing matrix with its complex microchips internet airplanes yet still be economically ignorant intuitively tribal slightly smarter apes, who fooled by the growing complexity of the social order, history, biochemistry, environment, etc are constantly coercing each other via massive competition less monopoly governments led by great leaders theologians experts apes which destroy our very freedom and resulting competitive knowledge discovery that creates our civilization and end up propagating what is essentially mythology and inevitable wars tyrannies. How the Austrians saved Western civilization from communism. Besides a few relatively powerless countries like North Korea and Cuba, the all-around coercive central planning of the former Soviet Union and Maoist China, like slavery, could be seen as one of those ideologies that made sense to many bright and well-intentioned people, but whose fallacies were eventually mostly overcome. Although Soviet-style socialism communism is no longer the threat to socio-economic prosperity that it once was, it is important that we learn as much as possible from the rise and fall of this monumental era made by bright and well-intentioned people. It is a lesson that we will apply over and over when we discuss other disastrous ideologies myths which are currently doing much harm. The disastrous spread of socialist communist mythology which accelerated when Vladimir Lenin and his Bolsheviks began, 1918, to take control of Russia and create the Soviet Union, 1922, was to an overwhelming degree stopped by our main protagonists of the Austrian school. 
These men not only explained how the world works but also simplified the ideas in order to educate the public and politicians, and reached people of influence in order to stop the ideological disasters. For brevity's sake we will focus on the achievements of Ludwig von Mises, Hayek, Henry Hazlitt, and Max Eastman. Unfortunately, great criticisms of socialism central planning, the vital focus on economic education as a means to overcome the fallacies and resulting disasters, and the atlas-like fortitude and determination needed to act and reach people of influence with the right ideas just did not exist much, until men like Ludwig von Mises came along. Mises drove the intellectual stake through socialist mythology by showing via his 1920 essay Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth that all around socialist central planning by experts of the Soviet type, regardless of how smart or well-intentioned they may be, would always lead to the destruction of the social order. Mises also persuaded Austrian politicians away from communism in the late 1910s when the Bolshevik Socialist Revolution was rapidly expanding thus helping stop the falling dominoes in Europe. Mises recalls, there were few who recognized the state of affairs clearly. People were so convinced of the inevitability of Bolshevism that their main concern was securing a favorable place for themselves in the new order. The Catholic Church and its followers, the Christian Social Party, were prepared to befriend the Bolshevists with the same eagerness with which the bishops and archbishops would embrace National Socialism twenty years later. Bank directors and industrialists hoped to make good livings as managers under the Bolshevists. A certain Mr. Gunter, an industrial consultant to the Bodin Creditanstalt, assured Otto Bauer, in my presence, that he would prefer serving the people to serving a group of stockholders. The effect of this kind of declaration can be appreciated when one understands that this man was considered, although mistakenly, the best industrial manager in Austria. I knew what was at stake. Bolshevism would lead Vienna to starvation and terror within a few days. Plundering hordes would take to the streets and a second bloodbath would destroy what was left of Viennese culture. After discussing these problems with the Bowers over the course of many evenings, I was finally able to persuade them of my view. Bowers' resulting moderation was a determining factor in Vienna's fate. The most important task I undertook, was the forestalling of a Bolshevist takeover. The fact that events did not lead to such a regime in Vienna was my success and mine alone. Few supported me in my efforts, I alone convinced Bauer to abandon the idea of seeking union with Moscow. In 1922 Mises wrote what is arguably still one of the greatest books of all time, Socialism, an Economic and Sociological Analysis, where he explains how the social order works and evolved, countless factors leading to erroneous socialist mythology and much, much, much more. Hayek elaborates, when socialism first appeared in 1922, its impact was profound. It, altered the outlook of many of the young idealists returning to their studies after the First World War. I know, for I was one of them. Mises' clear writings and explanations catapulted his pupil Hayek to prominence at the London School of Economics in the 1930s where he would play a leading role beating back the rapidly expanding socialist myths. Hayek humbly acknowledges this intellectual debt to his master in a letter, I am aware, for the first time, that I owe to you virtually everything that gives me an advantage as compared to my colleagues here, and to most economists even outside my narrow field of research, here my indebtedness to you goes without saying. In Vienna one is less aware of, this intellectual debt to you, because it is the unquestioned common basis of our circle. If I do not deceive too many expectations of the people here at LSE, it is not to my credit but to yours. However, my, advantage, over the others, will disappear with your books being translated, and becoming generally known. I must tell you this because I here feel more indebted to you than any time before. In September 1944, as World War II was still raging, Hayek published a book where he tried to show how the same economic fallacies that led to socialism of the Nazi and Soviet style, also increasingly dominated the thinking of the freer democracies like England, and would inevitably lead to, as his book was titled, The Road to Serfdom. 
Properly identifying socialist ideology as an understandable error, he dedicated the book to socialists of all parties. Fellow free marketeer and disciple of Mises, Henry Hazlitt, who in 1946 would write the best-selling introduction to economics of all time via his book Economics in One Lesson, was working at the New York Times, loved Hayek's book, and wrote a glowing review which began as in The Road to Serfdom Friedrich A. Hayek has written one of the most important books of our generation. Hazlitt had the review placed in the front page of the Times book review section. The book became an instant sensation among the Times book readers which created an explosion of interest. However, at over 250 pages its wisdom remained less accessible to a mass audience. Enter Max Eastman. Max Eastman had been one of America's most prominent socialists. He had traveled to the Soviet Union, befriended men like Leon Trotsky and even translated several of his works into English. But eventually the inevitable economic chaos and tyranny of socialism led him to stumble upon the writings of Mises and Hayek, made an intellectual 180 and became a passionate defender of freedom capitalism. Max's monumental contribution came when he created a brilliantly written condensed version of Hayek's book which was less than 40 pages, which with the help of the Reader's Digest magazine where he worked was eventually sold to over one million American homes. By the time Hayek came to the US in April 1945 to go on a speaking tour, instead of giving small talks at university departments, his first event drew an overflow crowd of more than 3,000 listeners and was broadcast over the radio. Hayek's book and Eastman's condensation were a great antidote to Marx's short and viral communist manifesto. Instead of inspiring socialist ideologues, it inspired freedom ones like Margaret Thatcher who read the book while an 18-year-old undergraduate at Oxford, and countless others like three-time presidential candidate Dr. Ron Paul who writes, my introduction to Austrian economics came when I was studying medicine at Duke University and came across a copy of Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. After devouring this, I was determined to read whatever I could find on what I thought was this new school of economic thought, especially the works of Mises' free market legend, and 1976 Nobel laureate in economics Milton Friedman summarizes, there is no figure who had more of an influence, no person who had more of an influence on the intellectuals behind the Iron Curtain than Friedrich Hayek. His books were translated and published by the underground, and black market editions read widely and undoubtedly influenced the climate of opinion that ultimately brought about the collapse of the Soviet Union. Pro-capitalism novelist Ayn Rand was yet another branch that grew from the Austrians. She picked up a good understanding of free markets from Mises which became the great foundation of her popular and inspiring writings. Ayn Rand mentions herself, as far as my economics and political economy are concerned, Ludwig von Mises is the most important thing that's ever happened to me. The Austrians had a laser-like focus on the very root of mankind's problems. The economic ignorance that leads to the massive coercive competition immune governments and resulting calamities. They believed that the public and average citizens could and should understand basic economics. As Mises writes, all reasonable men are called upon to familiarize themselves, with the teachings of economics. This is, in our age, the primary civic duty, economics deals with society's fundamental problems, it concerns everyone and belongs to all. It is the main and proper study of every citizen. Mises also writes, liberalism is rationalistic. It maintains that it is possible to convince the immense majority that peaceful cooperation within the framework of society better serves their rightly understood interests than mutual battling and social disintegration. It has full confidence in man's reason. It may be that this optimism is unfounded and that the liberals have erred. But then there is no hope left for mankind's future. Without the belief that it is possible to convince the immense majority, the effort to educate would not exist so the government created calamities would continue and as Mises tells us then there is no hope left for mankind's future. Mises died in 1973, long before the collapse of the Soviet Union, 1991, and pro-capitalism reforms in China, thus he spent his entire life fighting a losing battle. He writes, 
From time to time I entertained the hope that my writings would bear practical fruit and point policy in the right direction. I have always looked for evidence of a change in ideology. But I never actually deceived myself, my theories explain, but cannot slow the decline of a great civilization. I set out to be a reformer, but only became the historian of decline. But this did not faze him. Having valiantly fought in World War I he carried the same determination and hope in his educational efforts. He writes, how one carries on in the face of unavoidable catastrophe is a matter of temperament, again and again I had met with situations from which rational deliberation found no means of escape, but then the unexpected intervened, and with it came salvation. I would not lose courage even now. I wanted to do everything an economist could do. I would not tire in saying what I knew to be true. In 1964, Henry Hazlitt gave a speech in the presence of Mises and other leading freedom fighters educators which wonderfully captures the civilization-saving atlas-like ethos of the Austrians. We quote from the last few sections of his speech, we haven't been good enough. I am going to give what is no doubt a terribly oversimplified answer to that question. In the first place, we are almost hopelessly outnumbered. Our voices are simply drowned out in the general tumult and clamor but there is another reason. And this is hard to say, above all to an audience of this sort, which contains some of the most brilliant writers and minds in the fields of economics, of jurisprudence, of politics, not only of this age but of any age. But the hard thing must be said that, collectively, we just haven't been good enough. We haven't convinced the majority. Is this because the majority just won't listen to reason? I am enough of an optimist, and I have enough faith in human nature, to believe that people will listen to reason if they are convinced that it is reason. Somewhere, there must be some missing argument, something that we haven't seen clearly enough, or said clearly enough, or, perhaps, just not said often enough. A minority is in a very awkward position. The individuals in it can't afford to be just as good as the individuals in the majority. If they hope to convert the majority they have to be much better, and the smaller the minority, the better they have to be. They have to think better. They have to know more. They have to write better. They have to have better controversial manners. Above all, they have to have far more courage. And they have to be infinitely patient. When I look back on my own career, I can find plenty of reasons for discouragement, personal discouragement. I have not lacked industry. I have written a dozen books. For most of fifty years, from the age of twenty, I have been writing practically every weekday, news items, editorials, columns, articles. I figure I must have written in total some ten thousand editorials, articles, and columns, some ten million words. And in print? the verbal equivalent of about 150 average-length books. And yet, what have I accomplished? I will confess in the confidence of these four walls that I have sometimes repeated myself. In fact, there may be some people unkind enough to say I haven't been saying anything new for 50 years. And in a sense they would be right. I have been preaching essentially the same thing. I've been preaching liberty as against coercion, I've been preaching capitalism as against socialism, and I've been preaching this doctrine in every form and with any excuse. And yet the world is enormously more socialized than when I began. Yet, in spite of this, I am hopeful. After all, I'm still in good health, I'm still free to write, I'm still free to write unpopular opinions, and I'm keeping at it. And so are many of you. So I bring you this message be of good heart, be of good spirit. If the battle is not yet won, it is not yet lost either, none of us is yet on the torture rack, we are not yet in jail, we're getting various harassments and annoyances, but what we mainly risk is merely our popularity, the danger that we will be called nasty names. So, before we are in the position of Winston Smith, we can surely have enough courage to keep saying that 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is the duty that is laid upon us. 
we have a duty to speak even more clearly and courageously, to work harder, and to keep fighting this battle while the strength is still in us. But I can't do better than to read the words of the great economist, the great thinker, the great writer, who honors me more than I can say by his presence here tonight, Ludwig von Mises. This is what he wrote in the final paragraph of his great book on socialism forty years ago, everyone carries a part of society on his shoulders, no one is relieved of his share of responsibility by others. And no one can find a safe way out for himself if society is sweeping towards destruction. Therefore, everyone, in his own interests, must thrust himself vigorously into the intellectual battle. None can stand aside with unconcern, the interests of everyone hang on the result. Whether he chooses or not, every man is drawn into the great historical struggle, the decisive battle into which our epoch has plunged us. Those words dash uncannily prophetic words dash, were written in the early 1920s. Well, I haven't any new message, any better message than that. Even those of us who have reached and passed our 70th birthdays cannot afford to rest on our oars and spend the rest of our lives dozing in the Florida sun. The times call for courage. The times call for hard work. But if the demands are high, it is because the stakes are even higher. They are nothing less than the future of human liberty, which means the future of civilization. The bottom line is that the Austrians are the intellectual backbone of modern civilization, and the fact that hardly anyone is aware of who they are, that they have explained how the entire world works, saved civilization via their direct efforts, and educated future freedom fighters, is still known only to a relatively small number of people is further evidence of just how lost in mythology mankind is. It took a while for the ideas of Galileo Kepler Bruno and later Darwin to spread, we are in the middle of a similar intellectual revolution which must triumph before Homo sapiens self-destroys. The Freedom Intellectual Reconquista If you know where to look you can easily see how the vital wisdom of the Austrians is spreading. Via his 2008 and 2012 presidential campaigns, former U.S. Congressman Dr. Ron Paul would go from college campus to college campus getting thousands of young people excited about learning Austrian economics and men like Hayek, Mises, and Rothbard. Even though he did not win the primaries, the exponential growth of his educational campaigns easily showed how sound free market education, if given enough time for the exponential growth and clever marketing, could educate the public and lead to real change. The Misesian strategy as I like to call it, of believing that economics is the main and proper study of every citizen and that everyone can understand economics and thus how real freedom and the world works, finally somewhat triumphed in November 2023 when Javier Millet won the presidency of Argentina. At a fundamental level the Millet campaign was just a repeat of the earlier Ron Paul revolutions. Just like per above Ron Paul stumbled upon the Austrians, and thus became Austrianized which motivated him to run for office and help spread their wisdom, the same understandably happened to Millet who upon stumbling upon the Austrians and thus becoming Austrianized realizes that everything I had been teaching for the last twenty years about market structures was wrong. And also decides to run for office. Unlike Ron Paul who is a mild-mannered older statesman, Millet is a former rock star and athlete with a flamboyant attention-grabbing personality. The more absurd and dire socio-economic chaos in Argentina with inflation running at 140% certainly helped get more people to desperately look for an alternative, but the bottom line is that Millet did a superb job of becoming a real intellectual beacon of sound free market economics whose exponential intellectual growth managed to win the election. In an interview with Ben Shapiro Millet explained how the intellectual revolution grew from economic education, he mentions, this time young people were really educated. We would organize what we called the concerts. They were political rallies. At these rallies we had stands, with books. Minister Bullrich, said something brilliant, you should pay more attention to what Millet is doing. It's not normal for a politician to be talking to 20 or 30,000 people about Hayek. Young people started to evangelize a home with their parents and grandparents. When Millet won Elon Musk 
tweeted prosperity is ahead for Argentina. Millet is understandably a big fan of F.A. Hayek. On November 8, 2023 Elon tweeted this meme letting the world know Hayek is his favorite economist. On December 4 Elon further recommended Hayek's book The Road to Serfdom, and shared another meme where Hayek writes, nothing could contribute more to the cure of humanity's ills than to give people a better understanding of economics. On April 13, 2024, after winning his fight, MMA fighter Renato Moicano caused a worldwide sensation when he passionately told the audience if you want to save your fucking country read Ludwig von Mises. Thus the world's richest man and most influential entrepreneur, Elon, newest and most popular world leader, Javier, and one of the most popular athletes, Renato, are all passionately preaching the Austrians. There is enough combustible material out there to ignite the freedom intellectual reconquista and we hope that this book can help towards that cause. Book outline This book can be seen as roughly divided into three parts. The first part introduces some of the socio-economic wisdom of the Austrians. Besides general economic concepts everyone should understand, we will further elaborate on one, the Mises Hayek explanation for the impossibility of socialism communism, information which could have prevented millions of people from falling for the horrendous socialist communist disasters of the 20th century which still affect Cuba, North Korea, and all of us to various degrees. 2. The Austrian theory of the business cycle which explains how governments all over the world via misguided central bank policy create the booms and busts which plague economies leading to socio-economic chaos, and political unrest. 3. The foolishness of mainstream Keynesian economics and leading mainstream economists like 2008 Nobel laureate in economics Paul Krugman. 4. Many, many other related insights from the Austrian school economists and their intellectual descendants. The second part will look at cultural evolution. We will discuss how Homo sapiens has gone from tribes of smarter apes to the global socio-economic order or matrix or social organism we are now parts of. We will look at the co-evolution of our culture, religions, languages, economic systems, and more generally speaking the sort of software that guides our actions. The main and vital differences between the Homo sapiens of 20,000 years ago, and today is not in our genes which have hardly changed, or done so in relatively insignificant ways, but in the software or ideas which now guide our actions and understanding of the world. We'll discuss the founder of the Austrian school Karl Menger's explanation of the evolution of money which is a vital concept, needed to make sense of how the socio-economic order works, has evolved, and just as importantly, why mankind remains lost in economic ignorance and resulting socio-economic chaos. The third section will apply the above wisdom towards understanding and hopefully overcoming popular myths. Wherever there is complexity Homo sapiens understandably fools himself mythology, and if the myths are then sustained by force, church government, they become much harder to change tyrannical. The Crusades, slavery, religious oppression, and communism could all be seen as the result of myths shared by enough people to be sustained by government force. As will be emphasized repeatedly, the myths are the result of complex factors discussed later and are not the result of conspiracy or malice. Just like it would be a gigantic error to refer to organized religion as some conspiracy hoax by some to rule, it would likewise be a monumental error to refer to the various myths as the result of malicious conspirators. The myths to be overcome can be divided into two types myths arising from the complexity of the evolved biochemical order, and myths arising from the complexity of the evolved socio-economic order. The so-called germ theory of disease, and all that grows from it like the alleged existence of pathogenic viruses and beneficial vaccines, is a myth. The fact that the anti-vax movement continues to grow stronger, that anti-vax books totally dominate Amazon.com related bestsellers lists, and that mainstream doctors refuse to debate Robert Kennedy Jr. on the alleged benefits of vaccination even though wealthy people like Joe Rogan and many others have offered to donate to charitable causes over a million dollars to see such a debate, are just signs of how pro-vaccination myths, which are subsets of germ theory myths, are being overcome. 
Over two years since its publication, RFK Jr.'s best-selling book The Real Anthony Fauci sits comfortably atop numerous health-related Amazon.com categories with over 25,000 mostly passionately written five-star reviews by the type of curious and well-educated person who can read a nearly 500-page science book. The book documented how Dr. Anthony Fauci, who can be seen as the sort of Pope of Scientism in the USA, played an important role in promoting the flawed hypothesis, and ultimately the myth, that the alleged HIV virus was killing people. People were of course dying, but due to other reasons, more on this later. During congressional investigations in January 2024 Fauci admitted that the six-feet social distancing recommendations which destroyed the freedom of Americans with a swiftness not even Stalin could have achieved, and helped paralyze and destroy the U.S. economy for months, in Fauci's own words, sort of just appeared without any sound scientific evidence justifying the monumental harm. Just like many bright and well-intentioned metallurgists would use the latest scientific techniques during the Spanish Inquisition to design devices to torture the evil spirits from the faithful with the blessings and support of the myth-believing masses, we see the exact same thing today. The fact that what we'll refer to as the priesthood of scientism has not been able to properly outcompete the growing anti-vax movement, and we see spectacular failures like Covid mania, and the Fauci Pope, is just some of the evidence of the mythical nature of germ theory and how we are in the midst of a massive paradigm change. Regarding myths arising from socio-economic complexity we will discuss the emergence and relative collapse of coercive central planning socialist mythology which led to the Soviet Union, Maoist China and countless other disastrous socialist governments. The third major myth that also grew from the complexity of the evolution of the socio-economic order will be Zionism, the idea or myth which preaches that due to anti-Semitism the fellow Homo sapiens who have absorbed a Jewish identity must leave the real thousands of towns and synagogues where for hundreds of years, they were an integral part of Western civilization to create a country, Israel, in an area already populated by others who had a different identity, Muslims, Christians, and fellow anti-Zionist Jews, and for numerous understandable reasons were adamantly opposed to the creation of and potentially living under a Jewish state. The inadvertent polarizations that have arisen due to Zionism have played a leading role in World War I, World War II, and obviously the Israeli Palestinian conflict and all that emerges from it, like the current Russia Ukraine and Israeli Hamas wars, and will eventually lead to the final World War or similar type of civilization ending chaos if not properly understood and remedied in time. As part of our analysis we will provide a modern free market one-state solution that can immediately not only solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and get everyone on a rapid path to socio-economic prosperity, but also serve as a beacon of economic education to the world. Although we will not attempt to debunk or cast doubt on religious mythology since this is already pretty mainstream and tolerated in the Western world, the emergence and evolution of religious myths and related social structures which is packed with examples of myths arising from complexity, like the Tower of Babel to explain complex social phenomena like the emergence of languages, will at times serve as the sort of gold standard of patterns that repeat across other domains where complexity fools Homo sapiens into myths and emerging social structures. Consider the following. Today organized religion like the Catholic Church employs thousands of priests theologians who preach ideas with various degrees of belief which are actually impossible to prove in a real tangible sense. We would assume that some priests believe some of what the Church preaches, some will have more doubts to various degrees, and we can also expect some to be 100% charlatans who might be atheists and even pedophiles. Many of these people are very bright, highly educated, very well read in history and other subjects and speak many languages yet the incentive and ideological structure still persists and does both much good and bad regardless of the increasing amount of evidence which casts doubt on its numerous myths. The Catholic Church and organized religion in general has been losing adherence to what is essentially a new priesthood, the priesthood of scientism which has done a better job of explaining the complexity of our world and now holds the coercive monopoly power the Church once had. The Catholic Church can't force its religious views myths on anyone, forcibly prevent another priest from competing and offering different interpretations myths, 
or raise funds to spread its views via coercion taxation. But the priesthood of scientism can make criminals out of doctors who preach medical or scientific advice that goes counter to its views as we have seen with countless medical professionals who are opposed to COVID lockdowns, vaccinations and more, and also spread its views thanks to government financing taxes coercion via the American Medical Association, CDC, and countless other government-sanctioned bodies priesthoods. As we will show, the simple religious myths that the priesthood of scientism was easily able to bust got replaced by more complex myths arising from the complexity of fields like the economy, biochemical order, medicine, mind, etc., history, etc. Just like your average priest feels like discovering the truth is important yet, has little interest and neglects scientific evidence that criticizes his views myths or has little interest in debating famed evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Most of the scientific and especially medical community likewise shows similar levels of ignorance, negligence, and hostility towards scientists Galileos who question its myths. A little bit of reason is all that is needed to find our modern Galileos, you just have to find controversial areas where people are going against the mainstream and how coercion by the prevailing priesthoods and myth-believing masses prevents their views from spreading. Again, just a little bit of reason makes this obvious, but as already mentioned and will become more obvious later we will show how little a role reason plays in creating and sustaining civilization. If we were truly wise, we would constantly look for and defend the freedom of people, especially the potential Galileos, but, again, we are as dangerous and tyrannical a mob today as we were in the past, and attempt to kill the Galileos for spreading misinformation, etc. All myths contain enough truth or bits of information needed to fool the masses into supporting them, via government force. For example, during the days of the Spanish Inquisition, symbolism about the current myths, devil, angels, spirits, would easily make it to people's dreams which would further solidify the views of the faithful. Public education means that someone who does not want to pay the taxes that fund it should be thrown in prison and killed should they resist arrest. The public believes this is necessary because they fear some kind of cultural or economic chaos or great injustice without public education. There are tons of naive anti-Semites like Hitler who say and believe erroneous things about Jews which understandably helped expand Zionist mythology. All myths eventually fool believers into the need to kill dissenters heretics. The Soviet Union saw capitalists as immoral malicious exploiters to be jailed or killed for spreading their selfish views. Doctors who lose their license due to non-compliance with existing myths ideas like vaccination preached by the priesthood of scientism and give medical advice are criminals for doing so without a license. Zionists are attempting to criminalize criticism of Zionism via hate speech laws. For example CEO of the Anti-Defamation League Jonathan Greenblatt has mentioned that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, and also that anti-Zionism is genocide. On November 30, 2023 the U.S. House of Representatives passed a resolution stating that denying Israel's right to exist is a form of anti-Semitism. So although it is still not a criminal act in the USA to criticize Zionism, the myth-believers are trying and increasingly succeeding. We should stress that the above myths are not the result of sinister conspiracies. We certainly do not believe that our financial economic system and Federal Reserve and its current chairman Yonet Yellen is part of some malicious cabal of malicious elites, or that millions of doctors and people working in the pharmaceutical industry are likewise knowingly harming people with vaccinations for financial gain, or that the Jews are knowingly plotting their Zionist ideology fully aware of its misguided nature. The fact that so many naive thinkers see conspiracy everywhere, whether it is the financial elites, Rockefellers, Big Pharma, the Soros, and of course the Jews, only adds to the complex dynamics which help the myths, not conspiracies, persist. Consider the following three insightful quotes which succinctly capture why myths and popular dogmas can take so long to change. Upton Sinclair mentions, it is difficult to get a man to understand something, when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Economist Thomas Sowell tweeted that, people will forgive you for being wrong, but they will never forgive you for being right, especially if events prove you right while proving them wrong. 
and famed physicist Max Planck, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die, and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Bottom line, there is an understandable echo chamber of negligence and evolved incentive structure that causes new ideas to spread slowly as the always powerful apes have to admit to being wrong and also losing their paychecks and prestige. Natural Selection, Biological, and Social Order Natural selection is a simple process that creates order. Everything in the universe can be seen as having various levels of order. For example, our hypothetical carbon atom has a relatively stable orderly structure with a nucleus of six protons and six neutrons. Orderly things or structures that inadvertently sustain or expand their order are enduring structures and are thus naturally selected compared to other less orderly things that eventually break apart and thus dissolve into chaos. In other words, that which is more orderly persists or endures compared to that which is less so. That's it. That's what natural selection is all about. Imagine a gigantic bag full of Lego blocks which you shake constantly and that a particular shape, say an L-shaped Lego block molecule, interacts with other blocks molecules in a way that sometimes when they collide with it some of the other blocks end up linking with each other to look like or resemble our original L block, and that because of this, this newly created L block-like block, also has the emergent behavior that sometimes when other blocks collide with it they too end up linked looking and behaving like the original L block. So the original L block ends up creating a few other L blocks, who in turn end up colliding with more molecules blocks helping create more L blocks, who create even more and you get the point. So we can easily imagine how as time went by, inevitably, the L block shape would become more numerous. So now, not only do we have natural selection inadvertently selecting for higher levels of order stability but also for those orders which happen to be better at making copies of themselves and thus we have the theoretical precursor to DNA RNA etc. In order for natural selection to select higher levels of order the conditions have to be right. Imagine an environment that is very hot. When the temperature is very high, that means that the atoms and molecules have a lot of energy and are moving very fast colliding with each other harder, sort of vibrating more ferociously, easily breaking away from stable patterns they might have become parts of. In such high temperature environments, it is much harder to stumble upon the stable patterns that can build upon such stability to create even more stable and complex patterns leading to what we consider to be life. These environments are bound to remain chaotic and without complex order life. This is why there is no life in the sun. If on the other hand environments are too cold, there is too little energy movement, and the necessary bouncing around, coming together, and falling apart, needed for natural selection to try select those combinations that can lead to an order that can be built upon. As opposed to the environment being too fast and unmanageable to build order as in the high temperature scenario, the low temperature one is too slow and rigid. When our planet was forming about 4.5 billion years ago, it was too hot and frequently bombarded by large masses left over from the formation of the solar system. The impacts were colossal, one of them might have dislodged a chunk of Earth that became the Moon. During this period of bombardment, the pounding generated enough heat to vaporize all the available water and prevent seas from forming. Most geologists now agree that this bombardment phase ended about 3.9 billion years ago. Once the bombardment ended and things cooled enough we got water, which provided the perfect environment to build order from chaos. If the water is too cold, it freezes and there is no recombination of chemicals out of which natural selection could select for higher levels of order. If it is too hot it evaporates, but at the right temperatures, it is a liquid and in such a state water provides an environment where other elements could bond with others and allow natural selection to select for more complex and order-sustaining patterns which eventually became what we refer to as life. Life can be seen as a sort of ongoing chain reaction of order. For example, if we could travel back in time about 4 billion years, there would have been no complex life forms like what we have today, 
If we briefly assume the standard mainstream narrative there probably would have been what is commonly referred to as the chemical soup, which can be seen as a sort of chaotic sea of atoms molecules Legos. Out of this chemical soup, order and complexity arose, was naturally selected, and eventually we got a self-replicating molecule surrounded by a protective membrane, which was vital for protecting the internal order, and these became the first living cells. Eventually some of these cells became specialized in creating energy and became parts, organelles, of larger cells. Chloroplasts specialized in creating ATP molecules energy from sunlight and became some of the energy producers in plant cells, and mitochondria became energy producers in animal cells. Complexity and order continued to increase, or be naturally selected, and eventually these larger single cells were ordered in a way that led to the first multicellular life forms like plants, animals, and eventually us humans. At the beginning of this process we could say that there was zero biomass, in other words, matter that was incorporated into these self-sustaining chain reactions of order life. All living things are complex orders that have been ideally adapted to the environments where they have been crafted by natural selection. As life order is evolving in complexity from the hypothetical first self-replicators to single cells, these orders must maintain their order life in an environment of relative biochemical chaos. A hypothetical free-floating early self-replicator could be disordered or made sick by colliding with some heavy atom or highly charged molecule that disrupts the self-replicator's ability to maintain its order. Once we get to cells we now have a membrane that can create a more stable internal environment within the cell where more complexity can arise without getting constantly disordered by some foreign molecule's matter. As this is happening mechanisms that repair or help restore biochemical order within the cell are evolving. A vital part of this process of maintaining order within the cell involves dealing with so-called free radicals, molecules that have unpaired electrons and are thus charged and can interfere with other molecules in chaotic ways. Oxygen, having two unpaired electrons leading to a strong negative charge is one of these potentially dangerous molecules which can lead to too much oxidative stresses and needs antioxidant molecules, vitamins A, C, E, etc., to bond with in a manner that neutralizes such potential disrupting negative charge. Cells had to evolve mechanisms to expel or excrete stuff like carbon dioxide which is a byproduct of cellular respiration. As multicellular organisms were evolving, excreting stuff into your neighboring cell was chaotic thus not conducive to order life, so circulatory systems became highways to deliver stuff to and away from cells in an orderly life-sustaining manner. Instead of rapid growth and cell division which was the ideal naturally selected life order creating strategy for unicellular life, cells evolved mechanisms to restrict rapid cell growth. In animal cells anchorage dependence ensures cells only divide and grow when anchored attached to others, density dependent inhibition causes them to stop growing when already surrounded and thus feeling the pressure density by others, and apoptosis causes cells to self-destroy in a manner where their parts are recycled when needed, as when the cell's order has been destroyed beyond repair, etc. When anything damages these cooperating mechanisms, cells can grow and divide uncontrollably uncooperatively as they used to do in their more primitive days and destroy the larger organism they are parts of, we call these cells cancerous cells. A state of disease occurs when there is a significant disturbance leading to too much chaos in the complex biochemical processes that keep cellular order life going. For example, a snake bite introduces into the bloodstream trillions of molecules that interfere with various biochemical processes in cells. As recently mentioned, for billions of years, cells have evolved mechanisms to restore order under normal circumstances, but if the disturbance is caused by something their evolved mechanisms have not dealt with before, or it happens in too great a quantity, the cells may not be able to restore order. What are causes of disease? Exposure to chemicals that are foreign to the environment our biochemistry has evolved the property deal with. Things like, lead, arsenic, poisons, mercury, and countless other substances. Improper nutrition leading to either too much or too little of various substances needed for our complex biochemical processes. 
for example, lack of vitamins B1, B12, C, and D leads to the biochemical breakdown or diseases we call beriberi, anemia, scurvy, and rickets respectively. If you put hamster or a roach in a microwave you will kill it because microwaves obviously affect living things. Similarly all kinds of radiation like Wi-Fi, 5G, etc. could potentially disturb biochemical processes to various degrees, disturbances which could cause significant disorder and thus disease. Enduring structures like living things and society are self-perpetuating orders that are in continuous cycles of wealth production and consumption. Wealth is anything that a living thing values or uses to sustain or expand its order. Production involves the transformation or relocation of matter to create wealth, and consumption transforms relocates wealth matter in a way that sustains or expands living things orders and their internal parts orders. Let's get real fancy by quoting the great economist, from the Austrian school, Eugen von Boom Bovark, to produce, what does this mean? It has been so often said by economists that the creation of goods is not the bringing into existence of materials that hitherto have not existed, is not creation in the true sense of the word, but only a fashioning of imperishable matter into more advantageous shapes. Life order requires energy to move matter. The sun sends us photons energy which the process of photosynthesis is able to store in chemical form. This energy is then used to power the cycles of production and consumption which relocate matter that makes up living things. If there is more production than consumption then the order is profitable, and thus has additional wealth with which to sustain itself for longer periods and or grow. For example, Paramecium are single-celled life forms that produce food wealth by swimming around and swallowing small bacteria which they then consume by digesting and transforming them into the various nutrients wealth needed to maintain and expand the paramecium's internal order and thus life. A more complex multicellular animal like a person, is simply a collection of cells, which are themselves orders, which must be productive as a whole in order to produce and then consume the necessary wealth needed to nourish itself, and the sub-orders organs, cells organelles it is composed of. Today we not only have biological order, we have social order, Spencer's social organism, which is rapidly growing and increasing its rate of production, in other words, the rate at which it transforms the Earth's matter into human usable wealth order life biomass. Every year, Increasingly automated building-sized machinery in the mining industries scrape mine less than 10 cubic miles of matter from the Earth's massive volume of 260 billion cubic miles. This matter is collaboratively transformed or relocated by billions of people as trillions of dollars worth of wealth in terms of cars computers buildings products etc. are produced thus increasing the words economic pie of wealth and social order. These continuous cycles of production and consumption require precise knowledge information. By focusing on how information arises, spreads, and guides these cycles of production and consumption which lead to order life society we can have a simple yet profound understanding of how the entire world works. Creation, and spread of information via biological evolution. Processes of selective evolution or natural selection in general can be said to have created two mechanisms for creating two types of orders enduring structures, biological and social. The biological order is created via the well-known mechanism of biological evolution with genes being like the sentences which store the information necessary to create coordinate life order. Mutations cause new genes and thus new information to arise which leads to a different life form, which is then naturally selected as it inadvertently competes with others, with the winner reproducing more and thus passing on more copies of the better adapted fitter genes information designed to future generations. More complexity requires more information. The more complex a thing is, the more information is needed to create it and keep it in order. Tiny E. coli bacteria have about 4,000 genes and are relatively simple in structure and function. On the other hand, each human cell has about 25,000 genes thus containing far more information allowing each cell to specialize and take part in a vast division of labor by transforming itself into a heart-lung nerve etc. 
cell as a young fetus develops inside the womb. About 500 million years ago, life forms with brains began to emerge which allowed information to be stored outside of genes. Eventually life forms evolved that used their brains to be increasingly social and cooperate with others to reach even higher levels of relative productivity fitness competitiveness which leads us to ourselves, anatomically modern man, about 50,000 years ago, whose ancestors had spent millions of years living in small nomadic tribes of about 15 to 150 people where everyone more or less knew how to do the same things, so information was inefficiently repeated across the social order. Just like few genes information leads to simple bacteria, few brains lead to a simple and relatively unproductive social order. Tribal man had an information storage sharing problem. Then something wonderful happened, something as momentous in the history of life as the emergence of biological evolution. The so-called market process and its various components like trade, money, economic competition, and very recently interest rate coordination began to emerge, thus giving birth to Spencer's social organism. Economics Production and Consumption Whenever a person works he uses the information in his mind to reorder matter, the trillions of atoms he is made of, to produce his labor and whatever wealth it creates thus increasing the economic pie. If you are a freelancer you produce a product service wealth and trade it directly with society, customers, for money, and then trade the money back with society for the wealth you consume. If you work for a company, you produce your labor and trade it for money with your employer who combines it with the labor of others to produce a product service wealth which is then traded with society for the money from which your paycheck comes. Whether you are a freelancer, employee, or company, what is commonly referred to as sales revenue, your paycheck, is an estimate of the total amount of wealth produced. Costs, like employee wages which will be used by them to consume wealth food, energy, etc., are an estimate of how much wealth is consumed from the economic pie. And profits, which are the difference between sales revenue, production, and costs, consumption, are an estimate of by how much additional wealth the economic pie has grown. Again, a profitable order is an order, sell person company, that produces more than it consumes and is therefore self-sustaining alive. The global economy or social organism is really a vast collection of orders people companies that are constantly trading with each other, nourishing each other, each trade taking each participant order from an inferior to a superior state of well-being from its own perspective, otherwise the trade would not occur. When Carl trades a dollar for a hamburger he values the hamburger more than the dollar and the restaurant values the dollar more than the hamburger so the action of trading takes place, which like all action which is not coerced, takes each participant from an inferior to superior state of well-being. If a teenager uses a tree trimmer to produce one mowed lawn valued at $50 in 10 hours, his rate of production is $50, 10 hours equals $5 slash hour. If next month he uses a riding lawn mower and mows the same lawn in one hour, he has increased his rate of production tenfold to $50 slash hour. Profit loss calculation motivates and enables all orders people companies to guide their actions in the most profitable and thus pie increasing way, and, very importantly, it also prevents orders from consuming more than what they produce. Unless, of course, they are the benefactors of charity. The wealthier a person company order is, the more this order has produced and exchanged for all this money wealth. Jeff Bezos is one of the world's richest men because the social order he helped shape and successfully manage, Amazon.com, has been one of the most productive in the world. We know this is the case because millions of human beings traded their money wealth for its products services. Since production is just a transformation relocation of existing matter wealth, fashioning of imperishable matter into more advantageous shapes, the production of wealth requires the consumption use of existing wealth. For example, if 10,000 men are to spend two years producing an airplane factory, they must consume use the concrete materials food energy transportation shelter wealth that they, as well as their dependents' family, need while they produce the factory. In other words, 
there can be no production if there does not already exist enough saved wealth that can be consumed while production takes place. Money. More money does not equal more wealth. Imagine if everyone in the world suddenly had an extra billion dollars. Would this make society wealthier? No. The amount of real wealth goods services has not increased by a single toothpick. It would actually lead to less wealth since many people won't stop working producing seeing their newfound fortune. Would the 10,000 men above be able to produce the factory if instead of having real wealth to use consume had to consume pieces of paper with dead presidents on them? Of course not. More money leads to and enables higher prices. For example, if there are 1,000 people in an island, Blue Isle, and each has $100 for a total of $100,000 in the island, can anything sell for $200,000? Of course not, even if they all combined their money such a transaction could not happen because there isn't enough money, but what if each person had $500 so that there is now a total of $500,000? Then yes obviously, prices could go up to $500,000. So for general prices to go up there has to be more money. And who creates the money and is ultimately responsible for a general increase in prices? Generally speaking, Today all money is created by governments via their central banks, Federal Reserve in USA, and they are thus responsible for the price increases. Let's say you print yourself $1,000 trillion and start offering people in the USA's West Coast ridiculous amounts of money for their goods property wealth. You buy all the wealth in California, Washington, Oregon, etc. As this is happening Americans are growing richer in terms of money but poorer in terms of what really matters, homes property wealth. At some point you make it to Florida, by this time it will be packed with about 300 million Americans and perhaps the 1000 trillion dollars or more you kept offering people. The price of wealth tends to be the amount of money that is offered in exchange for it given all the other things the money could be traded for. With so much money and so little wealth left, the price of everything would be astronomical and people would be much poorer given that you are the one that possesses most of the wealth in the country. Assuming the total amount of money remains stable, if the economy wealth is expanding, which can only happen if the rate at which goods services wealth is produced is faster than the rate at which it is consumed, we expect general prices to go down because the money will sort of get divided among more goods wealth so less money per item wealth means a lower price. This last point is of vital importance, under normal ideal circumstances, as the economy grows we should expect prices to go down and people's savings to buy them more in the future. If the amount of wealth remains stable or grows slower than the amount supply of money, then we have more money per item, thus higher prices. Let's go over a final, and very important example. Keep your eye on how much wealth is being produced and consumed, and the relationship between the quantity of money, wealth, and thus prices. Let's say Alan prints himself another $100,000 which is enough to hire half the people in Blue Isle for three months while they build him a small castle. Alan thinks this is a great idea, he is paying some people more than what they were making before, there were also a few unemployed or unmotivated to work people before but he is offering enough money to get everyone working thus achieving full employment. Prior to trading their labor for Alan's paper money, people were producing stuff that they either wanted needed to consume themselves or could be sold traded to others who obviously wanted needed to consume them, they were producing socially desired or order life creating sustaining stuff like oranges apples haircuts blankets baskets etc. The day half the population begins working on Alan's castle, the island's economic pie begins to lose half its socially desired stuff wealth since half the population is no longer creating it, and begins increasing the amount of rocks, ladders, and other things for Alan's castle. These things, are not socially desired or order creating sustaining wealth as judged calculated by the inhabitants. Since the existing $100,000 will be distributed over half as many socially desired goods, this would eventually motivate their prices to about double. However, since Alan is further doubling the money supply as he pays people using his newly printed $100,000, on the last days of castle building, 
when half the population is still working on his castle, and they have also spent most of the new $100,000, prices would have nearly doubled once again making them about four times higher than they were before Alan came up with his idea. It should be easy to see that Alan has reordered society in an inferior way. Everyone is working and making more money than before, but the unavoidable reality that they are ordered in a less productive way reflects itself in the much higher prices and smaller amount of wealth on average that each can consume. Ideally people now lose their jobs, and instead of working on the easily identifiable yet disastrous plan laid out by Alan, for a few days there appears to be chaos as people discover superior plans and likely transition to their old trades jobs thus once again reordering society on a far, far more productive way. However, they are economically ignorant, so they tell Alan can you hire us again to make the castle bigger. You pay us more than what we used to make before. You are about to create massive unemployment. Alan thinks to himself gosh. It is a good thing that by creating money I am preventing massive unemployment and chaos. Obviously I must keep providing liquidity. So the relative suffering continues even as the local newspaper gives Alan the Citizen of the Year award. Carl told Alan that what he was doing was disastrous and told people that Alan should just stop creating money and let everyone lose their jobs. The mob labeled him a heartless capitalist and killed him unfortunately. Had Alan been a bad king, who instead of creating money to acquire the necessary wealth to create his castle, simply taxed people at a 50% rate, the people's living standard would have suffered similarly, but they would have easily understood the fact that their wealth was taken from them for the creation of things they didn't want or benefit from for a hopefully more obvious massive loss. The creation of money by governments is just a hidden tax that transfers wealth from savers and society at large to the people who get the newly created money. For example, let's say you have saved $1,000 which can buy you 1,000 items at dollar one each. The government via the central bank, Federal Reserve in US, and a convoluted process eventually creates billions of dollars which are given to the newly created Space Force military personnel so they can trade them for the wealth they need to consume live and because of this money creation prices go up 5% so each item is now $1.05 and your saved or future earned, $1,000 can only buy you about 952 instead of 1,000 items. The 48 items wealth that you, and other taxpayers, can no longer obtain, is the wealth that the Space Force personnel got to consume. Again, money is not the same thing as wealth, when governments create money they are simply creating an additional tax or transfer of wealth from savers and the public at large to those who get the money. The following graph helps us understand how when the US was still on a gold standard, since gold can't be increased by adding zeros at the end of bars, this prevented the government from acquiring additional wealth taxes by just creating the money thus prices, had a slight downward trend until 1971 when the USA completely abandoned the gold standard. Up to 1971 the US would give foreign governments an ounce of gold per $35, but to acquire enough wealth from the public in order to give it to people involved in the Vietnam War, as well as grow a rapidly increasing welfare system, the US was creating more dollars than what it could honestly exchange to gold. French President Charles de Gaulle, who wanted the war to end, knew this money debt creation was allowing the US to dishonestly acquire the needed wealth to finance the war so he demanded many dollars to be exchanged into gold. The US had enough for France, but was running very low on gold and knew it could not meet further obligations, so it just completely stopped dollar to gold convertibility and thus end the gold standard. Had the US government tried to obtain this wealth, not via money creation inflation, but by raising taxes directly, chances are Americans would not have gone along. Thus from 1971 onward the US government thanks to Fed Central Bank, money creation has been able to additionally tax workers, savers causing prices to rapidly increase instead of going down. If you look very carefully at the graph, you will notice two rapid increases in prices, one occurring during the American Civil War, 1861-65 and another during the First World War 1914-1918. During wars, 
tribalistic politicians' ideologues always resort to the price increasing money creation to acquire the wealth needed to feed clothe nourish the war effort, because if they had to get the wealth via direct taxation, the public would more easily factor the true costs of the tribalistic warmongering, and likely bring an end to such slaughters. The graph above helps us see how thanks to technology progress even though worker productivity has increased by 246% since 1948, compensation has only increased by 115%. Again, once the economically ignorant technocrats politicians abandoned the gold standard in 1971 and could easily acquire additional wealth by just creating money, more debt, much of the additional production was taken away from workers via inflation money creation. The concept of no taxation without representation is bypassed when ideologues can take all the wealth they want from the public by just creating money. This is not the result of some malicious plot by bureaucrats, for the most part most are clueless and are only focused on spending, acquiring wealth now, to help the cause war welfare etc. This next graph shows how from early March to mid-May 2020, the Federal Reserve has created about $3 trillion which will be given to people and businesses, so that they can exchange this money for wealth they can consume, much of this will be unemployment benefits which will motivate many to not even look for work and thus continue to be pure consumers thus overall the 3 plus trillion is leading to a rapid shrinking of the economy and accelerating rise in prices. Again, this is just a transfer of wealth from workers seniors, and ultimately anyone who trades dollars for wealth, to others as the economy continues to shrink and prices rise compared to what they would have otherwise been without the money creation. This money creation by the Federal Reserve inadvertently transfers wealth from, not just Americans, but anyone in the world who trades wealth for dollars. The US government and its countless ideologues somewhat inadvertently end up creating money which then gets traded with the rest of the world for wealth, leaving the rest of the world with more dollars and less wealth, and thus higher prices. It has taken decades for relatively clueless politicians to understand this, but this is something that now many world leaders are very aware of which is understandably causing them to abandon using the US dollar. Putin explains, over the past two years, the money supply in the United States has grown by more than 38%. Previously, a similar rise took decades, but now it grew by 38% or $5.9 trillion in two years, so, they printed more money, and then what? Where did all that money go? It was obviously used to pay for goods and services outside Western countries, this is where the newly printed money flowed. Naturally, no one thought about the interests of other states, including the poorest ones. They were left with scraps, as they say, and even that at exorbitant prices. When Putin mentions no one thought about the interests of other states, is this due to malice or a conspiracy by US politicians and Federal Reserve economists to rob the world? No. The vast majority of US politicians and even Federal Reserve economists have been unaware of this ongoing monumental transfer of wealth from the whole planet to the USA, it too is something that has more to do with the complex evolution of the global financial system instead of a conspiracy and is indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design trade, money and the division of labor and information. Trade and money led to the division of labor and information which allowed the social order to efficiently compartmentalize information in only the brains that needed it and also accumulate a virtually limitless amount of information with which to continuously restructure itself in increasingly more productive advanced ways. For example, Mark's brain contains knowledge of how to get coconuts and process them to create pastries. Tom's brain contains knowledge of how to find the best vines and weave them together to make baskets. Jim's of where to find rocks which when split can create sharp knives and how to sharpen them. When Mark trades his pastries for Tom's baskets and Jim's knives he is a benefactor of all the knowledge needed to creating those items yet he only had to know how to make his pastries. Unlike the tribal social order where knowledge is inefficiently repeated across every brain, Trade allows for information to be efficiently stored fewer times freeing up more brains to contain more information. 
We can envision 1000 men producing and trading 1000 different types of items requiring 1000 times more information which without trade and the division of information that it enables would have been impossible to achieve in a tribal society. Also, when Mark trades his pastries for the baskets and knives he can now make less trips to gather coconuts by using the baskets and process them faster by using the knives and thus increase his rate of production from 2 to 10 pastries per day. The pastry making process has become more productive and also more complex because it was enabled by basket and knife making knowledge. We now have a never ending cycle of increased rate of production and complexity, greater than population growth, more brains, greater than increased rate of production and complexity, greater than more brains, greater than leading to where we are today with nearly 8 billion people and the inability to fully trace the knowledge that enabled the creation of anything. In Hayek's words, the greater density of population, leading to the discovery of opportunities for specialization, or division of labor, led to yet further increases of population and per capita income that made possible another increase in the population. And so on. For example, a web designer can trade his services which are dependent on web design information that resides in his brain for money, and then trade the money for any of the billions of products services that exist in the world and are likewise dependent on information spread throughout the world. The websites he creates are also enabled by all the information that enabled the factors of production he used to create them, like his computer, monitor, keyboard, software, electricity, the internet, etc., which themselves are enabled by all the information that enabled their factors of production like the computer's memory, processor, and so on. Everything that is produced today is the result of an interdependence of information that spans millions of minds, not just in the present, but in the past as well, because wealth that is currently being produced consumed is dependent on tools factors of production information provided further in the past. When he upgrades to a better computer, the information that enabled these improvements also contributes to enables the improvement of his website production process. Without money how would a heart surgeon trade his costly services for toothpicks? Without trade and money, this division of labor and information as well as the intertemporal cooperation interlocking stacking of information just described, and the ability to do profit loss calculation to ensure that each order guides its actions in a manner that it produces more than it consumes, would not exist and neither would our social order which depends on it. Creation spread of information via economic competition and its emergence from the tradition of private property. In the social organism economy superior information arises and spreads thanks to economic competition which emerges from the tradition of private property. Private property means that matter is under the exclusive control or ownership of a single person mind CPU. Each person is motivated to discover the best information with which to transform or reorder their private property in a way that increases its value or utility. Most of us transform the trillions of atoms that make up our bodies in a manner that maximizes the value utility of the labor we produce and then trade with other people or companies. Some transform bread and beef to increase their value as hamburgers which are then traded with others, etc. From our freedom to use transform our private property emerges the freedom to trade it with anyone in the entire planet which inadvertently transforms mankind into a global supercomputer where people via the companies they create are motivated to innovate and learn from each other competitors thus inadvertently cooperate to discover and spread superior information and subsequent order. For example, a Honda engineer in Tokyo, Japan, may have invented power door locks which thanks to economic competition motivated BMW in Germany, Ford in the USA, and other competitors throughout the world to copy and thus spread superior information throughout the world. Why do they do this? Because people in their role as consumers have the freedom to trade their life order sustaining wealth with the better informed auto manufacturers competitors, and as producers, to go into the auto manufacturing business. This in turn motivates all competitors to learn copy each other lest they not get enough revenue wealth with which to pay their employees a competitive wage so they use their freedom to trade their labor to join the better informed and thus more productive efficient orders companies. Notice how the biggest companies or private sector orders in the world like Amazon, Apple, Walmart, Google, 
and Microsoft, which higher and efficiently coordinate the actions of millions of fellow Homo sapiens across the world regardless of age, sex, religion or race, do not force anyone to buy their products or coerce anyone in any way and have no army or tribalistic and patriotic flag salutations. They spend all of their time peacefully innovating and copying each other's innovations thus inadvertently spreading superior information and subsequent social order. This wonderful automatic mechanism of competitive knowledge discovery is turned on or emerges from the simple concept, or better said, tradition of private property. Private property gives everyone in our role as consumers the freedom to trade our life order sustaining wealth for what we calculate think is best. This freedom to trade choose in turn motivates everyone, in our role as producers, to discover the best information with which to order ourselves and the matter we control in a manner that produces something society customers value, our labor, a product service, which we do buy, once again, innovating and or copying learning existing ideas information, in other words, by competing in the economic sense. Most of us simply choose to produce and then trade our labor with a company order that knows how to further incorporate our labor in a more competitive profitable way. Via advertising, competitors are motivated to spread the potential usefulness and superiority of their products ideas as well as the defects inferiority of their competitors thus accelerating the need to compete copy spread superior information. A mind CPU anywhere in the planet that comes up with an improvement will benefit everyone in the world if they are free to trade for his product service which will also motivate all competitors in the world to likewise improve their actions order. So we can see how just like in the Olympics we can discover the best athletes in the world due to global competition, so does having the freedom to trade with everyone in the world allows the best ideas to compete and spread globally thus ensuring the best possible global order. As cost-cutting ideas emerge and inevitably spread via competition leading prices to continuously fall, new profitable ideas easily arise and once again spread via competition in an endless cycle of knowledge generation innovation. For example, computers were once very expensive, but once the price of making them came down enough, people easily realized that every home could have them which gave birth to our computerized world and the internet and all the great things that flow from it. The more wealth is produced, the more wealth has to be offered in exchange for labor as companies' orders compete against each other for the labor they need which helps explain why the economic pie grows for everyone. For example, imagine that after a shipwreck you end up in an island where everyone has a machine that can turn dirt into food. Tom wants your labor to build a home, Mark, to build a boat, and Gina to plant a garden. Competition will motivate them to offer you all the food you want and more. Prices and the impossibility of central planning socialism communism. How much wealth had to be consumed in order to produce a gallon of gasoline that sells in Seattle for $3.50? Or a pound of beef that sells in London for $5.35? We can't know for sure, however, we can be fairly certain that it was less than the advertised price which on average must include the costs. The price of any item in the world lets us know that there is an order at that particular place and time that is coordinated by information, that can produce the item while consuming less than the advertised price. That is amazing. This allow goods to be purchased and combined in a manner that ensures that the combination, like a car, can easily have a price set that properly accounts for the costs consumption of the whole, car, by just adding the prices of the parts used to produce it, wheels, glass, robotics, labor, etc., parts which themselves had a price, set that included their costs consumption and so on. Each part input managed ordered by entrepreneurs brains, CPUs with highly specialized time and place specific information who are always using profit loss calculation to ensure they are increasing the economic pie. The concept tradition of private property plays a vital role here as well, it, it is not until matter things are privately owned, that they are controlled coordinated by brains, CPUs that are incentivized to discover the best information with which to reorder coordinate them in the most productive profitable way possible. How do we know whether it is a good idea to build an airport or a school at a particular time and place and also get the necessary wealth without coercion or making criminals out of people who may not want to contribute to them? 
Only entrepreneurs at those times and places can discover if there are enough people whose lives would be improved by trading their wealth for such wealth, airport or school, and how to build them in a profitable and competitive way. The information needed to create coordinate the social order, like whether to produce cars, or buildings, or pizzas, where to do so, what prices to set, and most importantly, how to produce them in a manner that more wealth is produced than consumed, is information that can only be created by free people dispersed throughout the world thus rendering central planning ideologies like socialism communism impossible regardless of the good intentions of their members or their intelligence. To see why this is the case consider the following example, a Cuban restaurant in Miami Beach sells a picadillo dish, ground beef, plantains, rice, for $8. Perhaps $1 might be profit, and $7 will be spent in costs, in other words, in the necessary consumption of wealth needed to produce the meal wealth, things like equipment electricity food, and everything employees and their families will consume at home, food, energy, thanks to their paychecks that came from the $7 meal. The businessman discovered 1, that there are enough customers nearby willing to patronize the restaurant at the $8 meal price which necessitates taking into account customers' already existing local competitive options thus providing an improvement in society, and 2, how to reorder $7 worth of stuff labor supplies etc. To produce the meal. If he sets prices too high, customers will choose other superior existing competing options and thus fail to improve the social order. If he sets prices too low, he won't cover costs and cause more consumption than production thus shrinking the economic pie. These are two vital pieces of information that are impossible for a central planning body to discover and helps explain why every time communism has been attempted the result has been a much faster rate of consumption than production and eventual famine starvation chaos death. Again, only free entrepreneurs dispersed throughout society not government experts in a central location, are at the right time and place needed to discover people's desires and how to order a business or section of society while setting prices that create a profitable order. The social order exists thanks to the fact that private property maximizes economic calculation by allowing encouraging every person mind CPU to sense analyze its proximate corner of the world and reorder it to be as profitable pie increasing as possible. Central planning socialism communism simply reduces the number of brain CPUs that can do profitable calculation by turning them into order takers by the smaller number of central planning experts who are also too far away to gather the necessarily time and place information needed to profitably plan reorder thus always rendering their planning inferior, leading to more consumption than production or what Mises referred to as planned chaos. Order, biological or social, needs two things, wealth to consume as it acts lives, and information to guide the action in a profitable pie increasing manner. As an American I have relatively good freedom of speech, I can say America's $1.2 plus trillion yearly military spending or consumption or public education is a horrible idea, but my freedom of speech is useless if my wealth is taken away to sustain bad ideas. Thus competitive knowledge discovery requires both, the freedom to think and act, as well as the freedom to keep and use the wealth needed to sustain superior actions, which also leads to the sort of starving of inferior ideas, and the orders they sustain. Try to envision how matter is coordinated by information constantly increasing its value. The restaurant owner discovers labor as equipment food distributors with the right prices to hopefully create a profitable order restaurant. He places orders for the food ingredients which can be seen as increasing in value as they are delivered to the restaurant, at a cost of course, that which must be consumed fuel food etc. By the driver etc. The waiters begin producing the meal experience by seating customers and taking the orders, the cooks increase the value of the ingredients by combining cooking transforming them and thus producing the meals. The waiters further increase the value of the meals by further transforming transporting them from the kitchen to the table. The customers consume the meals, their internal order cells will further consume them as they produce their heartbeats and all that is required to keep the cells people orders alive etc. Customers, who had previously produced stuff and exchanged it for money, traded money which will then go to the owner, cooks, waiters, 
suppliers, etc. and then traded with countless orders businesses, so that they too can consume live. Each actor order producing and consuming at different rates using prices and economic calculation to ensure more production than consumption at the whole restaurant level, and at each individual level as the waiters and cooks manage their personal spending lives. The food supplying company uses the prices in its own relevant corner of the world to likewise organize itself profitably. Each actor order is motivated to sell or trade the wealth it produces for as high a price as it can but the freedom of customers to choose competitors limits how high a profitable price can be. Thus prices, and the vital information they convey, are what allow economic calculation, they allow cars picadier stuff to be built from parts beef inputs, which themselves are built from other inputs, each input managed ordered by entrepreneurs brains with highly specialized time and place specific knowledge skills, leading to never-ending conveyor belts of interlocking cycles of production consumption, each moving reordering matter in increasingly valuable ways. Since prices contain highly time-place specific information it is absurd to arbitrarily copy the price from one place and apply it to another. A similar Cuban restaurant meal might be profitable in Austin, Texas selling the Picadillo for $6.50 because costs consumption like real estate, transportation, and labor might be lower there compared to Miami Beach. In Oslo, Norway, the costs might be $1.20 slash meal due to the additional consumption of wealth that has to take place as the ingredients are shipped so far and numerous other factors, which again, are highly time and place specific and only discoverable by local actors. Nikita Khrushchev, who followed Stalin as head of the centrally planned, socialist communist, Soviet Union, is credited with saying when all the world is socialist, Switzerland will have to remain capitalist, so that it can tell us the price of everything. Unfortunately for Khrushchev and the billions who suffered economic chaos, and an inevitable decline in production under socialist communist regimes all over the world, prices in Switzerland, or anywhere else, embody information about the costs slash consumption of those particular places at specific times and are no good elsewhere. With the internet, Pricing information all over the world can help customers find nourish cheaper better products orders companies and also help producers likewise thus greatly accelerating competitive knowledge order spreading but it will never lead to the success of central economy wide planning because no computers system can get in the brains of entrepreneurs to predict what products businesses they will create and thus alter society and similarly. No computers can get in the minds of consumers and predict how they will choose to spend their money slash wealth thus once again altering the social order's numerous cycles of production and consumption. As Mises so eloquently explains, the consumers, by their buying or abstention from buying, ultimately determine what should be produced and in what quantity and quality. They render profitable the affairs of those businessmen who best comply with their wishes and unprofitable the affairs of those who do not produce what they are asking for most urgently. Profits convey control of the factors of production into the hands of those who are employing them for the best possible satisfaction of the most urgent needs of the consumers, and losses withdraw them from the control of the inefficient businessmen. In a market economy not sabotaged by the government the owners of property are mandatories of the consumers as it were. On the market a daily repeated plebiscite determines who should own what and how much. It is the consumers who make some people rich and other people penniless. Mises, who can anticipate the firing of trillions of neurons in billions of brains to predict plan the resulting desires ideas. Since prices that properly estimate costs slash consumption can only be set by free entrepreneurs, when the government, central planners, attempts to set them via price controls it warps the socio-economic order in inferior ways. For example, if the free market price of a gallon of milk is $2.30 in a particular store in Miami which profits 0.30 per gallon, costs equals $2.00 and the government mandates the price to be $1.99, then the business is consuming more wealth, $2, than what it gets, $1.99, and will eventually go bankrupt causing less milk to be produced leading to shortages. Even if the government sets the price to, say $2.15, so that the business can still profit, it will still lead to eventual shortages for the following reasons. 
Under normal circumstances the rate of profit tends to be equal uniform across all sectors businesses, if higher than average profits are being made in say auto manufacturing, factors of production like labor, materials, real estate are withdrawn from other less profitable sectors which reduces production competition in them causing profits to go up in those sectors. While simultaneously increasing production competition in the auto manufacturing sector causing the initial higher than average rate of profit to go down towards average levels. So by making profits in milk production lower than the average it still has the effect of decreasing, albeit less drastically, milk production which is the opposite of what the economically ignorant masses and politicians want. It is important to envision the socio-economic order as it really exists as if looked at from high above. Envision people coming together apart as companies' orders emerge and dissolve in ever-changing conditions. Superior information arising and rippling restructuring the social order thanks to competition. As orders get more productive they lure other people to trade with or join them by offering more money wealth for their labor relative to other companies' orders, eventually causing the least productive orders to sort of dissolve as their factors of production like labor, buildings, etc. are a way to be parts of more productive plans' orders. A sort of swarm intelligence emerges as the all-pervasive public quickly nourishes the growth and spread or superior orders companies' information, inadvertently expanding the worldwide division of labor and information as entire neighborhood cities morph themselves in specialized ways as complementary pieces of information orders segregate themselves in distinct geographical locations like the software industry in Silicon Valley, California and manufacturing in Guangdong, southern China. As Mises reminds us the division of labor is a fundamental principle of all forms of life. The division of labor is a pattern way which natural selection rediscovers to enable smaller units orders to efficiently compartmentalize labor information as they contribute to, and are nourished by, a larger organism they become parts of organelles, greater than cells, greater than organs, greater than humans, greater than social organism. Mises again, it is by virtue of the division of labor that man is distinguished from the animals. It is the division of labor that has made feeble man, far inferior to most animals in physical strength, the lord of the earth and the creator of the marvels of technology. Morals as superior information. Morals are simply ways of acting, they are knowledge which also emerges and spreads via economic competition. Companies' orders that higher nourish trade with lazy, disrespectful, or corrupt people will be less competitive and be inevitably pressured selected to hire people with better morals which in turn forces everyone to be respectful and hardworking regardless of race, sex, etc. Similarly, it is hardworking, tolerant, courteous people who thanks to competition inevitably force everyone else to be likewise. As Hayek tells us, competition is, after all, always a process in which a small number makes it necessary for larger numbers to do what they do not like, be it to work harder, to change habits, or to devote a degree of attention, continuous application, or regularity to their work which without competition would not be needed. As millions of Italians, Britons, Germans and others from all over the world came to America. It was ultimately the competition which grows from private property and thus individual liberty freedom which stripped these people of their otherwise nationalistic ethnocentric tribalistic identities and evolved what came to be seen as the classic American character ethos of wanting to be seen as a reputable honest businessman professional who treats everyone with respect and wears a business suit as opposed to older religious ethnocentric dress. So not only does private property turn on or leads to economic competition and other aspects of the market process and resulting social order civilization, it also evolves our culture identity to be ideally suited for participation in the social organism. Government public sector is an inefficient monopoly. Since it is through freedom and resulting competitive knowledge discovery that we both, free people from coercion tyranny slavery, and also discover the best information with which to reorder mankind, the role of governments should be to set the framework laws that maximize such freedom competitive knowledge discovery and not to attempt to manage order society because governmental public sector bureaucracies, being coercive monopolies which get their life order sustaining wealth through taxes compulsion are immune to the competitive information spreading incentives pressures which motivate force private sector orders to be efficient innovative hardworking. 
This helps one understand how communism, which abolishes competing orders companies and replaces them with a single competition-less monopolistic bureaucracy of experts, leads to a massive lack of production innovation and eventually socio-economic chaos starvation as the economic pie continuously shrinks as has happened in every country that consciously attempts communism socialism or inadvertently drifts in that direction as their governments get bigger and bigger, USA world. Central plans can't work if people are free to not go along with them, or use property as they wish instead of by the central plans, so they inevitably require compulsion tyranny. For example, it is a criminal act in communist countries like North Korea to start a business, in other words, to attempt a superior restructuring of society because it interferes with the plans of the experts who run the government. It is also a criminal act everywhere to not pay taxes that sustain public sector bureaucracies like public education so there is little incentive or wealth to sustain other, more desirable superior competitors. For example, the NYC public monopolistic school bureaucracy consumes about $29,000 per year to educate a K-12 student. Refusing to pay a single dollar that goes to this bureaucracy is a criminal act. Taxes and all transfers of wealth from the private sector to the government, besides being an obvious burden to the people that had to sacrifice a part of their lives to earn such wealth and now have less wealth to trade for the things they want, simply destroy the private sector jobs the taxed away spending would have sustained and replaces such productive efficient and pie-increasing jobs for inefficient government ones or worse like militarism wars. The former Soviet Union had plenty of highly educated scientists experts whose plans required the coercion of millions, but they were thoroughly crushed by free Americans and their competitive knowledge discovery. Socialist regimes and government in general also face an incentive problem. In free societies, or the private sector, each person's cell is incentivized to be as productive as possible and keep inefficiencies to a minimum since he owns keeps the additional wealth or losses. On the other hand, the government employee or bureaucrat gets the same pay, ability to then consume, whether his department did a good job, produced a lot, or not, and is also not risking his own wealth since that comes from the taxpayers. The image below is another one of our most powerful means for explaining the difference between competitive private free orders, South Korea, and monopolistic government coerced orders, North Korea. Again, Keep your eye on how information arises, spreads via competition and continuously restructures the social order. Hayek, the argument for liberty is not an argument against organization, which is one of the most powerful tools human reason can employ, but an argument against all exclusive, privileged, monopolistic organization, against the use of coercion to prevent others from doing better. Again, action requires two things, the information that guides it, and the wealth that must be consumed while to action takes place. For competitive knowledge discovery to work wealth must remain in private, not government public hands. For example, in relatively free countries like the USA you have the freedom of speech necessary to criticize an awful public education system, or the disastrous Iraq and Afghanistan wars, but since you are still coerced via taxation to support those ideas, the competitive knowledge discovery is inexistent because bad ideas can still get the wealth they need for execution. In his essay over legislation Herbert Spencer beautifully comments on the differences between governmental law-made orders and private-slash-competitive ones, how invariably officialism becomes corrupt everyone knows. Exposed to no such antiseptic as free competition not dependent for existence, as private unendowed organizations are, Upon the maintenance of a vigorous vitality, all law-made agencies fall into an inert, overfed state, from which to disease is a short step. Salaries flow in irrespective of the activity with which duty is performed, continue after duty wholly ceases, becomes rich prizes for the idle well-born, and prompt to perjury, to bribery, to simony, officialism is habitually slow. When non-governmental agencies are dilatory, the public has its remedy, it ceases to employ them, and soon finds quicker ones. Under this discipline all private bodies are taught promptness. But for delays in state departments there is no such easy cure, consider first how immediately every private enterprise is dependent upon the need for it, 
and how impossible it is for it to continue if there be no need. Daily are new trades and new companies established. If they subserve some existing public want, they take root and grow. If they do not, they die of inanition. It needs no act of parliament, to put them down. As with all natural organizations, if there is no function to them, no nutrient comes to them, and they dwindle away. Moreover, not only do the new agencies disappear if they are superfluous, but the old ones cease to be when they have done their work. Unlike law-made instrumentalities, these private instrumentalities dissolve when they become needless, again, officialism is stupid. Under the natural course of things each citizen tends towards his fittest function. Those who are competent to the kind of work they undertake, succeed, and, in the average of cases, are advanced in proportion to their efficiency, while the incompetent, society soon finds out, ceases to employ, forces to try something easier, and eventually turns to use. But it is quite otherwise in state organizations. Here, as everyone knows, birth, age, backstairs intrigue, and sycophancy, determine the selections, rather than merit. The fool of the family readily finds a place in the church, if the family have good connections. A youth, too ill-educated for any active profession, does very well for an officer in the army. Grey hair or a title, is a far better guarantee of naval promotion than genius is. Nay, indeed, the man of capacity often finds that, in government offices, superiority is a hindrance that his chiefs hate to be pestered with his proposed improvements, and are offended by his implied criticism. Not only, therefore, is legislative machinery complex, but it is made of inferior materials. Spencer, 1853, Regulatory Paralysis. With our focus on how information arises and coordinates life order, we can see that a government regulation is essentially a way of doing things, it is information. But unlike information that arises in the private competitive sector and is constantly being replaced by superior information due to economic competition, a government regulation is information that arises out of a few brains and is then forced upon the entire social order from the top down via the law and can only be changed via a painfully slow monopolistic bureaucratic apparatus made up of economically ignorant politicians, lawyers, lobbyists and special interest groups who always lack the necessary local time and place knowledge and incentives to discover what is the best way to do something. In the free private competitive sector information moves from the bottom, individual minds entrepreneurs innovators, to the top others influencers as it is tested refined preferred by the comparisons to other information by billions of minds thus ensuring superior information spreads and is ideally adapted to each specific time and place. This is bypassed by top-down regulation and all government monopoly action which ultimately comes at the expense of wiser private competitive action. The more the government regulates, the more it paralyzes competitive knowledge discovery. As government regulations have increased in the healthcare sector, turning it into a sort of island of paralyzed, top-down competition less socialist central planning, so have costs. These increased costs have led the sector to grow from consuming 5% of the American economic pie in 1960 to a whopping 16% in 2006 and over 20% 2022 culminating in the Coromianism disaster. The image below helps explain the regulatory paralysis bureaucratization of the entire medical sector which is responsible for the skyrocketing costs. What a person must learn in order to legally offer medical advice via licensing of doctors, where he must learn it via licensing of medical schools, what chemical compounds can be legally consumed, how to test drugs, how the medical insurance industry should work, and countless other gigantic bodies of knowledge information are dictated by monopolistic competition less bureaucracies like the American Medical Association, AMA, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and numerous others. By comparison, the information technology sector has very few government regulations, so competition motivates the creation and spread of superior information at breakneck speed, and is obviously transforming our world right before our eyes. Teenagers can work at Google Microsoft Amazon, 
and write the software that keeps planes in the sky or people alive via software in medical equipment, yet there is no American association of computer programmers dictating what or where such knowledge can be obtained similar to how the government via the AMA regulates monopolizes paralyzes the medical sector via the licensing of doctors, medical schools, insurance sector, etc. There is no government monopolistic bureaucracy ensuring the proper functioning of the software that runs PCs, smartphones, the internet, or ensuring the lack of malware or viruses in software. Freedom and competition in the software development industry is even quickly evolving culture. It is increasingly seen as uncool and backward to have a traditional degree, where one wastes thousands of dollars and time physically attending gigantic temple-like universities, inefficiently, professors instead of popular online videos you can pause rewind, learning things that have nothing, English 101, etc., to do with being a productive software web IT professional. Thanks to this lack of monopolistic centralized decision-making regulating paralyzing, education in the software development IT world is astounding. At places like www.freecodecamp.org thousands of people are going from zero experience to highly paid computer programmers in just a few months for free. IT companies who reach a large enough size ultimately due to the great services they provide, and therefore the useful profitable knowledge they contain, like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and many others, go about creating their own educational institutions which train and test people using their products and technologies which are solving real problems and have been shaped by years of fierce competition. There are over 2.1 million individuals worldwide who have become Microsoft certified professionals MCPs by studying for and passing exams created by Microsoft. These exams change frequently to reflect the never-ending cycle of knowledge generation that exists in this freer and less regulated sector of the economy. Economic ignorance leads many to believe that since one has to be seemingly more careful with medicine, such monopolistic regulatory oversight is somehow necessary. This is irrelevant, if it is superior knowledge that is needed, which includes figuring out how careful to be, freedom and competition is the best way to discover it, period. Nobody knows who the greatest programmers in the world are, there is rightly no Nobel Prize for them, the nearly 30 million lines of complex computer code that make up the Linux operating system that runs most of the world's computers and is now an integral part of the social organism were created not so much by smart people, but by pure competition. If the medical sector, or better yet, the entire worldwide economy was as deregulated and thus as competitive innovative as the software IT sector, the rate of innovation and prosperity would skyrocket and in all likelihood people who as of today have 5 to 10 years left to live might be able to beat dying of old age. Only the truly economically woke can easily accept the feasibility of this statement. In graph below one can see how the more regulated a sector is, hospital services, the more expensive consumptive it becomes. One of the numerous flaws in how the AMA goes about regulating the world of medicine is in the assumption that medical professionals have to be some of the brightest and most dedicated people around, which it attempts to achieve by making entry into medical school and training such an arduous and ultimately expensive process. But this assumption is false, what cures people, or produces any product or service in today's world, is not so much hard-working bright individuals, it is the tremendous amount of knowledge and cheap technology that the market process coordinated world puts at our fingertips. This flaw is not specific to the AMA, it applies to our educational establishments and much of how we look at learning and the role of human intelligence. The market process and resulting worldwide division of labor and information is far, far more important than individual intelligence IQ effort. For example, Mike knows he can incorporate Tom, who has Down syndrome, into his landscaping company by having him perform simple tasks in a manner that increases the company's rate of production revenue in terms of landscaping services by an additional $4 per hour, $640 per month. Mike trades $3 per hour, $480 per month, for Tom's labor to make a $1 per hour, $160 per month, profit, and after just 10 hours of labor production and trade, Tom can produce a mind-bogglingly complex tablet by trading his $30 for it. 
Thus it currently takes about 10 hours of labor for a low IQ person to produce something that was impossible to create just 20 years ago. But he didn't really create the tablet. Thinks the economically ignorant. But guess what? The economically woke knows the neither did the company that manufactured it. Did such a company create the tablet's CPU? Or the memory camera touchscreen battery plastic? Or any of the machinery tools required to produce the aforementioned components? Of course not. The manufacturer, just like Tom, mostly traded and added a relatively minuscule amount of new information compared to what it already got from the social organism, and its worldwide division of labor information, that has been evolving for thousands of years. Due to massive economic ignorance, Tom's truly astounding rate of production is impossible to achieve because it is either illegal for someone to trade their labor production for a rate lower than the minimum of $12 per hour, i.e. California, or because the legal expenses related to paying someone less than the minimum make it unprofitable to do so. Minimum wage laws are regulations which essentially outlaw all production that does not occur faster than the legally mandated minimum, and hurt the least productive members of society who need wealth the most. Elderly who due to old age eventually produce at a slower rate, teenagers, etc. Government regulations, which again, are inferior competition less information which is imposed on the social order by force, not only paralyze the superior competitive knowledge discovery that would otherwise exist and enable the growth of paralyzing inefficient bureaucracies, they also allow bad ideas to be much harder to change. We only have to remind ourselves of the Catholic Church's regulation of speech thought which led to the persecution of thinkers like Galileo Galilei and thus the general retardation of scientific progress to various degrees. Bad ideas, like socialism communism must have intellectual persecution in order to prevent criticism or ideological competition. So once again we must highlight that freedom, is not only indispensable for the competitive discovery of innovations, but also for discovering the truth. Patents. By understanding how patents do far more harm than good we can continue to solidify our vital understanding of how information coordinates the social order. One of the reasons why we so naively fall for the erroneous idea that patents are good for society is because we greatly overestimate the importance of the individual or company making the discovery while being unaware of how it is the market process, via its various mechanisms like prices, the profit motive and competition, which plays the key role in innovation. Competing orders companies, due to the fact that they are already in business competing with each other, contain knowledge that has to be relatively similar. If one competitor has knowledge that leads to much more productivity profitability, it would drive some competitors out of business, and it would also motivate competitors to copy emulate the superior knowledge thus leading to a state where once again all competitors contain more or less the same knowledge and inevitably come up with new products improvements innovations. Which particular mind manages to stumble upon a new innovation has more to do with chance and circumstances than anything else. Patents inevitably turn competitors which are ultimately cooperators as we are constantly learning from each other as we compete, into bitter rivals, give credit to one where many, or better said, the entire social order via the market process and worldwide division of labor are involved, they slow down the market process by preventing further innovation by competitors whose ideas are based on patented ideas because they now have to pay large sums to patent holders. They remove competitive pressure from patent holders thus making them lazier and worth their time and money to go into the damaging business of suing patent infringes thus retarding technological progress, and since the patent system is overseen by a monopolistic and bureaucratic government organization, it is bound to grow more inefficient and chaotic and also prone to manipulation by the better connected. Patents, just like regulations, simply create spread paralysis in the market process. The information technology industry, although less regulated than the healthcare sector provides a good example of how patents begin to paralyze an industry. Prior to 1981 computer programs could not be patented and this helped spark the explosive growth of the computer software industry. As Microsoft founder Bill Gates tells us, if people had understood how patents would be granted when most of today's ideas were invented, and had taken out patents, 
the industry would be at a complete standstill today. I feel certain that some large company will patent some obvious thing. If we assume this company has no need of any of our patents then they have a 17-year right to take as much of our profits as they want. The solution to this is patent exchanges with large companies and patenting as much as we can. So Gates clearly saw how patents would lead to paralysis. Unfortunately his solution at the time was not to argue for the abolishment of patents altogether which I don't blame him for, but to attempt to protect his company by patenting as many things as possible with which to threaten protect itself from others in this new ecosystem of warring litigating patent holders. Given the incentives, this is the strategy that works or is naturally selected, thus we have bigger and bigger patent holders fighting it out in order to progress, while at the same time making it harder and harder for the little guy or new competitor to innovate. Without patents, the social order is constantly improving and moving the best information which can be copied freely quickly, but existing patents inadvertently disincentivize this more ideal outcome and cause research wealth to be diverted for the discovery of non-patented inferior information. For example, a whopping 77% of new drugs approved by the FDA are not new in the sense that they make some significant improvement compared to an existing drug, they are what are referred to as Me Too drugs. These Me Too drugs are usually inferior to drugs already on the market to treat the same condition, they simply allow competing drug manufacturers to enter the market to treat a condition where other companies might be making huge profits due to their patent's monopolistic position. Innovating is a lot easier than people think. As previously mentioned, as prices or costs of production go down, that which was prohibitively expensive becomes possible which in turn makes other things possible and so on. The world is vastly more innovative today than it was 100 years ago not because we got any smarter because obviously our biology has not changed, but because the market process has made it easier to innovate. Some innovations revolutionize entire fields and make it easy for further innovations to come about. For example, how much easier was it for scientists to make biology-related innovations once the electron microscope took magnification from about 2,000 times to over 2 million? How much easier was it to invent all sorts of gadgets once electricity came about, or computers, or the internet? The market process and continuously evolving worldwide division of labor can be seen as a sort of ever-growing ladder taking humanity up an infinitely high tree whose fruits are innovations. For the most part all we have to do is easily pick them off the branches when the ladder gets us there. Very expensive endeavors that only seem profitable if granted patents can be seen as attempts to grab a fruit innovation that is currently too high up in the tree and we are better off just waiting for the normal technological progress to get us there by cheapening all related research etc. Instead of damaging the workings of the system ladder in an attempt to make gains that really leave us worse off due to the damage made to the ladder system by patents. The damaging pro-patent ideology is also adding to tensions between patent-enforcing nations and developing nations who are being coerced or erroneously persuaded to implement patents while also being sort of accused of stealing our ideas without proper compensation. This is rooted in the same fallacy of attributing innovation to those making the innovation as opposed to the market process. So-called developed areas like North America, Europe, and Japan became developed because the market process managed to work well enough in those areas as to incentivize and coordinate minds in a way that so much knowledge was created, and this was done, in spite of patents, not because of them. Old people, being more likely to be found with cancers, does not mean that having cancers leads to old age, it means that natural selection has built us in a way that we can continue to live for a while in spite of the cancers. Too much government, just like too much cancer, eventually destroys the superstructure. The market process ability to organize the social order in ways that lead to what we would call progress is amazing. A little freedom goes a long way. Technological progress in the 20th century has been great, in spite of cancerous government bureaucracies, wars, patents and other misguided government regulatory frameworks which we believe to be the creators or managers of social order while they are in fact its retardants or destroyers to significant degrees. Think about how truly unfair the following is, 
The Chinese had the misfortune of having much of their 20th century destroyed by war and a truly communist economy which led to the deaths of tens of millions while the market process used millions of brains in the US to discover new ideas, and now that the Chinese increase their freedom and begin to have their social order be coordinated by the market process, they have to pay royalties to the West. This seems pretty unfair to me. Developing nations like India and China should not feel like they are stealing ideas from the more developed nations, and likewise the United States, should not be souring economic relations based on patent infringement which you can be sure is a significant part of the economic saber-rattling that the economically clueless tribalistic Trump administration is doing. Savings, interest rates, business cycles, and recuperating coronavirus job losses. Finance banking and interest rates are other vital aspects of the market process. Besides the more obvious function of safeguarding savings and pooling the savings of many people to allow the execution of bigger projects which would have been impossible if entrepreneurs were limited to the few savings wealth of friends and family, banking finance and more specifically the phenomenon of interest rates also play a nearly miraculous role. For example, Assuming interest rates are at around 8 to 10 percent, some people, those who have no desire to start a business or have inferior business ideas they expect will have a return on investment, ROI, lower than 8 percent, will be motivated to lend their money to banks to earn 8 percent interest and by doing so they refrain from consumption spending, thus increasing the amount of wealth savings available to the future borrowers. The banks are a place where such saved money can be combined, easily accessed and loaned out in different quantities to nourish ideas businesses restructurings of different sizes. Banks charge borrowers a higher interest than what they pay to save as lenders and profit the difference. For example, they lend 1 million to John who uses the money to pay for his business consumption as it produces, as sales revenue, $1,300,000 worth of stuff thus growing the economic pie by 30%. He pays back loan with the 10% interest, 1.1 million, and keeps the $200,000. The bank pays the savers 8%, $80,000, and keeps the percent too, $20,000, with which to pay for nourish its own consumption. Something amazing is going on here. Interest rates motivate the accumulation of wealth and movement of money from mined CPUs that have inferior ideas that can grow the economic pie slowly, 0 to 8 percent rate, to mines that have superior ideas and can grow the economy faster, greater than 10 percent, thus giving a tremendous sort of computational boost to society. To the economically ignorant, banks financier money lenders, making a living by charging interest without seemingly having to sweat seems immoral and ethical, but the economically woke can see how they play a vital role in pairing savings with the best ideas and the interest rate, is like a barometer that helps decide whether a mind should do the saving or borrowing. The savings wealth of the rich, like all wealth in the private sector, is eventually spent on the private sector sustaining efficient private sector's jobs that will tend to grow the economic pie by at least, the prevailing interest rate. Taxing such wealth savings from the rich just destroys those jobs orders and leads to relatively unproductive government consumption. If you take away the wealth that the rich spend on creating yachts and big homes, you have destroyed the jobs livelihoods of the yacht and big home builders. It is important to realize that, as the great economist Henry Hazlitt writes in his classic economics in one lesson, saving, in short, in the modern world, is only another form of spending. The usual difference is that the money is turned over to someone else to spend on means to increase production, and that this increase in production has to be at least large enough to pay back the loan with interest. The economically ignorant masses are unaware of the fact that thanks to the finance banking sector, the savings of the much vilified rich is the very wealth that private sector workers consume while they go about increasing production by an amount greater than the current interest rate. Taxing the rich just removes this wealth and the private sector jobs it would otherwise sustain and gives it to government where it is inefficiently consumed while producing little in comparison leading to massive relative losses. A society that saves little is sort of stuck in the same cycle of production and consumption and is unable to nourish a new business idea restructuring for the time it might take before it produces wealth. 
Where would our 10,000 airplane factory builders get the wealth to nourish their consumption for the two years it would take them to even begin making new planes if others had not saved it? How long would it take for such savings wealth to exist if savings grow very slowly? On the other hand, a society that saves a lot is constantly making wealth available for superior ideas businesses restructurings and thus growing and advancing technologically much faster. The more people save, the more money banks will have to lend out and the lower the interest rate will be as banks compete with each other by offering a lower interest rate to low borrowers. This also means that there is more real wealth available to sustain more ideas businesses, the real wealth that savers did not consume when they gave their money to banks. If interest rates are at 10%, it does not make sense to borrow consume to nourish an idea restructuring that will have a return on investment of less than 10%, but if they go down to 3%, then it does make sense for additional entrepreneurs to borrow and nourish ideas that will yield 10% RI to profit the 7% difference. Now, very important. What happens if interest rates are lowered, not because more saved unconsumed wealth is available, but because central banks increased the money supply bank credit, to artificially lower interest rates from the natural rate of 10%, to the artificial rate of 3%. What happens is that additional projects ideas which would not have been attempted before will now be attempted even though the needed wealth to sustain them to completion will not exist eventually leading to a sort of bust bankruptcies, and partly finished projects which squandered wealth. Mises has a masterful analogy that goes as follows. At any moment in time given a certain real natural rate, again, we assume 10%, there exists enough wealth in terms of bricks wealth needed to create 100 buildings projects. If people have really saved more to bring down the interest rate from 10% to 3% there are now more bricks wealth than 120 buildings projects can be completed, but if the interest rate has gone down to 3%, not because there really are more bricks wealth savings, but because more money has been created, the bases and some scaffolding for 120 buildings is attempted, but eventually, due to the fact that there are now more businessmen with more newly created money which was used to lower the interest rate competing for the same amount of bricks wealth, the price of bricks, factors of production like labor, land, energy, materials, goes up more than would have otherwise been the case, which eventually causes many entrepreneurs to face the unavoidable fact that there did not exist enough wealth bricks at the right prices to complete their projects in a profitable way. Therefore a sort of bust chaos and loss of wealth will eventually happen as inevitable bankruptcies occur. Partly finished buildings that are inhabitable are obviously massive losses, and even though eventually perhaps 70 buildings are completed, the wealth bricks that could have completed an extra 30 was consumed used to create 50 unfinished ones. Mises summarizes, credit expansion cannot increase the supply of real goods. It merely brings about a rearrangement. It diverts capital investment away from the course prescribed by the state of economic wealth and market conditions. It causes production to pursue paths which it would not follow unless the economy were to acquire an increase in material goods. As a result, the upswing lacks a solid base. It is not real prosperity. It is illusory prosperity. It did not develop from an increase in economic wealth. Rather, it arose because the credit expansion created the illusion of such an increase. Sooner or later it must become apparent that this economic situation is built on sand. The sort of bust chaos will occur in one of two ways depending on how the central banks act. If the myth error that creating liquidity money is beneficial persists as the government via the central banks attempts to bail out more and more industries businesses people, either by sending money to people directly or adding it to banks to keep interest rates low and thus continuing the illusion that there is enough saved wealth bricks. Then the hopefully obvious result is hyperinflation and an intensifying unproductive chaos as money's vital coordination of profit-loss economic calculation breaks down, leading to more consumption than production, riots, famine, who knows. Eventually people will switch to a foreign currency or something else for money. The better scenario is that the central banks, stop the money creation. Remember, 
the creation of money just transfers wealth from society at large to the entities receiving the money, it is just a transfer of wealth. Unfortunately the wealth is being transferred to orders government's businesses that are misaligned, ultimately consuming more than producing, thus continuously shrinking parts of the economic pie, so you have less wealth and more money and the obvious relative higher prices. Stopping the money creation inflation will do several beneficial things, 1. It will allow wealth to remain in the control of the brains that created it in the first place and thus contain superior profitable information, in other words, the information needed to order society in a manner that creates more wealth than it consumes which is precisely what is needed. When the government creates money and gives it to some entity, like when it sends a check to someone who lost his job due to coronavirus lockdowns who will simply trade the money for wealth to consume, this obviously just reduces the economic pie while adding additional money leading to relatively higher prices so everyone else will consume less, and also incentivizes the person to not even work produce. If the money is given to some inherently inefficient government bureaucracy we again have consumption by its employees with little wealth added in return thus continuing the relative shrinking of the economic pie and higher prices. If it is given to a private sector company, it will most likely be a misaligned unprofitable order company which will once again lead to a relative shrinking of the economy although not as severe or quickly as the first two scenarios. 2. Stopping money creation inflation will also cause interest rates to rise to whatever level truly coordinates the level of savings and investment possible. Initially and temporarily this will be very high which is great, those projects businesses for which there weren't enough bricks wealth to complete in a truly profitable manner and were fooled into trying by borrowing at low interest rates, will no longer be able to do so and finally go bankrupt and their factors of production like existing buildings and labor will be sold lay off and their prices will come down enough to the point where entrepreneurs will once again be able to incorporate them into truly profitable plans orders thus realigning the social structure of production in the best possible way. If 120 buildings projects are mistakenly being attempted, you want those that can't possibly be finished to fail as soon as possible so they stop consuming the wealth bricks that can go to profitable plans slash buildings. 3. The temporary high interest rates will also motivate people to save and thus consume less so they can earn the higher interest rates which will provide the necessary real wealth savings to sustain further economic growth and also quickly bring down interest rates to more normal levels. Again, the information needed to organize labor society can only be discovered and acted upon by free people entrepreneurs who are at the right time and, and place and have the ideal incentives. Taxes or creating money which is just another way to transfer wealth or tax, simply removes wealth from the private sector where it is part of profitable orders which grow the economic pie on average at a rate greater than the prevailing interest rate, and gives the wealth to government which for the most part just consumes it adding little productivity in return leading to horrendous relative losses of prosperity progress. No matter how chaotic it might seem due to the potential number of bankruptcies, the quicker we allow them to occur and prices to fall, the quicker will entrepreneurs people discover how to once again order labor and existing factors of production in profitable and thus truly pie increasing ways. This applies just as much to a recovery from a central banking inflation created business cycle, as it does to quickly figuring out how to reorder millions of people who are out of work, due to coronavirus hype and related government lockdowns. Right now I could easily hire 50 people in my building for $1 an hour and rent them out to give massages, do laundry, deliveries, etc., however, competition from other entrepreneurs' brains, CPUs themselves who have superior information would pay them more and thus lure them away from my inferior order so that very quickly everyone would be incorporated in the most profitable plans the millions of competing brains can come up with. It is of course vitally important that minimum wage laws are abolished so we allow all profitable ideas restructurings to occur. The coronavirus lockdowns have led to more consumption than production thus obviously shrinking the economic pie. The less seed a farmer has to plant for the next crop, the smaller the crop will be. Since there exists less wealth, the wealth that can be traded for people's labor will be smaller and therefore people should expect lower wages. 
Most of the 35 plus million people who have lost their jobs would probably be able to work in the same companies as before if they are wise enough to accept correspondingly lower pay. Most of us have been made poorer, we will have less wealth to trade for meals at restaurants which means less wealth revenue for restaurants and correspondingly smaller wages if they are to remain in business profitable. Since many businesses, especially restaurants, already pay minimum or close to minimum wages, many will not be allowed to lower wages and have to stop producing altogether. When a business like an airline goes bankrupt and ownership assets are now in the hands of creditors, what usually happens is that the creditors are motivated to sell the business to a competitor who is likely to have the best ideas information leading to profitable use of resources labor and will thus typically be the highest bidder for the old airline business. That's all, financiers investors take losses and often employees also see their wages reduced as part of a now profitable company order. Economic education is obviously the most important thing needed to allow the necessary freedom for this to happen. Hayek summarizes the cure, and, if we pass from the moment of actual crisis to the situation in the following depression, it is still more difficult to see what lasting good effects can come from credit expansion. The thing which is needed to secure healthy conditions is the most speedy and complete adaptation possible of the structure of production, determined by voluntary saving and spending. If the proportion as determined by the voluntary decisions of individuals is distorted by the creation of artificial demand, it must mean that part of the available resources is again led into a wrong direction, and a definite and lasting adjustment is again postponed. And, even if the absorption of the unemployed resources were to be quickened this way, it would only mean that the seed would already be sown for new disturbances and new crises. The only way permanently to mobilize all available resources is, therefore, not to use artificial stimulants, whether during a crisis or thereafter, but to leave it to time to effect a permanent cure by the slow process of adapting the structure of production to the means available for capital purposes. You can't print savings wealth. The errors of Keynes, Krugman and the mainstream. It should be easy to see that you can't print savings at least not the real wealth savings that the real world needs to consume as it sustains production, yet to John Maynard Keynes, arguably the most famous mainstream economist, such money-only savings are just as genuine as any other savings let's look at another absurd statement from Keynes which further reflects the utter ignorance of the vital role savings play in the economy, whenever you save five shillings, you put a man out of work for a day. You're saving that five shillings adds to unemployment to the extent of one man for one day, and so in proportion. On the other hand, whenever you buy goods you increase employment, for if you buy goods, someone will have to make them. And if you do not buy goods, the shops will not clear their stocks, they will not give repeat orders, and someone will be thrown out of work. Therefore, O oh patriotic housewives, sally out tomorrow early into the streets and go to the wonderful sales which are everywhere advertised. You will do yourselves good, and have the added joy that you are increasing employment, adding to the wealth of the country because you are setting on foot useful activities, surely all this is the most obvious common sense. For take the extreme case. Suppose we were to stop spending our incomes altogether, and were to save the lot. Why? everyone would be out of work. And before long we should have no incomes to spend. Wow! First of all, when most people save their money they invest it, which for the general case here we'll just assume that it is loaned out at interest. The money still gets spent by the borrowers as Hazlitt already reminded us. With respect to his extreme case where people save all their income and don't spend. Why bring up such a foolish scenario that would never be in anyone's best interest to attempt? Who does not want to trade spend for the food, gasoline, wealth they need to survive? Keynes, like most of his adherents, and the public at large sadly, is also utterly ignorant of the vital fact that economic activity must be coordinated in a way that produces more than it consumes, otherwise it is obviously shrinking the economic pie. Yet this coordination requires precise knowledge and is something only millions of free individuals and businessmen can achieve by using profit-loss calculation at the individual, household, 
and corporate level. Unaware of this, Keynes disastrously encourages the purposeful destruction of wealth just so people are put to work rebuilding it even though the effects of this are a massive shrinking of the economic pie. He writes, activity of one kind or another is the only possible means of making the wheels of economic progress and of the production of wealth go round again, why not pull down the whole of South London from Westminster to Greenwich, and make a good job of it, would that employ men? Why, of course it would. One should not be fooled by fancy money-related terms or mathematical equations. Complex-looking mathematical equations models econometrics are just as inappropriate for making sense of the socio-economic order as they are for making sense of how trillions of cells and bacteria coordinate the biological one. As Mises writes, as a method of economic analysis econometrics is a childish play with figures that does not contribute anything to the elucidation of the problems of economic reality if you just keep your eye on the cycle of wealth production and consumption, most economic fallacies can easily be avoided. The housing that comprises the south of London exists, it is then destroyed thus a huge loss in wealth has occurred, then a massive amount of existing wealth has to be consumed in terms of food energy materials etc to sustain many men who produce new buildings. The net result is the loss of existing housing, and the wealth needed in exchange for new buildings. Had the housing not been destroyed, Londoners would have still had them plus new housing or whatever else the men would have produced as they consumed the same amount of existing wealth as before. So the erroneous belief that real savings wealth can be printed to then stimulate the economy, i.e. activity of one kind or another even if you have zero regard for whether the people are ordered in a way that produces more than it consumes, provide the one-two punch of fallacies that keep the mainstream slightly smarter apes making the same errors over and over, culminating in the most terrific economic fallacy that could possibly exist, that war is good for the economy and its corollary. That World War II is what got the USA out of the Great Depression of the 1930s. Consider the following absurdity by 2008 Nobel laureate in economics Paul Krugman, think about World War II it brought us out of the Great Depression. If we discovered that, you know, space aliens were planning to attack and we needed a massive build-up to counter the space alien threat, this slump would be over in 18 months how can getting millions of people to consume wear down existing wealth to produce weapons which are then used to destroy fellow human beings and their property be anything other than an obvious reduction in life wealth order. Krugman's statement is the perfect example of what Mises once told students, don't be afraid to speak up. Remember, whatever you say about the subject and however wrong it might be, the same thing has already been said by some eminent economist. The benefits of immigration. The free migration of people allows them to quickly become parts of and expand the most productive orders thus vastly increasing production. A person in Africa is stuck in an unproductive order which lacks good laws, respect for private property of course, roads, advanced tools factories, large groups of already highly educated and productive minds order so his production might be $5 per day. By just moving to a more advanced productive country area like the USA, even without knowing English, he can do many jobs manage aided by a bilingual English speaker when necessary and easily increase his rate of production to say $7 an hour or $1.56 a day, an 11-fold increase in his rate of production, benefiting his life tremendously and that of existing American world producers because they now have additional customers that can actually afford their products instead of poor Africans that can't. In countries like China, every day thousands of relatively unproductive farmers who are producing wealth at a rate of say $10 day are moving to cities to join work with use factories which might triple their rate of production to say $30 day. Similarly, one of the reasons why the USA has been far more productive than the similarly sized Europe is because people have had the freedom to easily move to the areas companies that are more productive and there have been no internal tariffs and other impediments to free trade and thus competitive knowledge discovery within a large area and population. When countries allow foreign investment, they make it profitable for wealth to be shipped to poor countries to create the tools factories order that can increase the productivity of workers, but it is even better when the workers have the freedom to quickly move to and incorporate themselves with the already existing more productive order. Does the above mean we should drop all existing national borders? No. 
If everyone understood freedom, then yes, this would likely be what the overwhelming majority of people would want, but under current circumstances, a more piecemeal approach that respects the wishes of large populations and numerous complexities should be considered. Cultural evolution Human beings can be said to be made out of two books with information, our genome which contains the genes sentences information which describes our biological order, and our cultural book which encompasses the languages, laws, customs, ideas and everything else we consider to be culture or the software that guides our actions. Having discussed several aspects of the market process like economic competition and interest rates, as well as how private property inadvertently leads to its emergence and social organism, we can now discuss how processes of selective evolution evolved our cultures, the market process and emerging social organism without conscious human planning or design. In other words, how vicious tribal slightly smarter apes had their culture ideologies software changed from their instinctual law of the jungle, which they have been practicing for millions of years to civilized commerce, tolerance, and at its very core, respect for private property. We discuss the process that tamed civilized us, a process that was the result of our actions, but not of our conscious planning, similar to how cells inadvertently created the respiratory, circulatory, nervous, etc. systems that made up multicellular organisms. As Karl Menger asks, how can it be that institutions that serve the common welfare and are extremely significant for its development come into being without a common will directed towards establishing them? Hayek answered this monumentally important question via an evolutionary competitive process that goes more or less as follows. If we envision mankind about 100,000 years ago, we would see a sort of petri dish of competing cultures languages concepts rules laws that are being naturally selected based on their ability to grow the groups that contain them relative to other groups. Customs concepts rules etc. That inadvertently cause their respective social orders to grow whether it would be via conquest, successful defense, migration into, imitation, etc., will expand their order and the very customs concepts rules ideologies etc which helped them thrive. Every rule law has an effect in the productivity growth survival of a social order. Given that a society tribe is likely to have dozens of such rules it is impossible to know the exact impact of any one of them when considering the overall competitiveness of a society order. For simplicity's sake let us focus on just one rule, what is the optimal punishment for theft? In the tribal past a stereotypical tribe might believe in some animal spirit god. The very existence discussion of the concept among members of the tribe, coupled with inevitable dreams which would make such concepts seem real and shared among the tribe, would be enough to greatly solidify such mythology religion. The shaman sacrifices the virgin and it happened to rain the next day thus making the science certain settled. If the rains didn't come, perhaps she had to be sacrificed facing another direction. Again, what matters is how certain ideas make enough sense to create the echo chamber that leads to them being carried out and propagated. Let's assume that in culture tribe, a when a man steals he is killed which might deter many thefts but decreases the number of people in the group and all the productivity that this person might contribute in the future. In tribe B they cut off a hand, and in tribe C ten lashes. Let's assume that tribe A's custom rule of killing the thief actually proved to lead to a fitter social order. Perhaps it turns out that cutting off the hand led to an unproductive person that became a big drain on rest of tribe and a weak useless fighter when it came to offense defense so it was better if he was dead, and that lashes proved to not be enough of a deterrent which led to many thefts and retaliatory violence which turned out to be more costly than losing a member of the tribe. For simplicity's sake let us assume that this was by far the most important custom rule affecting the growth fitness of the social order, and that because of this, tribe culture A eventually displaced the others so that its kill thieves rule custom survived while the other punishments disappeared. The kill thieves rule, is the result of human action, yet not the result of conscious human planning or design with the reasoned or conscious goal of having a more competitive fit social order. The real designing of this rule or cultural element was made, not by innate instinct or human reason, but by natural selection competition group selection cultural evolution. 
This concept of cultural evolution group selection allowed Hayek to identify a sort of third dimension source mechanism for discovering spreading knowledge which was neither instinctual, tied to our genetics biology, nor the result of our conscious reason. As Hayek liked to refer to it, it was a mechanism for creating spreading information which lay between instinct and reason and is the largely unknown understood source of knowledge that played the vital role in the evolution of the market process, and those related social institutions. Consider the following example, omnipresence, the ability to be everywhere at all times is another concept that would provide a great benefit to religions that used it to describe their god. Without God's omnipresence you could get away with breaking the rules that give society order and only have to face the consequences brought upon by fellow men. But if God is everywhere, watching your every move, you will be much more likely to follow those rules that give your society a productive social order. A similar case can be made for the concepts of sin and evil. Did clever men conspire to create our religions to control us? Of course not. Like the market process, they too are indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design. It could be said that an omnipresent God is one of those culturally evolved, designed concepts that is far more important than anything our reason has ever invented, as Hayek writes, we may owe to these religions the preservation, admittedly for false reasons, of practices that were more important in enabling man to survive in large numbers than most of what has been accomplished through reason. These concepts rules help enforce constraints on what for brevity's sake we will refer to as our evolved, tribalistic small group, primate-like nature instincts law of the jungle, which for millions of years were shaped by things like violence, cannibalism, rape, what today would be considered pedophilia, tribal warfare and other practices which are now generally seen as abhorrent and whose relatively recent suppression via culture-religion law enabled the emergence of the social organism civilization. Growing up is about programming molding our flexible brains into learning all of these rules and thus rewiring them to be as happy as possible even though many of these restrictions go counter to our uncivilized instincts. We have tentacle porn, QED obviously the molding brainwashing fails quite often when we engage in rape, torture, militarism, war, sin and more. One can easily speculate about how the simplicity and pro-private property character of Judaism's Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not steal murder commit adultery covet neighbors. And monotheism helped it be more viral and thus be naturally selected over other beliefs religions that might have been more complex confusing contradictory and also be less respectful of private property thus inadvertently foregoing the emergence of the market process and corresponding social organism civilization. Due to numerous evolutionary pressures involved, megafauna extinction etc., agricultural grain bread based society, although inferior and suddenly out of sync with our evolved big game hunter carnivorous biology in terms of nutrition at the individual level, was more conducive to trade, the resulting division of labor information competition, and thus a large more productive powerful social order at the group level. Nomadic tribes can't carry around large buildings granaries, increasingly complex tools weapons etc. Instead of sharing things which was vital for tribal communist intuitive existence, privatization became more important productive. The privatization of land resources others slavery women children and accompanying enforcing myths taboos religions began to be naturally selected for. Our very concept of the self became more individualistic and less tied to a tribal communal identity. We went from animalistic promiscuity gangbangs women can have multiple orgasms and enjoy sex for longer uninterrupted periods than men due to sex with multiple males for millions of years, to a stricter and more privatized family structure with the necessary taboos myths software needed to enforce them, you shall eat bread. Genesis 3:19, 10 Commandments Pre-agricultural man didn't even have a word or linguistic construct for a biological father, this cultural concept language arose due to the natural selection of agricultural, and pastoral societies which benefited from such privatization, over the tribalistic hunter-gatherer communist groups that didn't. Egyptian civilization, although populated by relatively malnourished agrarian people, had an advanced division of labor commerce, could feed equip large armies and thus ultimately became one of modernity's cultural great-grandparents. 
Rules relating to sex are crucial given the biological importance and potential turmoil relating to it. For example, at some point we developed strong taboos punishments for sex with animals. For example, the Hebrew Bible mentions, whosoever leath with a beast shall surely be put to death. Exodus 22:18, And thou shalt not lie with any beast, to defile thyself therewith, neither shall any woman stand before a beast, to lie down there too, it is perversion. Leviticus 18:23. For the Hittites we have, if a man has sexual relations with a cow, it is an unpermitted sexual pairing, he will be put to death however, if a man has sexual relations with either a horse or a mule it is not an offence some form of marriage custom, has evolved to help deal with sexual issues and currently the one man one woman rule has been the winning selected strategy for most cultures. But it is impossible to predict that this arrangement is the best thing for mankind going forward. We certainly know that biologically we are polyamorous and much more like our primate cousins the chimpanzees and bonobos. Fake, boobs, genetic engineering coming down the line, birth control, women's freedom and who knows what else the future holds makes predicting what might emerge impossible. Thanks to the large amounts of wealth, safety, and tolerance that our modern societies now provide, even a single mother can easily provide for her children helping reach a new level of individualism, that can make breaking away from the traditional family structure possible. Not that we are encouraging this. Preferably it is the freedom of each person to evaluate what is in his her best interest while taking into account the freedom of others that guides this evolution from the bottom up instead of various coercive controlling schemes the economically ignorant masses and their politicians increasingly fall for. Our ever-changing societies will lead to changes whose repercussions we will never be able to fully predict, as Hayek wrote, man is not and never will be the master of his fate, his very reason always progresses by leading him into the unknown and unforeseen where he learns new things morals have a lot to do with enforcing the sort of equality that leads to a stable social order. Traditional morals shun showing off and laying praise on qualities that cannot be shared or possessed by everyone. According to traditional morals if you have beautiful daughters, you don't raise them to take advantage of their looks, on the contrary, it is considered virtuous to forego those advantages that most cannot have. Daddy's little princess is groomed to be more virtuous, her beauty is like an extra special gift that should go to a man that has done great things for society, to the doctor, the respected member of the community, etc. and definitely not get knocked up by the local playboy who doesn't have a job but uses his charm and good looks something that does not add value to society and might not be possessed by others giving him an unfair advantage. By doing this sort of thing we create an environment that helps mold us into liking things that everyone can achieve and encourage productivity while disliking things that are not conducive to everyone's happiness and leads to potentially unproductive habits. If we put too much emphasis on looks then there will be a small number of more beautiful people who set a standard for what is preferred that most cannot achieve, and given the way our minds work, how they are constantly making associations between traits, mannerisms, etc., and what is considered best, an increasing number of people fall into the pattern where they will be unhappy because they cannot associate themselves with that which the trendsetters are creating. This is the kind of thing that makes some fear genetic engineering and the legalization of steroids prostitution etc. We fear that suddenly many people will want to look a lot better, or some particular look becomes the ideal and the rest of us will either have to go along or have our kids grow up in an environment where they are relatively uglier and less associated with those characteristics that are considered attractive successful. Any setting where we are associated with qualities that are not as good as those of others naturally make us feel a little uncomfortable, especially if everyone around us considers those qualities to be important. We tend to measure our success relative to others and for obvious reasons we tend to avoid such situations. A modern example of this is the online social sites like Facebook where a sort of subconscious popularity contest seems to drive much of what goes on. We just want to be associated with that which is considered fun and cool or praised by our culture. As we age we have even less incentive to show off our looks and have a culture that places so much emphasis on looks etc., so older folks play a noticeable role in creating a cultural ambience that also shuns such inequalities. 
We also praise hard work, self-reliance, and professional achievement. These are things that everyone can achieve and lead to a more productive society. Religion greatly helps here as well. We are all equal under the eyes of God at least the large Islam Christianity, so that too helps us associate great qualities that are held by everyone. We teach our children to try to put themselves in other people's shoes, this way we can perhaps feel some of the pain our actions might have on others and hopefully this exercise will once again motivate us to act, live, and praise those things that everyone can excel at and have good consequences for society. These traditional morals which are pretty universal and shared by grandparents of Americans, Chinese, Arabs, etc. have worked pretty well. For most of our evolution life was not about how cool your partner was, you just looked forward to having one and having enough wealth, so that your children were well fed. People who deviated from these morals were quickly shunned and seen as selfish or sinners, etc. They can or will change but what really matters is whether they lead to a competitive order that produces more than it consumes. Some people mistakenly believe that if certain traditions or social norms break down society will suffer greatly, but this will likely not be the case if people understand basic economics. Theoretically and in all likelihood we can go back to having sex with animals and other practices today most consider barbaric, what we can't do is abandon forget abolish private property and resulting economic freedom. The above can help us understand some of the roots of the modern political left Darwinian scientists irreligious versus right, religious tradition, divide. For example, to various degrees the left tolerates encourages the human animal in his natural, intuitive, animalistic state and thus attacks the culturally evolved gender roles as the increasingly influential LGBT movement shows, increasingly allows sexual activity by youth at whatever age may arise naturally, and is far more tolerant of things like prostitution. While the right finds such things as sick or malicious perversions and injurious to society, this also helps us understand how the left-right mindsets or identities see the so-called Jeffrey Epstein scandal where many famous people like Bill Gates and Bill Clinton took many flights to the property where Epstein organized sexual relations between young women and visitors. Today's intellectual and political leaders are not religious and tend to be Darwinians and see little wrong with having sex with 13-year-olds as was the case just a few centuries ago and even more so 50,000 years ago, so little effort to apply the law exists, especially when so many of today's leading figures seem to have participated. This also helps us understand the Balenciaga clothing brand scandal where ads by the brand implying a certain potential tolerance of sexual acts by minors created a storm of controversy. Again, an increasingly Darwinian mindset by an increasing number of thought policy intellectual leaders is moving in this direction causing a cultural war, especially as each group uses government force to coerce each other with its views. Our cultural brainwashing also had to tame the feeling of envy and jealousy which obviously plays such an ardent factor in fueling the economically ignorant anti-capitalist mentality. Hayek writes, envy and ignorance lead people to regard possessing more than one needs for current consumption as a matter for sensio rather than merit. Yet the idea that such capital must be accumulated at the expense of others is a throwback to economic views that, however obvious they may seem to some, are actually groundless, and make an accurate understanding of economic development impossible just like natural selection modified solitary cells to have tumor suppressing genes to control rapid cell division proliferation, cancer, in order to cooperate in a multicellular organism. So has cultural evolution likewise molded Homo sapiens to suppress these uncivilized animalistic barbaric tendencies resulting in a far more prosperous order. As Hayek tells us, man has been civilized very much against his wishes. It was the price he had to pay for being able to raise a larger number of children. We especially dislike the economic disciplines. The indispensable rules of the free society require from us much that is unpleasant, such as suffering competition from others, seeing others being richer than ourselves, etc., etc. Constraints on the practices of the small group, it must be emphasized and repeated, are hated. For as we shall see, the individual following them, even though he depend on them for life, does not and usually cannot understand how they function or how they benefit him. 
disliking these constraints so much, we hardly can be said to have selected them, rather, these constraints selected us, they enabled us to survive. Early cultural evolution, names, self, identity, language, and reason. When how did we begin naming people which would bring a tremendous advantage for group cooperation? Associating ideas language with the concept of the self. And linking the self with group religious tribal identities which was vital for group tribal cohesion in war conquest, defense survival. The farther back in time we go, the more ethnocentric tribalistic our ideologies identities were. A tribe group that didn't have such strong as versus the mentality would be outcompeted in war offense defense and be naturally selected out of existence thus what remained existed in our tribal past was strong ethnocentrism. These vital early cultural concepts software are neither in our genes, and also do not prove to be the result of an intention aimed at this purpose, i.e., the result of an agreement of members of society, menga, they were designed refined by competition between groups. Most slightly smarter apes still place great emphasis on their identity as Jews, Christians, Muslims, etc., sometimes leading to understandable yet disastrous results as will be discussed later. Obviously it only takes a few seconds to come to the realization that whatever identity religion one identifies with is purely based on luck circumstance and having grown up among fellow slightly smarter apes that raise us identifying as such. What about human reason? It too has far more to do with cultural evolution than most realize. Imagine the following cruel scenario. A baby is taken from his mother at birth and raised by plain-looking mechanical arms. No human being looks at him in the eyes implying that there is a self behind them. He never sees his own reflection, is never spoken to and thus never picks up a language which is crucial for thinking. For example, Mises writes, thought is bound up with speech. The thinker's conceptual edifice is built on the elements of language. The human mind works only in language, it is by the word that it first breaks through from the obscurity of uncertainty and the vagueness of instinct to such clarity as it can ever hope to attain. Thinking, and that which is thought cannot be detached from the language to which they owe their origin. How would this unfortunate person think as an adult regardless of how powerful the brain and what it gets purely from genetics? Hayek writes, it may well be asked whether an individual, who did not have the opportunity to tap such cultural tradition could be said even to have a mind Hazlitt tells us, referring to man in general he could not think at all or only at the level of a chimpanzee, if he did not inherit from the society and civilization in which he was born the priceless gift of an already created language. Without this he would not only be unable to reason logically, he would have nothing worthy to be called a concept. He could not frame a sentence, he could not even name things. We think in words, even in conversations. Our language, concepts, and logic are part of the social inheritance of all of us, as the great 19th century philologist Max Muller put it, to think is to speak low. To speak is to think aloud. The corollary of this is tremendously important. A man with a scant vocabulary will almost certainly be a weak thinker. The richer and more copious one's vocabulary and the greater one's awareness of the fine distinctions and subtle nuances of meaning, the more fertile and precise is likely to be one's thinking. Knowledge of things and knowledge of the words for them grow together. If you do not know the words, you can hardly know the thing. We are told that the Tasmanian method of counting is, one, two, plenty. This points to a very significant truth. Man could not even count, certainly not beyond the number of fingers on his hands, until he had invented names and symbols for numbers. For in speaking of the need for language for thought, we must, of course, include symbols as an integral part of language. It is amazing how recent in human history are even the Arabic numerals, the deanery system, and elementary signs for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. My guess is that a bonobo ape, raised among humans and taught some rudimentary sign language would act far, far more reasonably than this culture software-less person. And again, 
What is the process that designs those things like language, religions and the market process which are indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design, Ferguson. Natural selection competition via Hayek's group selection. Knowing that private property is the simple concept institution that leads to a chain reaction of incentives which creates the social organism, we can easily see that those tribes orders whose customs religions inadvertently became more peaceful and thus less violent, extended peace friendship trade to those outside the tribe, etc., in other words, those who tended to respect private property and thus individual freedom more and more, would become more technologically advanced powerful. And as they grew, they would inadvertently spread the very customs, increasing respect for private property, tolerance, and commercial culture that emerges from it, an evolving economic system, market process capitalism, that allowed them to reach such relative heights. Once again, the true sort of designer of the market process was our old friend natural selection competition acting on groups cultures, inadvertently selecting those customs ideologies concepts as if they were genes. Another great example of this process was the Protestant Reformation. For centuries the Catholic Church's traditions myths held immense coercive monopoly competitionless power which prevented retarded individual freedom and resulting competitive knowledge discovery. In the early 1500s Martin Luther preached that a person could be saved by believing in Christ without the Catholic Church's approval, and that the Bible itself, not the Pope Church's edicts interpretations, was what mattered. This helped reduce eliminate the coercive monopoly power of the Church. Instead of people thinking and producing for the never-changing priesthood, people now gained the freedom to think and produce for each other, leading to competitive knowledge discovery and skyrocketing rates of innovation production prosperity in Europe Christendom. Now, very important. Did Martin Luther reason that his religious interpretations would accelerate competitive knowledge discovery leading to our relatively advanced civilization? Of course not. Just like solitary cells millions of years ago inadvertently via an evolutionary process created the respiratory circulatory nervous etc. systems that led to multicellular organisms without designing them, so is language, the free market and capitalism, to borrow the insightful phrase from Adam Ferguson, indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design, or as Karl Menger writes, it arose as the unintended product of historical development. Great, and dangerous to even discuss, examples of cultural evolution are circumcision and age of sexual consent. Circumcision is a physically dangerous and truly cruel and barbaric practice, yet somehow it emerged and is still practiced by millions of very educated Jews and Muslims. The reason of the increasingly dominant Darwinian mindset in countries like Germany and Iceland via government coercion have attempted to ban it. Whatever potential benefits, if any, circumcision may have provided are as difficult to discover as the evolutionary pressures millions of years ago that led to the evolution of certain genes. Again, Groups of Homo sapiens are naturally selected primarily based on how productive and technologically advanced they become relative to others, and cultural values that encouraged production and large populations have been selected over leisure, violence and our animalistic sexual instincts, thus it is understandable how age of consent laws and norms have been pushed higher. If a 13-year-old voluntarily performs some sexual act with an adult, and even more shocking, does so for money which may have happened in ancient Rome, this is considered a major crime and horror given how allowing such a voluntary practice would affect the functioning of the current order. Notice how the truly barbaric practice of circumcision is generally allowed, yet the above voluntary exchange is generally viewed with horror, vilified and criminalized. Why? Again, cultural evolution, not reason, is what has evolved the rules and ideologies that create our social order. Cultural, not biological evolution is the key. We must stress the fact that the cultural evolutionary process which has created the market process is much, much faster than the slow genetic biological evolution thus rendering slight genetic differences between races populations largely irrelevant. As Hayek tells us, with respect to what we mean by cultural evolution in a narrower sense, that is, 
the fast and accelerating development of civilization, since it differs from genetic evolution by relying on the transmission of acquired properties, it is very fast, and once it dominates, it swamps genetic evolution also, biological evolution would have been far too slow to alter or replace man's innate responses in the course of the 10 or 20,000 years during which civilization has developed. Thus it hardly seems possible that civilization and culture are genetically determined and transmitted. They have to be learnt by all alike through tradition. Hayek's The Fatal Conceit page 16, as numerous great free market thinkers like Mises, Robert Higgs, and Ralph Rako just to name a few have shown, during the last couple thousand years different groups of people in widely dispersed locations like, the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, traded the sort of title for most socio-economically advanced places in the planet. Mises makes this point and criticizes people who focus on race, but it is by all means an unsatisfactory answer to say that a genius owes his greatness to his ancestry or to his race. The question is precisely why such a man differs from his brothers and from the other members of his race. It is a little bit less faulty to attribute the great achievements of the white race to racial superiority. Yet this is no more than vague hypothesis which is at variance with the fact that the early foundations of civilization were laid by peoples of other races. We cannot know whether or not at a later date other races will supplant Western civilization. With respect to the momentary lead in terms of civilization that China had, and the real reason why whites Europeans had a recent relative lead, Hayek writes, the history of China provides many instances of government attempts to enforce, so perfect an order that innovation became impossible. This country, technologically and scientifically developed so far ahead of Europe that, to give only one illustration, it had ten oil wells operating on one stretch of the river Po already in the 12th century, certainly owed its later stagnation, but not its early progress, to the manipulatory power of its governments. What led the greatly advanced civilization of China to fall behind Europe was its governments clamping down so tightly as to leave no room for new developments, while, as remarked in the last chapter, Europe probably owes its extraordinary expansion in the Middle Ages to its political anarchy, Hayek's The Fatal Conceit page 44, Private Governance, The Wisdom of the Anarcho-Capitalists, Friedman Rothbard Tanhills. The political anarchy Hayek referred to in earlier quote just means that there was no central authority preventing monopolizing legal religious moral ethical knowledge and thus preventing the superior knowledge discovery that cultural evolution competition brings about. Not only does government stamp out competition which is the main selective competitive process that helps us discover what is best in terms of how to go about providing goods and services but also what rules laws, judicial penal transportation systems and more are best. As Hayek tells us selection by evolution is prevented by government monopolies that make competitive experimentation impossible. Since freedom, decentralization, and the economic legal moral competition it creates is the best way to discover superior information and subsequent order, why not allow freedom competition in things we usually associate with monopolistic governments like the legal and penal systems and more. The cultural evolutionary competitive process that it has shaped religions and more recently secular governments which provide such governmental functions has been happening blindly, and has been largely tied to the religious myth we inevitably see as absolutes, which explains why the legal penal systems are still draped in religious-like mysticism. Think of priestly judges and their costumes robes, temple-like court buildings etc., but once we understand the competitive process we can use it to our advantage. Imagine if people could own large chunks of land and have more sovereignty or freedom as to what laws rules people should abide by in them. Today the knowledge of how to plan a city, what laws rules we should follow, what should be the repercussions of breaking such rules laws, how to design a transportation legal penal system, and so much more comes about the bureaucratic monopolized politicized process that shapes the inefficient public sector. By allowing people the freedom to create such cities we introduce competition in these areas which will discover superior laws rules contracts, ways to build transportation systems, ways to deal with people who break the rules and so on. If people wanted to move to such cities they would just sign a contract saying that they would abide by its rules, which is no different than what we do today when we move to a new country state, 
which is just agreeing to abide by certain rules. This is similar to choosing product A over product B. In this case people are selecting one set of laws rules over the other, nourishing a better social order information while starving an inferior one. They vote for a better system with their feet. Think about a small country like the island nation of Grenada. Grenada has about 110,000 people living in an area of about 130 square miles and its social order produced about $1.1 billion worth of wealth in 2007. Like all modern nations its government has a monopoly on law enforcement, courts, defense, and many other services. Microsoft, Walmart, and IBM coordinate about 90,000, 2,100,000 and 400,000 employees respectively and in the year 2008 had a combined productive output of about $500 billion worth of wealth. If allowed, isn't it obvious that the aforementioned companies or similar private sector orders, whose employees count among the world's hardest working and best educated minds, would be better able to manage a similarly sized social order city than the Grenada bureaucrats? Of course they would, and a similar line of thinking should apply to social orders or private cities of any size. Just like we have companies that help manage condominiums, so would companies arise that would build and or manage entire cities, these companies would contract other companies that specialized in creating transportation, legal systems, etc. The obvious desire and benefit of allowing smooth integration with other cities would evolve standards of interoperability similar to how the IT software world has evolved, so much interoperability and in standards among so much international freedom and competition. Considerably more privatization, or a world without governments as we currently envision them might seem like a weird or shocking concept at first but upon closer examination its tremendous benefits and feasibility should become obvious. Take the provision of law enforcement for example or any municipal service. Police departments are citywide government monopolies, which like all monopolies, immune from competition due to government decree and economic ignorance grow to become gigantic consumptive bureaucracies. For example, California prison guards can earn upwards of $300,000 per year due to lucrative overtime pay. A police commander in Delray Beach, Florida, was making $90,000 per year when he retired at the age of 42 after working for 21 years. He got a $65,000 per year pension that is guaranteed for life, adjusted for inflation, and includes medical care. If we assume he dies at 82 years old, he would have worked for only about a third of his adult life and Florida taxpayers would have paid an additional $2.6 million plus medical expenses while getting nothing in protection services in return. There is nothing wrong with making a lot of money when one creates a lot of wealth and then trades such wealth in the free market, where competition ensures that the way such wealth was created is efficient, and is usually part of a profitable cycle that leaves the economic pie larger. But these people's wages are not reflective of superior knowledge and productivity, they are reflective of the evolution of a political system dominated by self-serving unions and ignorant or flat-out corrupt politicians who find cleverer and more subtle ways to tax the public and believe that no price is too high to pay for such vital services. So how can privatization and competition be introduced in law enforcement and other sectors which we are so used to associating with inherently inefficient government monopolies? A more privatized world should not seem so shocking when one realizes that our world as it currently works can already be seen as being privatized. By simply seeing each country's government as a private corporation that has a rightful monopoly in the provision of everything the government does like courts, roads, law enforcement and national defense, we can already see the world as being 100% privatized. Each country's government can be seen as a complicated set of laws that apply over a territory, or as a company that has a monopoly of providing law courts defense services over the territory it owns. It is important to realize that a company is really just a contract between individuals and the same can be said about a government. Just like corporations have their corporate bylaws where the people who create the company craft and agree to rules describing how various aspects of the company will be run, 
The U.S.'s government can be seen as a corporation whose corporate bylaws are described in the U.S. Constitution and the thousands of pages of existing regulations, etc. So just like governments can be seen in a more privatized way by thinking of them as private corporations, laws can be seen as clauses in a contract. One of the most important things to realize is that the world currently works without a global government. For example, when someone commits a crime and flees the country, most countries have extradition agreements with other countries that dictate how they will coordinate the transfer of suspected or convicted criminals. And even when such formal agreements do not exist, as is the case with the US and China, it is in all nations' best interest, to coordinate in such matters and be seen by other nations as acting ethically. For the most part this works pretty well and we want things to be this way. We want criminals to have the option to flee to other countries because maybe they are not really criminals. What makes someone a criminal is relative to existing laws or rules. We would not want people fleeing a tyrannical government to be extradited back to their country of origin because they broke a law which most of us would consider absurd or unjust. This is one of the ways in which cultural evolution has been selecting superior laws. People have moved from oppressive societies and their bad laws to freer societies and their better laws, starving the oppressive countries of manpower and intellect, while nourishing the freer nations like the United States, helping them grow stronger which helps them spread their superior values and laws. We see this in Covid mania as people flee the more draconian lockdown states like California, and New York for no lockdown Florida. We should once again remind ourselves of the unintended evils of coercive competitionless monopolies government, especially world government organizations like the World Health Organization. Their rules regulations laws are discovered via the usual mixture of human tribalism, economic ignorance, all kinds of special interests, corruption, and so much more. There is no competition, no voting with your feet once the laws regulations apply to the entire world. When farmers use selective breeding to create a bigger cow or ear of corn, they can be said to consciously use their knowledge of evolution to their advantage. When they breed a bigger cow, they do not know what genes or groups of them led to the bigger cow, but by selecting the bigger cow, they got the right genes without having to tinker with them. Just like a cow, society is a large organism, and in many ways the laws, customs, rules, knowledge, and regulations that it contains can be seen as genes. The way all of these things interact can be very complex and lead to results that are impossible to predict. We cannot just pass some law rule and predict all future outcomes. For example, things like drug prohibition, appropriate age or method used to label someone a minor, and similar rules have countless unintended consequences, which might depend on the interaction with other social rules making it even harder to pinpoint how exactly each law rule affects society. Just like changing a gene or two in an animal can lead to unexpected results as that gene interacts with many biological processes leading to who knows what given the complexities of an animal, so can the rules laws of society. Just like the breeders selected the whole cow level based on simple criteria, like how much milk it produces, without knowing about the genes that achieve this, free individuals can choose to move to societies whose rules might lead to overall better results based on simple criteria without having to know how all the laws rules etc. lead to such a superior social order. For example, a person did not have to understand how the United States laws and social institutions created a better society than communist Cuba in order to want to come to the US. They just looked at simple things like how much they could afford given the money they expected to earn in their jobs. By allowing more freedom and the ability to freely manage create entire cities or anything else, we would consciously use cultural evolution to select for superior breeds of laws rules and many other things just like biologists farmers fishermen use their knowledge of biological evolution to grow better crops fish. Understanding cultural evolution and the workings of the market process has been a little harder to see than biological evolution. Thanks to modern technology we can almost see the genes and evolution happen under our microscopes, but cultural evolution, the evolution of the market process, language, law, 
various socio-economic institutions and so on are not tangible things that have led themselves to easier experimentation like the biological world. As in the case of international law and things like extradition, one can see how the global lawful superstructure that we can naively expect a global government to carry out, does not need a global government and naturally evolves from the bottom up as the various subunits slash countries slash individuals contract with each other. Private cities kingdoms would create the same kinds of extradition contracts the way today's countries have evolved them. If some kind of cooperation is truly in the best interest of all potential cooperators, whether they'd be individuals, or large groups of them, the contractual bonds that would solidify such cooperation will naturally grow from their self-interests. Again, whenever we expect things to be done, it comes naturally for us to envision some visible and deliberately created man-made leader coordinator structure bureaucracy to be the one that carries it out, and we tend to be unaware of how a contractual structure that evolves through time can lead to superior results and is in fact what sustains the modern world. Some cities could be kid-friendly cities specifically designed for two-parent families where people have to be married with kids. People may choose to live in those cities while they raise kids. Different cities would have different age of consent laws for various things like alcohol, drugs, sex, prostitution, etc. allowing competition and thus the true wishes insights concerns of people to better emerge evolve. Practices that a majority of the population may abhor like say child euthanasia or too low an age of sexual consent or any other practice could still be restricted by not allowing people who come from or have visited places where detested practices take place from entering the cities of those who find such norms distasteful. The above should not be seen as some moralist crusade or desire to abolish governments. Like law, language, and the market process, Governments have been crucial social institutions, we just want to understand their evolution and how to improve them to maximize prosperity. If the world's governments were run by people familiar with Mises Hayek etc. and were focused on maximizing freedom and competitive knowledge discovery, all would be great, the problem is that governments are usually run by economically clueless apes who want to centrally plan and or do other less than ideal things. The evolution of money, Menger's flux capacitor idea of the social sciences. In our earlier example showing the benefits of trade and resulting division of labor knowledge, what if Tom was not interested in Mark's pastries and wanted a blanket instead? Mark would have to find the blanket maker, hope he was interested in his pastries, make the trade, and finally trade the blanket for the basket. But what if the blanket maker was not interested in pastries either and wanted wine instead? One gets the point. This problem, of having to run around setting up intermediate trades to make the trade you really want is commonly referred to as the double coincidence of wants problem because for a trade to happen you need the coincidence that both parties are interested in the goods they have available for trade. We must always keep in mind that biological order life, whether it is the cells that make up a person, and therefore the person and therefore the social order, is in a constant cycle of production and consumption of wealth. Simply being alive has a cost, in other words, the amount of wealth that must be consumed in order to stay alive. The man who spends three hours setting up a trade is consuming food energy, his family and all that depends on his production will be consuming as well. The more time wealth you have to spend consume running around setting up the intermediate trades the higher the cost of transaction becomes and the less time you have for production, and there will come a point where you will be more productive hunting and gathering and abandoning all the benefits of trade than spending all day setting up intermediate trades while you starve to death. So the great benefits of trade like the division of labor and knowledge which is necessary for civilization can only be realized if we solve the double coincidence of wants problem. This is where the evolution of money plays a vital role. Founder of the Austrian School of Economics Karl Menger's explanation of the emergence of money and its ramifications is the flux capacitor idea of the social sciences. It is the idea that makes time travel understanding society possible and is in all likelihood the most important insight to have coalesced in the mind of a human being. As people traded, they realized that there were some goods that most people were willing to trade for, 
not necessarily because they wanted to consume them, but because they knew they could later use them to trade for the things they really wanted. For example, let's assume Mark is now a member of a 1,000-member market-oriented society where goats were very common. People could use them for their skin fur, milk, and meat, and most households had at least a few. Because of this, even if Mark already had more goats than he needed for milk skin meat, he would still be willing to accept them as payment for his pastries because he knew that given the goat's popularity there was a high chance that he could later trade the goats for the other goods he really needed. Even if the basket maker Tom did not want Mark's pastries there would be a good chance that he would accept one of his goats, and even if he didn't want the goat either and Mark had to contact the blanket maker, if he did accept the goat it would have saved Mark from having to see if the winemaker would trade with him. Essentially what happens is that by offering to trade a more popular good Mark increases the chances that his attempt at trading will be successful so the average number of intermediate trades goes down the more widely accepted the goats are. Once people started using a common medium of exchange the goats, the double coincidence of wants problem went away and goats became the money in the society. The more people, say Adam, Biff, and Cindy, started accepting goats in exchange for their products, not just because they valued the goats due to their milk fur meat, but because they too realized that they could later trade them for what they wanted, in other words, the more people valued them as money, the more incentive others, say Dan, Ellen, and Frank, would have to also accept goats as a form of payment because they saw how Adam, Biff, and Cindy would later accept the goats as well. Goats now were valuable for four things, their skin fur, milk, meat, and as money, as something people value because others will trade for it, therefore making the goats valuable and tradable with an even greater number of people. More people begin to accept goats as payment because they realize they can trade them with more people, leading to more people noticing that more people are accepting goats and so on, until eventually the majority of people, if not all, would be using goats and thus goats became the major source of money. Without money one trades two specific goods for each other but a lot of unproductive time and effort must be wasted making intermediary trades to trade for what you really need. Using money two quick trades take place, first one quickly trades a specific good for the generally accepted good, money, then one quickly trades the generally accepted money for what one really needs. Mark would sell a batch of his coconut pastries for money, a goat, and then quickly trade the goat for the basket or knife, assuming everyone accepts goats by now. Thanks to money, very little time, effort, and consumption needs to take place while one does the trading, leaving that time slash wealth available for increased production and growth. In other words, the transaction costs have been greatly reduced. In the example above as well as in the real world it is important to note that money was not a deliberate invention on the part of any individual or government. What eventually becomes money naturally arises as it is inadvertently selected by people following their own selfish interests. By inadvertently overcoming the double coincidence of wants problem, these societies inadvertently enjoyed the benefits that trade brings to a social order. As Menger tells us, as each economizing individual becomes increasingly more aware of his economic interest, he is led by this interest, without any agreement, without legislative compulsion, and even without regard to the public interest, to give his commodities in exchange for other, more saleable, commodities, even if he does not need them for any immediate consumption purpose. The easier it is to trade, the more fluid, and faster the previously mentioned benefits of trade occur and the faster the society that benefits from them will be able to constantly rearrange its social order into increasingly more productive and technologically advanced states. Given that money greatly facilitates trade and therefore greatly increases the rate at which a society progresses we have to now consider what qualities lead to the best money. For example, let's say a society uses elephants for money, Elephants are big and indivisible. You might be interested in trading some of your elephants for blankets but you feel like one elephant for one blanket is way too much, unfortunately you can't offer a quarter of an elephant. Elephants can also run away, get sick and die, and can get very angry, and destroy property. 
so a society that used elephants for trading might miss out on many trading opportunities. So what are some of the qualities that make good money? 1. Wide acceptance as a medium of exchange. You want the money to be accepted by as many people as possible, this allows you to trade for the most amount of goods and services. Goods and services that now become available to your calculating brain. 2. It should be seen as valuable by itself, like, gold for example. Gold can be used as money yet it is valuable for ornaments and industrial purposes. This greatly helps meet quality number 1. If something is valuable by itself, more people are willing to trade for it which means that you will be able to trade this money for a greater amount of goods and services. 3. You want money to be durable. You don't want your money to be burnt away, or die or run away from you like an elephant can. You want it to be a durable store of value. 4. Divisible and easily aggregated. You want to be able to divide the money into smaller units to enable trades for items of low value and you also want to be able to combine your money into large quantities to facilitate expensive trades. 5. Convenience. Money should be convenient to carry and transfer. 6. Money should be relatively scarce or hard to manufacture. If the money is easy to manufacture, then people have more incentive to create money than to actually produce real wealth. If dirt is accepted as money then people will just dig dirt and offer that in exchange for goods from fools. The economic pie is increased by dirt, while it is reduced as the dirt making people consume the real wealth they were able to exchange the dirt for. A society that uses an abundant thing like dirt for money would have the products it produces brought into the possession of people that came up with the best way of creating money dirt as opposed to the people that added useful products or services. Once again try to picture it from high above. When Alan started using money to build his castle, the most important things in society, the people and their brains were drawn and directed away from productive activities that were good for the whole social order, activities which increased the economic pie of useful goods. The useless and damaging knowledge of counterfeiting was rewarded. Given that money can be used to restructure the actions of the social order it is of vital importance to societies that those who obtain money do so by producing things of value to society, in other words, by increasing the economic pie of socially desirable goods, goods that people are willing to freely trade their money wealth for. If Alan would have produced many great things of value to society in exchange for money and then used his large savings, which came from previous socially beneficial production to build his castle, although the effects would have been similar prices would have first declined as Alan removed money from economy as he saved it, and later increased as Alan injected his savings back into the economy. Society would have benefited in the past from all the great things Alan produced which would have strengthened it or improved it in some way. The destructive effects of inflation will plague societies that make the mistake of using money that can be easily manufactured or counterfeited. Their productive structures will be distorted leading to a weaker and less productive social order. Good money forces every brain to think of a way to add something to the economic pie that society values and is willing to trade for for most of us we add our labor. It forces everyone to always take part in the endless pie increasing cycle of production trade consumption. Good money can be trusted to show the optimal relationships between the values of goods in society and make efficient social calculation possible. Bad money will cause a society to have its structure distorted for the benefit of the people controlling the money supply like Alan did in our simple example, or as is the case in real life, governments and their well-intended yet economically ignorant tribal politicians. Once ideologues politicians technocrats can just acquire wealth by creating money, whether malicious, or just economically clueless, they can bypass the will of citizens and taxation without representation is bypassed. Cattle were the most commonly used form of money in early civilizations, many again, in the earliest periods of economic development, cattle seem to have been the most saleable commodity among most peoples of the ancient world. 
Domestic animals constituted the chief item of the wealth of every individual among nomads and peoples passing from a nomadic economy to agriculture. Their marketability extended literally to all economizing individuals, and the lack of artificial roads combined with the fact that cattle transported themselves almost without cost in the primitive stages of civilization, to make them saleable over a wider geographical area than most other commodities, the trade and commerce of the most cultured people of the ancient world, the Greeks, showed no trace of coined money even as late as the time of Homer. Barter still prevailed, and wealth consisted of herds of cattle. Payments were made in cattle. Prices were reckoned in cattle. And cattle were used for the payment of fines. Among the Arabs, the cattle standard existed as late as the time of Muhammad. Just like complex environmental factors create selective pressures that favor the spread emergence of certain genes in formation, the advantages of living in cities allowed for superior ideas to emerge and spread faster so incentives pressures to select a more suitable money for city life arose leading to a change from the animal standard to the metallic standard and eventually by the early 20th century gold had been naturally selected as the best money. Let's briefly discuss why. It is widely accepted as money, everyone knows gold is valuable and willing to accept it as a form of payment. Gold does not rust or burn away, it can be stored and not decay for an eternity as far as people are concerned, it is durable. It can easily be melted and divided into smaller pieces of any size and also combined to make large purchases. It is easy to carry around. It is very heavy but by the time it gets too heavy to carry you are making very large and infrequent purchases. But most importantly, gold is relatively scarce or hard to acquire. If the money is easy to manufacture then people have more incentive to create money than to actually produce real wealth which would weaken the social order relative to others who had better money. By the early 20th century gold had arisen as the best money. It met all the criteria previously described, helped people all over the world trade and therefore expand the division of labor and knowledge all over the world, bringing great benefits to those societies that embarked on trade. It is important to note that just like money was not consciously invented by people neither was the gold standard. Mankind invented money and the gold standard as much as it invented us. Let us remind ourselves that since gold can't be printed, and thus easily increased controlled by a single body which can then use it to warp the social order via central planning like Allen did, the gold standard inadvertently made it much harder for governments to grow thus keeping more wealth in the pie increasing innovating peaceful competitive private sector. A bad idea that requires directly taking wealth from people is much easier to correct than one which can acquire the wealth it needs by just creating money and sort of fooling the public itself. The gold standard made it much harder for the slightly smarter apes to go to war with each another because the true costs consumption of war will easily reflect itself in painful higher taxes and thus a proper cost-benefit analysis of the war by the public king will help the ideas of peace and mutual understanding compete with the tribal innate good as versus evil them. But with inflation money creation, such evolved constraints wisdom which helped prevent war and central planning are discarded. It should then come as no surprise that the most horrific disasters the slightly smarter apes get themselves into, massive world civil wars and the viral spread of central planning ideologies to various degrees have coincided with the abandonment of the evolution-created international gold standard and a move towards the rationally constructed fiat paper electronic convoluted mess we have today. In the old days, rulers kings would sometimes run out of gold with which to pay their troops and the wars would end, but this would not be the case as central banking began to emerge, giving great leaders a new way with which to sustain and prolong to even more severe levels the destruction that war and central planning brings. As Professor Salerno mentions in one of his many great lectures at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, wars have invariably been financed by printing money since the invention of paper money. Indeed, it might be said that paper fiat money and central banks were invented mainly to finance wars. The first irredeemable paper currency in the Western world was issued in 1690 by the British colony of Massachusetts in order to pay its soldiers in its erratic wars of plunder against the French colony of Quebec. The first central bank in history, the Bank of England, 
was established in 1694 to finance the mercantilist and imperialist foreign policy of the Whig Party that had gained control of the British government. The monopolizing of the banking and financial institutions by governments and their experts and regulations has not only helped create all sorts of crises, it has also retarded the further evolution of financial institutions themselves, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies being the new exception competition. The following quote by Hayek captures all this beautifully, like morality, law, language, and biological organisms, monetary institutions result from spontaneous order, and are similarly susceptible to variation and selection. Yet monetary institutions turn out to be the least satisfactorily developed of all spontaneously grown formations. Few will, for example, dare to claim that their functioning has improved during the last 70 years or so, since what had been an essentially automatic mechanism based on an international metallic standard was replaced, under the guidance of experts, by deliberate national monetary policies. Indeed, humankind's experiences with money have given good reason for distrusting it, but not for reasons commonly supposed. Rather, the selective processes are interfered with here more than anywhere else, selection by evolution is prevented by government monopolies that make competitive experimentation impossible. And again, more concisely, the basic tools of civilization, language, morals, law and money, are all results of spontaneous growth and not of design, and of the last two organized power has got hold and thoroughly corrupted them consider the following, right now you are an incredibly complex order, yet going without oxygen for a few minutes will cause a sort of economic chaos in your body that will make it impossible to recover from even if oxygen becomes available again. The same thing will happen to the social organism if the worldwide division of labor and monetary system breaks down, perhaps even for just a few months or less, or if a few key cities or financial institutions system are disabled in either a cyber attack or an inevitable bug error, or as we are seeing due to the coronavirus because the apes, scare themselves into totalitarian paralysis. Just imagine what would happen if the electronic systems that coordinate how the banks interact with the Federal Reserve breaks down for just a few weeks, and that for whatever reason credit cards and checks or transfers don't work during that time thus leading to a complete breakdown of monetary profit loss order sustaining calculations leading to a rapid pie decreasing chaos. Totally clueless bureaucrats apes and great leaders might succeed in getting enough people behind them to carry out some master plan, but the apes would consume more wealth order than it actually produces as it succeeds in carrying it out thus continuing the socio-economic destruction because only freedom and privatization with a sound monetary system, and profit loss calculation in the private sector can create socio-economic order. A modern gold standard where real physical gold is distributed throughout society might prevent against such disaster. But discussing hypothetical improvements to our eventual monetary chaos is beyond our scope. We just want to understand the potential fragility of the socio-economic order since it is something that has sort of evolved without hardly anyone really understanding how it works and the slightly smarter apes can destroy it at any moment like they did during Lenin's communist Bolshevik revolution which we'll soon discuss. We have discussed how from the tradition of private property one emerges the freedom to trade too, which leads to the emergence of the division of labor and information 3, competitive knowledge discovery 4, which helps civilize our morals and discover the truth, and economic calculation 5. The emergence of these five and other parts of the market process are as unplanned undesigned as money whose evolution was needed to enable the above to function in large numbers of people. This is key for understanding why we live in this complex society which hardly anyone understands and with our reason we constantly attempt to destroy via central planning. Again, we are slightly smarter tribal apes that have been civilized and turned into members of Spencer's social organism by the same process that turned solitary cells into complex multicellular organisms. Processes of Selective Evolution if every cell in our bodies suddenly had the same intelligence and ability to reason that we do, including our current understanding of biology, they would wake up to a bewildering complexity and attempt to use their reason to impose a supposedly superior plan order and while doing so wrecking the far more intelligent systems that evolution competition had fine-tuned for billions of years. 
The reason of so many intelligent and well-educated intellectuals during the last couple of centuries led them to attack private property and the freedom that grows from it because they erroneously thought it led to exploitative capitalism, social injustices, and thought that central planning regulation by well-intentioned educated experts and resulting competitionless monopolistic bureaucracies would lead to far more prosperity. They were wrong of course, their reason proved to be far less intelligent than the evolved traditions which protected invented private property and the market process that emerged from it which hardly anyone at the time, or today, understood. Cultural Evolution Review Wherever there is complexity, mankind will fool itself via what is essentially mythology. A myth is a widely held but false belief or idea. If the slightly smarter apes were wise and humble, they would refer to the science, as the current myths, but we are killer arrogant apes. Mankind is essentially a mythical ape, as his understanding of the world improves, he is able to shatter simpler myths and create new myths about increasingly complex stuff. The myths' ideologies are being naturally selected primarily based on how much respect for private property, freedom, they allowed for which inadvertently led to the emergence of the market process and resulting global civilization social organism matrix. This process had less to do with mankind's reason than people imagine. Again, even though the respiratory, nervous, digestive, etc. systems that coordinate billions of cells to create an animal are the result of the actions of cells, the designer of such systems, was not their reason, but natural selection. The same applies with our increasing respect for private property, freedom, the market process, and resulting social organism which was designed by natural selection via Hakean group cultural evolution. Hayek explains, we have never designed our economic system. We were not intelligent enough for that. We have stumbled into it and it has carried us to unforeseen heights and given rise to ambitions which may yet lead us to destroy it. With respect to private property, I am quite convinced nobody invented it for a known purpose, and to me the proof of this is that even now hardly anybody yet understands what the advantages of private property and the market society are. Hayek essay Individual and Collective Aims published in On Toleration ISBN 0-1987529-3, we are now in a position to understand Hayek when he writes, the ultimate decision about what is accepted as right and wrong will be made not by individual human wisdom, but by the disappearance of the groups that have adhered to the wrong beliefs. Culture is neither natural nor artificial, neither genetically transmitted nor rationally designed. It is a tradition of learned rules of conduct which have never been invented and whose functions the acting individuals usually do not understand to understand our civilization one must appreciate that the extended order resulted not from human design or intention but spontaneously, it arose from unintentionally conforming to certain traditional or largely moral practices, many of which men tend to dislike, whose significance they usually fail to understand, whose validity they cannot prove, and which have nonetheless fairly rapidly spread by means of an evolutionary selection dash the comparative increase of population and wealth dash of those groups that happened to follow them. The unwitting, reluctant, even painful adoption of these practices kept these groups together, increased their access to valuable information of all sorts, and enabled them to be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, Genesis 1:28. This process is perhaps the least appreciated facet of human evolution. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. The slightly smarter apes only look at the immediate effects of their central planning, and other interventions into the complex socio-economic order without realizing most of the time they do far more harm. Henry Hazlitt's famous economic lesson sums it up nicely, the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy, it consists in tracing the consequences of that policy not merely for one group but for all groups. It should now be easy to understand why we have complex microchips, cell phones, airplanes, internet, 
etc. and are parts of this amazing global social organism matrix yet the public and elected leaders and even leading intellectuals remain mired in tribalistic economic ignorance and resulting militarism, which at any moment can explode into nuclear war, or economic paralysis chaos via central planning as the 20th century communism, and now Covid mania are showing. Just like cells have no clue regarding how various natural selection evolved biological systems coordinate them to be parts of complex multicellular organisms, and sometimes turn cancerous by reverting to their primal states of rapid uncooperative cell replication expansion, mankind too remains ignorant of the workings evolution of the natural selection evolved market process and constantly reverts to coercive competitionless central planning tribalism which destroys our order. Without an understanding of how the market process has worked evolved and made us great, we keep focusing on specific individuals, heroes, kings, generals, scientists, great man, being unaware of those deeper evolutionary natural causes. As Herbert Spencer so brilliantly explains in his essay Spontaneous Reform 1902 showing how evolutionary processes, not our agitators politicians slash central planners, are what are growing civilization, what has produced the transformation which has since taken place. Not legislation, not stern repression, not coercion. The improvement has slowly arisen, along with other social improvements, from natural causes. But this large fact and other large facts having like implications are ignored by our agitators politicians. They cannot be made to recognize the process of evolution resulting from men's daily activities, though facts forced on them from morning till night show this in myriad fold ways. The houses they live in, their furniture, clothes, fuel, food, all are brought into existence by the spontaneous efforts of citizens, supplying one another's wants. The pastures and cornfields they travel through, cover areas originally moor and bog which have been transformed by individual enterprise. The roads, the railways, the trains, the telegraphs, are products of combined exertions prompted by desires for profit and maintenance. The villages and towns they pass exhibit the accretions due to private actions. The districts devoted to one or other manufacture have been so devoted by men who were simply seeking incomes to live upon. The enormous distributing organization with its vast warehouses and retail shops lining the streets, carrying everywhere innumerable kinds of commodities, has arisen without the planning of any one. Market towns, large and small, have without forethought become places of periodic exchanges, while exchanges of higher and larger kinds have established themselves in London, where, from hour to hour, you may feel the pulse of the world. So, too, by spontaneous cooperation has grown up that immense mercantile marine, sailing and steaming, which takes men everywhere and brings goods from all places. And no less are we indebted to the united doings of private individuals for that network of submarine telegraphs by which there is now established something like a universal consciousness. All these things are non-governmental. If we ask how arose the science which guided the development of them, we find its origin to have been non-governmental. If we ask whence came all the multitudinous implied inventions, the reply is that their origin, too, was non-governmental. One should keep in mind that while England was overflowing with innovation and leading the way in the Industrial Revolution, the government had nothing to do with any sort of science education or the funding of scientific research like it does today, of the press, daily, weekly, monthly, we still have to say it is non-governmental. It is so with the great torrent of books continually issuing, as well as with the arts, music, painting, sculpture, in their various developments, and with the amusements, filling hours of relaxation. This vast social organization, the life of which we severally aid and which makes our lives possible by satisfying our wants, is just as much a naturally developed product as is the language by which the wants are communicated. No state authority, no king or council, made the one any more than the other. The ridiculous Carlylean theory of the great man and his achievements, absolutely ignores this genesis of social structures and functions which has been going on through the ages. The deeds of the ruler who modifies the actions of his generation, it confounds with the evolution of the great body politic itself, 
of which those actions are but incidents. It is as though a child, seeing for the first time a tree from which a gardener is here cutting off a branch and there pruning away smaller parts, should regard the gardener, the only visible agent, as the creator of the whole structure, knowing nothing about the agency of sun and rain, air and soil. Undeveloped intelligences cannot recognize the results of slow, silent, invisible causes. Education and culture as we now see them, do nothing to diminish this incapacity but tend rather to increase it. In so far as they are more than linguistic, the humanities, to which the attention of the young is mainly given, are concerned with personalities. After the traditional doings of gods and heroes, of great leaders and their conquests, come the products of the poets, of the historians, of the philosophers. And when study of earlier ages is supplemented by study of later ages, we find the so-called history composed of kings' biographies, the narratives of their conflicts, the squabbles and intrigues of their vassals and dependents. In the consciousness of one who has passed through the curriculum universally prevailing until recently, there is no place for natural causation. Instead, there exists only the thought of what, in a relative sense, is artificial causation, the causation by appointed agencies and through force directed by this or that individual will. Small changes wrought by officials are clearly conceived, but there is no conception of those vast changes which have been wrought through the daily process of things undirected by authority. And thus the notion that a society is a manufacture and not an evolution, vitiates political thinking at large, leading, as in the case which has served me for a text, to the belief that only by coercion can benefits be achieved. Is an evil shown? Then it must be suppressed by law. Is a good thing suggested? Then let it be compassed by an act of parliament. The fellow homo sapiens who have absorbed a Jewish, Christian, Muslim, French, Chinese, etc. identity, will mistakenly take credit, or place blame, for things that are ultimately the result of complex evolutionary factors. It is important that we focus on understandable worldwide economic ignorance by the public as the root of our problems instead of which particular ideologues politicians groups end up acting in ways that lead to problems. Mises, if public opinion, is ultimately responsible for the structure of government, it is also the agency that determines whether there is freedom or bondage. There is virtually only one factor that has the power to make people unfree, tyrannical public opinion. The struggle for freedom is ultimately not resistance to autocrats or oligarchs but resistance to the despotism of public opinion. It is not the struggle of the many against the few but of minorities, sometimes of a minority of but one man, against the majority. The worst and most dangerous form of absolutist rule is that of an intolerant majority. And Hayek helps us go one step further in understanding the root causes of such ignorance by explaining how we are tribalistic dangerous slightly smarter apes that have inadvertently become parts of the social organism even though the freedom and tolerance it requires constantly goes against our instincts ignorance. Mises showed us how the matrix works and Hayek showed us how it evolved, sorta, this is a gross oversimplification. As things stand today in mid-2024, we'd be lucky if there are 1,000 people in the entire planet who have had the truly miraculous luck of stumbling upon the Austrians and understand the aforementioned concepts and thus how the world works. The fact that so few people and a few think tank scholars understand this, and how little relative influence in actual politics they have, is further proof of how little reason currently plays a factor in the workings of our socio-economic order. We are essentially flying blind. It is that simple. As we will soon discuss we are lucky to have even lasted this long. Two Nobel laureates, James Buchanan, 1986, and Hayek, 1974, summarize our current situation in an interview that took place in 1978, Hayek, if the politicians do not destroy the world in the next 20 years, which is very likely, I think there is a hope for afterwards. Perhaps 20 years is too short, but one thing which gives me confidence is I've watched the United States for 50 years, and you seem to change your opinions fundamentally every 10. 
and Buchanan highlights how little economic understanding has had to do with our prosperity and we essentially just got lucky that our government legal framework was created in a federalized decentralized manner which helped slow down the inevitable trend towards disastrous monkey central planning, Buchanan, it seems to me that we in the United States have really never had much understanding of sort of the principles of markets. The sort of interventionist collectivist socialist thrust has always been present and really the only reason we had burgeoning markets and rapid growth and so forth was largely because the government was decentralized federalized and so forth in the next few sections we will discuss how the slightly smarter apes and their expert apes are as lost in mythology and resulting suffering as the theologians who orchestrated the Spanish Inquisition. We will discuss how the apes went wild in self-destruction via Vladimir Lenin's Bolshevik revolution which sparked central planning mythology communism throughout much of the world, and also discuss how the slightly smarter apes via the central planning and regulating of science has also led to disasters in nutrition health, and when coupled with the usual economic ignorance, are the foundation of COVID mania socio-economic suicide via lockdowns and coerced bullshit vaccinations and much more that is related. The myths are easy to refute, since myths are information, competition eventually destroys them, but the problem is that the slightly smarter apes inadvertently, via government force monopoly prevent retard such myth busting. As we do so we always want to keep in mind four things, one. An evolving echo chamber of ideas myths that populations hold. Two. A certain cognitive dissonance or bias that understandably causes people to ignore competing new ideas. 3. The incentive structure that motivates people to act the way they do. 4. How the above concepts affect the profitability competitiveness stability harmony of the socio-economic orders while being very cognizant of how central banking money creation, inflation, can be used by the economically ignorant apes to fund governments to greatly harm warp distort the social order. The wisdom applied. From tradition to reason, French Revolution, Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution. The slightly smarter apes have a good understanding of how to pee, shit, rape, and kill, but again, when it comes to anything related to the recently evolved market order, social organism, economics, like the aforementioned money equals wealth fallacy, or not understanding that war is the worst thing for mankind, the slightly smarter apes, including the experts Krugman's canes, are utterly clueless and easily susceptible to paralyzing and tyrannical central planning communism, and thus destroying the social order. It is important that we understand how this occurred in the former Soviet Union because at its core the coronavirus-related socio-economic destruction chaos tyranny, actually all man-made disasters past and future, are ultimately based on the same mass economic ignorance tribalism. Let us discuss the state of man by around the 1700s. Newton's invention of calculus and his ability to use mathematics to discover his laws of motion and gravitation and general scientific progress gave humanity a consistent understanding of the mechanical workings of the world. The idea that the world could be explained with mathematics also began to tighten its grip on the minds of future scientists and social theorists, future economists. To Newton and many others this might have seemed like further proof of the genius of God and that just like there are God's laws of nature there were also God's laws of justice, or what some people refer to as the natural law. God was still above everything and man tried to discover his physical laws as well as his moral laws and therefore justice, but the idea of giving society a human rational order, which would have to violate or replace God's laws, would spread through our minds with every scientific discovery, especially those that clearly refuted scripture tradition. Science was doing away with God, and his laws and morals as a byproduct and man began to create his own laws via legislation and representative governments. The scientists, experts and their reason began to replace the theologians' kings and their traditions which had been crafted designed by thousands of years of cultural evolution. If one had to pick a single point in recent history to pinpoint this changing of the guard from a society built around God's laws and naturally selected traditions to a society centrally planned by human reason experts, a good candidate would be the French Revolution 1789-1799, and the so-called Age of Reason. 
France at the time was structured into three classes, the king and Catholic Church first estate, the nobles second estate, and the peasants workers merchants traders who were lumped into the third estate and paid all the taxes to support the first two. Inspired by the American Revolution, what people increasing saw as their natural rights and other circumstances, the third estate rebelled, chopped the king's head off, confiscated the church's property and made the church subordinate to the state. All of this was great in a way, supposedly we were bringing equality under the law to all men and curbing the power of oppressive governments king's religious entities, but at the same time something else was beginning to happen, something that would enslave men for a new purpose in a new way. Socialism, the idea that government could be used to plan and better orchestrate society. Now government and man-made laws were above the church, above natural law. The time came for human reason and good intentions to rewrite the laws, sometimes with disastrous results. As the French Revolution was getting rid of an evil ruling class, science was accelerating its breakthroughs and inspiring influential thinkers like Saint-Simon, the founder of French socialism. Saint-Simon wanted to organize a great council of Newton made up of three mathematicians, three physicists, three chemists, three physiologists, three authors, three painters and three musicians who would then use their supposedly superior genius to tell everyone else what to do. Saint-Simon explains, all men will work, they will regard themselves as laborers attached to one workshop, whose efforts will be directed to guide human intelligence according to my divine foresight. The Supreme Council of Newtown will direct their works Hayek comments that, Saint-Simon has no qualms about the means that will be employed to enforce the instructions of his central planning body, anybody who does not obey the orders will be treated by the others as a quadruped Saint-Simon's plan of rule by a monopoly of experts is obviously a recipe for complete government control, for socialism, for the inadvertent destruction of competitive knowledge discovery, the market process, and the entire social order, but with good intentions of course. Voltaire, who according to Hayek was the greatest representative of the so-called Age of Reason captured the spirit of the movement by saying if you want good laws, burn those you have and make yourself new ones. Just a couple of generations later, Charles Darwin's discovery of biological evolution would make it even easier for man to discard God and his natural law as an unfortunate byproduct. The growing complexity of the socio-economic order, the overall increase in man's ability to understand the physical world, the belief that science and technology would usher in a new way to socially engineer mankind for the better, and man's subsequent departure from God's justice, were amongst the key factors in transforming natural law and its relatively strong respect for private property into positive law legislation with its anything-goes attitude towards private property and human life itself. The nature of government would slowly begin to change from an entity that was supposed to protect the individual God-given rights of its citizens and customs to an entity that could be used to engineer society for the better. But to engineer society one inevitably has to curb the freedom of the individual in order to implement the social engineer government's plans. As Adam Smith said with respect to the social engineer leader politician or what he refers to as the man of system, the man of system, on the contrary, is apt to be very wise in his own conceit, and is often so enamored with the supposed beauty of his own ideal plan of government, that he cannot suffer the smallest deviation from any part of it. He goes on to establish it completely and in all its parts, without any regard either to the great interests, or to the strong prejudices which may oppose it. He seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that the pieces upon the chessboard have no other principle of motion besides that which the hand impresses upon them, but that, in the great chessboard of human society, Every single piece has a principle of motion of its own, altogether different from that which the legislature might choose to impress upon it. If those two principles coincide and act in the same direction, the game of human society will go on easily and harmoniously, and is very likely to be happy and successful. If they are opposite or different, the game will go on miserably, and the society must be at all times in the highest degree of disorder. 
During the last 200 years the rapid increases in technology and productivity have led to large perceived differences in wealth which have aggravated our sort of intuitive egalitarianism tribalism. Instead of the church, which was supposed to be a sort of representative from God who always had the best interest of everyone and the poor in mind, we began to see large concentrations of wealth in capitalists investors businessmen, were out to seemingly hoard as much wealth as possible to themselves and obviously leave less for the rest. The idea that all this wealth was created by mankind's increased ability to transform that which was previously useless, was, and still is, not understood by people, which further aggravated our egalitarianism, and anti-capitalist mentality setting the stage for egalitarian socialist communist, distributive policies. With the rise of mechanical power like steam engines and trains, our jobs have become less physically demanding. This too is something new. We saw a rise in new industries like finance, investing, banking, insurance, advertising, and a change in the proportion of people employed in manual labor compared to non-manual labor. For most of our evolution, wealth was directly related to our ability to physically transform nature, this involved hard physical labor and sweat. Many of us sort of intuitively consider jobs where we sweat and really have to physically exert ourselves to somehow be more real than jobs where you are not necessarily involved in the production of a tangible physical good with manual labor. In our tribal past anyone who had wealth and did not sweat for it, there was a good chance he stole it, tricked someone to get it, or hoarded it when he should have shared it. It just seems unfair that someone can have a hard physical job yet get paid a quarter of what someone else in a comfortable office can. As freedom was increasing, so was competitive knowledge discovery and resulting superior order and complexity, which increasingly fooled Homo sapiens into a more fervent desire for monopoly government central planning. As the world was advancing technologically so did the complexity associated with the production of most items. Until recently, the steps taken for the production of most items could be traced by a single mind. For example your potatoes were grown by a farmer who used a plough made out of copper dug up by some miners from a nearby mine. The potatoes were brought to the market in a carriage made of wood chopped from a nearby forest. Things were complex but still somewhat possible to trace in small town life. As technology improved, engines and factories, the rate at which mankind could transform raw materials into wealth was rapidly increasing in cities. A rapidly growing class of businessmen entrepreneurs capitalists were constantly innovating and copying the innovations of competitors, thus rapidly creating and spreading superior information, turning cities and the entire planet into supercomputers that were constantly reordering mankind in increasingly productive and technologically advanced states. Competition between increasingly wealthy productive factories capitalists motivated them to pay increasing amounts of wealth for labor relative to what people could earn in farms, causing people to move to cities quickly leading to massively complex metropolises supercomputers. As cities grew in complexity thanks to the market process, the complexity of the interactions grew to an incomprehensible network of trades, which made it seem chaotic to most of us given our lack of an understanding of the market process. It became obvious that things like competition were wasteful, why have different producers each doing things differently, wouldn't it be better if they all shared their knowledge and gained the benefits of standardization. As we should know by now competition is needed to discover the best ways of doing things, but unfortunately this is not the idea which seemed obvious to most. Our instinct to give order to, and plan our actions, naturally translated itself into believing that we could give society a better order than the seemingly chaotic and unfair mess that capitalism freedom was creating. And quite naturally we felt like it was the task of government planners to achieve this more perfect and just order, similarly to how in our tribal past an elder leader might orchestrate a large hunt or migration. The idea of natural selection via evolution creating the biological order is beginning to be adopted or accepted by the majority of the modern world, because here, it is obvious that we did not design the complex processes that create maintain the biological order. We can also almost see the process via our advanced knowledge of DNA genetics. 
but the social order fools us into believing that we are responsible for it because it is our actions that are responsible for it. Yet we are not, it is the market process, natural selection's second child, which creates the social order, which requires individual freedom, decentralized calculation, and is destroyed by government's confiscation redistribution of wealth. We are also used, to simple delegation and organizational thinking for everything we do in the world that immediately surrounds us. For example, we coordinate our households. Within companies, we delegate and can seemingly organize great accomplishments. New technologies and building-sized machinery allows us to create enormous orderly things, so we are fooled into believing that delegation and organizational thinking can accomplish anything. But our purely delegation-based organizing techniques are not what organize the tremendous complexity of the social order, it is the market process. As Hayek writes, today organizational thinking increasingly dominates the activities of many of the most powerful and influential figures of modern society, the organizers themselves. The modern improvements in the technique of organization, and the consequent increase of the range of particular tasks which can be performed by means of large-scale organization far beyond what was possible before, have created the belief that there are no limits to what organization can achieve. Most people are no longer aware of the extent to which the more comprehensive order of society on which depends the very success of the organizations within it is due to ordering forces of an altogether different kind. Until the last couple hundred years, most people produced their goods or services and directly traded them in the market. For example, most people made a living by farming and selling their food, blacksmiths and carpenters directly traded their services or products with society. Trading exchange, was a much more visible and clearly important activity compared to today where most of us do not directly trade some tangible and finished good or service with the population at large. This older exchange society was sustained by certain morals customs which are now being inadvertently abandoned. Hike explains, this exchange society and the guidance of the coordination of a far-ranging division of labor by variable market prices was made possible by the spreading of certain gradually evolved moral beliefs which, after they spread, most men in the Western world learned to accept. These rules were inevitably learned by all the members of a population consisting chiefly of independent farmers, artisans and merchants and their servants and apprentices who shared the daily experiences of their masters, at present, however, an ever-increasing part of the population of the Western world grow up as members of large organizations and thus strangers to those rules of the market which have made the great open society possible. To them the market economy is largely incomprehensible, they have never practiced the rules on which it rests, and its results seem to them irrational and immoral. They often see in it merely an arbitrary structure maintained by some sinister power. Who is that sinister power? Each group of Homo sapiens depending on their history and numerous circumstances mistakenly identifies a different boogeyman. As just briefly mentioned, since the recent and rapid evolution of the market process occurred in Europe, understandably so for much of the third world and non-whites, it is the white man and his exploitative capitalism and or racism. There is of course, the evil corporations, the rich CEOs, greed, sexism, minorities, immigrants, the Jews, etc. It is as if we are fooled into believing that just because the social order is the result of human action, that our problems are likewise the result of conscious planning or design plotting by fellow slightly smarter apes. They are not. They are overwhelmingly the result of economic ignorance. The market process had given the whiter slightly smarter apes a relative technological advantage so as Spencer angrily laments, now that the white savages of Europe are overrunning the dark savages everywhere, now that the European nations are vying with one another in political burglaries, now that we have entered upon an era of social cannibalism in which the strong nations are devouring the weaker. It is useless to resist the wave of barbarism. There is a bad time coming, and civilized mankind will, morally, be uncivilized before civilization can again advance. 17th of July, 1898, and sure enough, eleven years after Spencer's death, 1903, 
as the churches we are all equal under God gave way to nationalistic tribalistic movements along linguistic ethnic lines the apes reverted to their intuitive tribalism and went wild in 1914 with World War I and then the rapid spread of communism. So by the early 1900s viral economic fallacies and their socialist statist central monopoly planning, ideological result had gripped much of the Western world's intellectuals and masses. Mises writes, by 1900 practically everyone in the German-speaking countries was either a statist, interventionist, or a state socialist. Capitalism was seen as a bad episode which fortunately had ended forever. The future belonged to the state. All enterprises suitable for expropriation were to be taken over by the state. All others were to be regulated in a way that would prevent businessmen from exploiting workers and consumers. When I entered the university, I, too, was a thorough statist. Again, the slightly smarter apes had realized that their moral values and laws had been grounded on religious myths. They accelerated replacing the evolved wisdom information laws espoused by religious mythology, private property and family, which had tamed brainwashed the savages into civilization, by the reason of expert scientist apes. Not having the slightest clue what the market process is and how civilization and the bewildering complexity of modern cities emerges from private property freedom since this amazing mechanism's order had been designed, not by clever men, but by an evolutionary process we didn't even really understand at the time. They understandably fell for all the usual anti-capitalist fallacies and saw religion and its traditions of private property and family as something backward and a tool of the growing business capitalist bourgeoisie class. Just like complex environmental factors create selective pressures that favor the spread of certain genes, the environment was ripe for the emergence of a new religion mythology, socialism communism, coercive competition immune central planning by experts, statism. Eventually some slightly smarter ape, would describe these increasingly popular fallacies myths in a manner that was bound to go viral, and that is what happened with Karl Marx and his bite-sized communist manifesto, the theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. Abolition of the family. We now fast forward to the end of World War I 1918-9, when Vladimir Lenin begins to take control of Russia, and attempts to bring about socialism-communism. The slightly smarter apes were about to go wild and revert to their intuitive egalitarianism-communism. Natural selection was about to get a chance to select between the order created by human reason experts' instincts communism, and that of tradition religion. Given that our major faiths evolved customs centered around small farming trading communities, to significant degrees they centered around family life, not stealing, etc. which inadvertently played a key role in the emergence of the market order. It is true of course that the Catholic Church and Islamic Caliphates at times held enormous power but they certainly never intentioned to coordinate the entire socio-economic order as the scientific rational atheists were about to attempt via socialism-communism. Lenin was the man of system. As he tried hard to give a more just and equal order to the Russian people via government planning as opposed to letting the market process and individual economic freedom do so, he acknowledged and said the following, which seems like the perfect and unfortunate complement to Adam Smith's recent quote slash wisdom, the machine refused to obey the hand that guided it. It was like a car that was going not in the direction the driver desired, but in the direction someone else desired, as if it were being driven by some mysterious, lawless hand, God knows whose, perhaps of a profiteer, or of a private capitalist, or of both. Be that as it may, the car is not going quite in the direction that the man at the wheel imagines, and often goes in an altogether different direction. Lenin, as well as most people, believed, that the key feature is people, the proper choice of people, and if we could just have the right people experts great leaders with the right values government central management would work. But Lenin was wrong of course, it is not so much the individual cells people that matter, it is the system, it is freedom and its emergent competitive knowledge and socio-economic order spreading mechanisms. It makes perfect sense how a bunch of economically clueless apes would go wild looking for and pledging support to the ape they feel has the right personal qualities, courage, honesty, intelligence, toughness, etc., 
and coercing everyone to go along with the master plans while being totally ignorant of the need to discover the time and place information and incentives that can actually order mankind profitably, again, a manner cycle in which more order wealth is produced than consumed. The public not only believes that we need a benevolent dictator, the system naturally selects him for us. A confident fool will sway more minds than a doubtful and considerate genius. It is the man who thoroughly believes that he has the right master plan and great group of friends, that carries himself with the needed confidence to sway and inspire the public. As Bertrand Russell put it the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. It is important that we see communism central planning and Lenin's Bolshevik revolution, and other socialist communist uprisings which dominated the 20th century, as well as all of our socio-economic problems since they are all caused or greatly exacerbated by competitionless coercive central planning, as an almost inevitable spread of viral self-reinforcing economic fallacies and incentives that were just bound to finally spark in truly sustainable reactions. A young idealistic Russian could worry about how to make a good living in the always uncertain and competitive private sector, or by joining Lenin his socialist Bolsheviks government he could become a hero to mankind by just forcing farmers others to give up, share, their grain wealth to feed a bureaucracy monopoly of experts who would plan a superior order. Sign me up. Again, we must focus on how the ideas create intellectual echo chambers and incentive structures that lead the slightly smarter apes into either carnage or civilization. We should also highlight the fact that ideologues ultimately inadvertently stumble upon the fact that in order to carry out their wonderful plans, they must either coerce the public directly via edicts, force, direct taxes or regulations, or, even better, simply control the central banks. It becomes a lot easier to spread your ideology and create an incentive structure where most people go along with your wonderful ideas when you can create the money and assure the public that you can provide the money wealth they need. The money equals wealth mass fallacy myth easily causes the apes to self-destroy as one, it allows transfers of wealth from the productive private sector to the centrally planned and efficiently ordered bureaucracies which will consume more than they produce thus destroying social order too, it easily motivates the masses to peacefully fool themselves and even clamor for such an ultimately disastrous rearrangement. Again, we just have to remember Alan and his castle. The masses go from fear and uncertainty to the comfort of working towards the master plan, and see how they are getting the money they foolishly equate with wealth. We can easily see the inadvertent evolution of this process in our modern world where what increasingly matters to politicians ideologues masses is who will appoint or control the technocrats who run the central bank's federal reserve and will thus be able to keep creating money stimulus to take wealth from the private sector to seemingly accomplish anything, Green New Deal, free education and healthcare, racial equality. Visit GatesNotes.com for an up-to-date list of all potential social problems and how Bill and Melinda Gates have a master plan to solve each. This is essentially what the latest monkey economics modern monetary theory is all about. It is just continuous money creation taxation by central bank ideologues technocrats. Regarding this disastrous myth of using money creation inflationism to manage society, something that the slightly smarter apes understandably repeatedly fall for, Hayek writes, I do not think it is an exaggeration to say history is largely a history of inflation, usually inflations engineered by governments for the gain of governments. Inflation is probably the most important single factor in that vicious circle wherein one kind of government action makes more and more government control necessary. For this reason all those who wish to stop the drift toward increasing government control should concentrate their effort on monetary policy. Mises, inflation is the fiscal complement of statism and arbitrary government. It is a cog in the complex of policies and institutions which gradually lead toward totalitarianism. A gold standard, or crypto these days perhaps, makes inflationism impossible thus helping keep wealth with the peaceful and productive private sector and away from tribalistic apes and their clueless socialism and militarism. Inflationism, however, is not an isolated phenomenon. It is only one piece in the total framework of politico-economic and socio-philosophical ideas of our time. 
Just as the sound money policy of gold standard advocates went hand in hand with liberalism, free trade, capitalism and peace, so is inflationism part and parcel of imperialism, militarism, protectionism, statism and socialism. Lenin was a great leader, who had the strength to carry out his vision. An example of one of the orders he was sending to various cities districts to deal with farmers, kulaks, who were rebelling against the grain requisitions went as follows, comrades. The kulak uprising in your five districts must be crushed without pity. The interests of the whole revolution demand such actions, for the final struggle with the kulaks has now begun. You must make an example of these people. 1. Hang, I mean hang publicly, so that people see it, at least 100 kulaks, rich bastards, and known bloodsuckers. 2. Publish their names. 3. Seize all their grain. 4. Single out the hostages per my instructions in yesterday's telegram. Do all this so that for miles around people see it all. Understand it, tremble, and tell themselves that we are killing the bloodthirsty kulaks and that we will continue to do so. Reply saying you have received and carried out these instructions. Yours, Lenin. P.S. Find tougher people. The unproductive chaos tyranny that Lenin was creating inevitably brought a gigantic famine that would claim about 5 million lives in 1921 and 1922. The majestic The Black Book of Communism, Crimes, Terror, Repression explains, despite the bad harvest of 1920, all grain stocks, even the seed for the future harvest, had been seized. Numerous peasants had virtually nothing to eat since January 1921. The mortality rate, had immediately increased in February. In the space of two to three months, riots and revolts against the regime had effectively stopped in the province of Samara. Today, Vivelin explained, there are no more revolts. We see new phenomena instead, crowds of thousands of starving people gather around the executive committee or the party headquarters of the Soviet to wait, for days and days, for the miraculous appearance of the food they need. It is impossible to chase this crowd away, and every day more of them die. They are dropping like flies, I think there must be at least 900,000 starving people in this province, though perfectly well informed of the inevitable consequences of the requisitioning policy, the government took no steps to combat these predicted effects. On 30 July 1921, while famine gripped a growing number of regions, Lenin and Molotov sent a telegram to all leaders of regional and provincial party committees asking them to bolster the mechanisms for food collection, step up the propaganda for the rural population, explaining the economic and political importance of the prompt payment of taxes, put at the disposal of the agencies for the collection of taxes in kind all the authority of the party, and allow them to use all the disciplinary measures that the state itself would use. Fortunately other Bolshevik leaders helped Lenin accept relief from international organizations like the Red Cross, the Quakers and future U.S. President Herbert Hoover's American Relief Association whose combined efforts fed a whopping 11 million people each day. Lenin's anti-market thus anti-production, and thus anti-life order government control measures were such a disaster that by 1921 Lenin scaled some of it back in what was called the NEP, New Economic Policy. The NEP essentially reintroduced some levels of private property enterprise, especially for farmers' kulaks, which immediately led to a better functioning of the market process and substantial increases in food production. Among the numerous things to learn from this and similar disasters is the fact that it is understandably difficult for ideologues like Lenin and his governmental structure, echo chamber of experts and incentive structure since they are wholly dependent on wealth taken by force from the masses, to change their minds since not only do they have to admit to error but also realize that they have caused unimaginable suffering. This is just the kind of stuff the slightly smarter apes don't do that often. The echo chambers just intensify and get more negligent. The incentives are to look the other way, or place the blame elsewhere. Even though Lenin was becoming aware of the chaos he was causing, he understandably had incentives to look for other causes, like saboteurs, the rich capitalist exploiters, not social distancing enough, 
the religious church who did not want to relinquish power authority etc. It was his economic policies that were intensifying the misery, but he would just double down further intensifying it. Besides being fooled by economic fallacies, the Soviet socialists would further fool themselves in other subtle but important ways. For example, while the Americans believed in things they could not prove like God and their God-given rights to private property and freedom. The Soviets were rational and thus didn't believe in God, which made it easy for them to discard ignore God-given rights to private property and unfortunately the competitive knowledge discovery and prosperous socio-economic order that emerged from it. They understandably found religion irrational backward as they shunned it for mathematics, chess, the science, etc. The Soviet Union was the home of the world's best chess players from 1927 to 1993 with the exception of just five years thanks to Bobby Fischer, USA, and Max Erver, Netherlands. They were also the first to put a man in space, Yuri Gagarin, among other accolades. These and numerous other factors understandably fooled them into a certain sense of superiority, and kept the tyrannical and ultimately misguided ideology going. It is vitally important that we look at the countless factors which fool bright, and well-intentioned people into supporting disastrous ideologies. The Soviet Union's rule by competition immune monopoly of experts, scientists had disastrous consequences for scientific research as well. We are fooled into believing that it is scientists that make our wonderful innovations, but it is not scientists per se, but competition which requires freedom of course, something the Soviet Union lacked leading to massive competition immune bureaucracies that evolved to fight change discoveries and warp science research in political ideological ways. A particularly disastrous scientist who rose to the top in the 1930s was Trofim Lysenko who led a campaign against the growing field of genetics, had many other scientists critics persecuted killed and whose competition immune theories related to farming led to millions of deaths via crop failures both in Russia, and later in China helping lead to the Great Chinese Famine, which claimed 15 to 55 million lives. Being a favorite of Stalin and also on good terms with his successor Nikita Khrushchev it wasn't until Khrushchev's downfall in 1963 that Lysenko was thoroughly discredited. From his wiki, in 1964, physicist Andrei Sakharov spoke out against Lysenko in the General Assembly of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR, he is responsible for the shameful backwardness of Soviet biology and of genetics in particular, for the dissemination of pseudoscientific views, for adventurism, for the degradation of learning, and for the defamation, firing, arrest, even death, of many genuine scientists. Rothbard summarizes, the Lysenko controversy, the use of the state to eradicate the science of genetics in Soviet Russia, and the compulsory twisting of truth by the Soviet state to fit the ideological myths of its rulers, are well known, but can hardly be overstressed. It is important to realize that it is not simply because the Soviet or Nazi leaders were particularly perverse men that they reached out to prevent or cripple science's drive for truth, but because such actions are inherent in the very nature of statism, and central planning. Even though plenty of people knew communism would bring about unimaginable suffering, the rate at which the economic ignorance fallacies and perverse incentives appealed to the tribalistic smarter apes was much faster than the rate at which proper arguments against it could spread. The religious traditions of looking at the world's problems as the result of good versus evil did not work with the atheistic socialists communists who thanks to scientific progress and Darwin could easily discard deity-based arguments, in other words, mankind was stuck in what Mises referred to as the moral sphere. Thus the ideological battle between the atheistic scientific anti-religion tradition, central planning by experts viral fallacies and inherited religious traditions continued, with religion, private property, and thus humanity, suffering immensely. In the period between 1927 and 1940, the number of Orthodox churches in the Soviet Union fell from 29,584 to less than 500. The Soviet Union's anti-religion purges were equal opportunity, in 1917 there were over 20,000. Islamic mosques in the Soviet Union, by 1935 there would be less than 60. Thousands of priests would stick to their faith and quickly be shot. 
The atheistic nature of the Soviet Union obviously played a role in making it so much easier to discard human life and thus tremendously deadlier. A family structure, as already mentioned, has been important for keeping the peace and other things, and obviously respect for private property is the foundation of our modern socio-economic order. Communism socialism, good intentions and all, destroyed these two and inadvertently destroyed the order that emerged from them itself. As Hayek mentions, among the founders of religions over the last 2000 years, many opposed property and the family. But the only religions that have survived are those which support property and the family. Thus the outlook for communism, which is both anti-property and anti-family and also anti-religion, is not promising. For it is, I believe, itself a religion which had its time, and which is now declining rapidly. In communist and socialist countries we are watching how the natural selection of religious beliefs disposes of the maladapted in February 25, 1956, Khrushchev shook the world by admitting that the Great Terror, a political witch hunt that Stalin carried out, 1936-38 had led to the execution of about 700,000 to 1.2 million people, had been based on lies exaggerations etc. From the five remaining original Politburo members who took part in the 1917 October Revolution which brought Lenin and his Bolsheviks to power, or except Leon Trotsky were killed. Trotsky went into exile in Mexico but Stalin still managed to get him assassinated in 1940. The killing of top officials was done under the veil of justice in what came to be known as Stalin's Moscow show trials where state prosecutor Andrei Vyshinsky would give long-winded speeches full of made-up accusations, and defendants, either tortured or threatened in various ways, gave their own little speeches confessing their guilt and what bad boys they had been. Here is a great example of Vyshinsky's wonderful legalese in 1936, shoot these rabid dogs. Death to this gang who hide their ferocious teeth, their eagle claws, from the people. Down with that vulture Trotsky, from whose mouth the bloody venom drips, putrefying the great ideals of Marxism. Let's put these liars out of harm's way, these miserable pygmies who dance around rotting carcasses. Down with these abject animals. Let's put an end once and for all to these miserable hybrids of foxes and pigs these stinking corpses. Let's exterminate the mad dogs of capitalism, who want to tear to pieces the flower of our new Soviet nation. Let's push the bestial hatred they bear our leaders back down their own throats, Khrushchev said in arguably one of the most historic speeches of the 20th century, the 25th of February 1956, the commission has become acquainted with a large quantity of materials in the NKVD Soviet secret police, archives and with other documents. It has established many facts pertaining to the fabrication of cases against communists, to false accusations, to glaring abuses of socialist legality, which resulted in the death of innocent people. It became apparent that many party, Soviet and economic activists who in 1937 to 1938, were branded enemies were actually never enemies, spies, wreckers etc., but were always honest communists. They were merely stigmatized, as enemies. Often, no longer able to bear barbaric tortures, they charged themselves, at the order of the investigative judges slash falsifiers, with all kinds of grave and unlikely crimes. It was determined that of the 139 members and candidates of the Central Committee, who were elected at the 17th Congress, 98 persons, i.e., 70%, were arrested and shot, mostly in 1937-1938, the only reasons why 70% of the Central Committee members and candidates elected at the 17th Congress were branded as enemies of the party and of the people were because honest communists were slandered, accusations against them were fabricated, and revolutionary legality was gravely undermined. The same fate met not only Central Committee members but also the majority of the delegates to the 17th Party Congress. Of 1,966 delegates with either voting or advisory rights, 1,108 persons were arrested on charges of anti-revolutionary crimes, i.e., decidedly more than a majority. This very fact shows how absurd, wild and contrary to common sense were the charges of counter-revolutionary crimes made out, as we now see, 
against a majority of participants at the 17th Party Congress. He had to wait till Stalin's death, 1953, to admit this mistake, however, it was not till 1991 that enough doubt and dissent emerged within the political structure and public in the USSR to finally put an end to the more textbook communist-socialist intellectual era and resulting perverse incentives and relative tyranny that ruled that area since 1918. Obviously immense praise should be given to Mikhail Gorbachev for admitting that the communist ideology had been a massive failure error. But the challenge did not end there. How do you get millions of people who have spent generations looking at a single bureaucracy to manage the social order and at least keep them alive to abandon that order maker and trust freedom and competition? Soviet-style socialism and the perverse ideological myths and resulting incentive structure lasted over 70 years. And it still persists today in countries like Cuba, North Korea, and there are communist parties with significant support in many countries and increasingly so in the USA. Once you get the slightly smarter apes chasing their own tails via an ideological and incentive structure that grows government, and increasingly relies on central bank money creation to sustain the wealth transfers needed to keep the government's central plans going, one usually has to wait for it to self-destroy via economic collapse, at the country group level, per Hayek's earlier quote. The ultimate decision about what is accepted as right and wrong will be made not by individual human wisdom but by the disappearance of the groups that have adhered to the wrong beliefs. Good intentions and intelligence guided by economic ignorance leads to disaster. The case of Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein is perhaps the perfect example of a genius who with the best of intentions would use his reason to provide what is essentially a recipe for the destruction of civilization via his economically ignorant push for central planning socialism. In his 1949 article Why Socialism? He writes, technological progress frequently results in more unemployment rather than in an easing of the burden of work for all. The profit motive, in conjunction with competition among capitalists, is responsible for an instability in the accumulation and utilization of capital which leads to increasingly severe depressions. Unlimited competition leads to a huge waste of labor, I am convinced there is only one way to eliminate these grave evils, namely through the establishment of a socialist economy, accompanied by an educational system which would be oriented towards social goals. In such an economy, the means of production are owned by society itself and are utilized in a planned fashion. A planned economy, which adjusts production to the needs of the community, would distribute the work to be done among all those able to work and would guarantee a livelihood to every man, woman, and child. Numerous disastrous economic fallacies can be found above. Technological progress allows us to lower costs so more wealth can be created while consuming less thus growing the economic pie. Technological progress has made it so that on average a single worker in the agricultural sector, thanks to increasingly automated tractors machinery, can create vast quantities of food and competition between such farmers guarantees that they must innovate and copy each other's innovations and that they must sell their food cheaply competitively so now the masses have more wealth to spend in other sectors helping them grow, like the IT sector and everything else we now have since we don't have 80% of people working on farms like we did just a few centuries ago. The wealth that no longer sustains a job that has been lost to automation simply goes to sustain some other job, allowing us to easily afford more stuff, the stuff that got automated and is cheaper thanks to it, plus the new stuff we spend our newly saved extra money wealth on. Einstein is utterly clueless about the fact that the accumulation of wealth by savers and the rich just enters the banking finance sector where interest rate coordination pairs, such wealth with most profitable ideas. As painful as it might be to admit for some, if Einstein can be so clueless, we can hardly blame Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Hitler, Roosevelt and the countless others for the misery they caused. Economic ignorance is the root cause of the relative poverty of minorities blacks. White fragility nonsense. Given mankind's current ignorance of how the socio-economic order works and has evolved Menga Mises Hayek etc are still not mainstream, which is something that has potentially little to do with race, 
it is quite understandable how various race-related fallacies which equate civilization with white people race, like British European imperialism and Nazism, dominated much of the last few centuries and are still very influential today. Certainly at least some much-hated racist white men erroneously believe that civilization and prosperity is somehow tied to their race or Christianity, and understandably these people tend to be more against immigration for example. Although Christianity and religion in general has been a bulwark against the immediate collapse that communism brings, it neither consciously defended free markets or opposed them, like any complex set of myths, ideologues can interpret them for either cause. Mises explains, since the 3rd century Christianity has always served simultaneously those who supported the social order and those who wished to overthrow it. It is the same today, Christianity fights both for and against socialism. Christianity has acquiesced in slavery and polygamy, has practically canonized war, has, in the name of the Lord, burnt heretics and devastated countries. Let's say a few things about how freedom and competition are also the solution to the economic racism so many people fear. First of all, business is people that refuse to do business with people due to race will do less business, thus make less profit, and thus be more likely to be outcompeted by those that do not discriminate. This by itself creates the necessary incentives to help eradicate a racist culture and replace it with a more tolerant one which is precisely what we are seeing as the global free market integrates more fellow homo sapiens. But let's examine things deeper. If you are a CEO investor owner of a company, do you want the people doing the hiring to be racist and forego better qualified, more productive, blacks minorities etc. At the expense of profits. Let's say Edward, an evil racist white man, owns a business that has a workforce of say 100 white employees and pays each on average about $40,000 per year and could replace 10 of them for equally qualified blacks minorities who would be willing to work for $35,000 per year. By hiring minorities he could be profiting $5,000 more per year per employee for an extra $5,000 by 10 employees equals $50,000 per year. Is his racism or preference enough to give up $50,000 per year? Or does he rather curb his own racism and preach tolerance within his company so he can make the extra $50,000? So as one can see, there are financial incentives that motivate people to curb whatever racist attitudes they might have. But there is more than just incentives, there is competition which forces racism to be diminished. Edward's less racist or more tolerant competitors who hire the blacks minorities etc. will be able to sell for less thus forcing Edward to also curb his racism or go out of business. During the days of slavery in the USA the world was still pretty simple, especially in the South where agriculture played such a dominant role in the economy. It was easy to see how freedom could lead to prosperity. Besides the obvious freedom from bondage and torture, blacks wanted the freedom to own their own plot of land, to go into business by themselves and keep for themselves everything they got in exchange for their labor. But in today's world of larger corporations and a tremendously complicated productive structure where hardly anyone produces a physical good product, directly for the market, this sort of freedom can scare us, especially when most of the CEOs and the upper echelons of management are likely to be whites or Chinese and Indian the way things are going. Back in the simpler days, most people were either self-employed, or employed in small businesses, which is not the case today, even small businesses, according to the US definition, can have up to 500 employees. People now have to join these mini social orders instead of seemingly selling producing directly for the public, and if these companies are largely headed by whites who might prefer other whites to a certain degree, then you get this fear of so-called institutional racism. We no longer see our prosperity based on how we can help produce something, we see it based on how we can find a job, or based on who is going to give us a job, as if jobs were these things that were in some kind of limited supply. But by now we know this is economic nonsense. There are as many jobs as people willing to trade their labor for a price others are willing to pay. If minimum wage legislation makes it a criminal activity to trade your labor for less than some amount, then yes, there will seemingly be a lack of jobs. 
The word job itself can be misleading and provides an example of where the meaning of words and language gets us into trouble. People can be seen as producing their labor, labor which businessmen others have to compete for in order to incorporate such labor with their productive plans. And again, working is just trading, so-called companies are just many social orders of people constantly trading with each other to help produce a good or service. At a fundamental level, natural selection selects for order, for social order, which means it selects for knowledge that leads to more productivity, and a racist tribalistic business culture will be less productive and thus outcompeted and eventually die out, so that the businesses all the sort of pockets of knowledge which businesses represent, which remain will be less and less racist tribal and more and more strictly focused on productive ability and the mutual respect that it fosters. The bottom line is that racism tribalism is naturally selected against and we see signs of this everywhere, the world is far less racist tribal as time has gone by and free markets have integrated more and more people all over the world. Most Americans probably prefer to deal with or hire other Americans, yet American companies are expanding in places like China or wherever there is enough freedom to make profits, and this profit motive forces profit seekers everyone into cooperating and ultimately dropping the tribal and ethnocentric culture we have inherited from our more tribal past. The examples I've just mentioned apply not just to so-called racism, but to sexism, overweightism, or whatever other ism which supposedly oppresses some group of people in a free society. Ultimately what is selected for is productive capacity and thus cooperation and mutual respect and sympathy regardless of age, sex race, sexual preference, etc. Improvements in race relations have not come about mainly thanks to the efforts of great leaders like Martin Luther King. Just like ideas and innovations are more the result of the market process than they are of the individual, who had the fortune of having some concepts coalesce in his mind in a way that led to a great invention, so too has the equal treatment of people come about thanks to the economic incentives that united people of all backgrounds in attempts to make bigger profits and remain competitive. Actually, not just the economic incentives, the freedom that allows people to interact with each other and inevitably come to the truth that all human beings are far more alike than the ethnocentric views identities we had inherited from our past. In order to win more championships with which to lure more fans and sell more tickets the Brooklyn Dodgers broke the color barrier in sports by hiring Jackie Robinson in 1947, soon others would follow in all professional sports. By the time Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968 helping to launch him to political martyrdom status, black musicians had enamored an entire generation of Americans and Europeans and people all over the world. Go to England or Spain or Germany and see if anyone has ever heard of Martin Luther King, you'll have a hard time finding people who do, but take your average 40 plus year old person in any one of these countries and ask him her to him along to chart topping songs from the Supremes, The Temptations, Stevie Wonder and so on, you are likely to find millions. Martin Luther King's contributions towards the success of African Americans and minorities are insignificant compared to those of these musicians and the musical entrepreneurs who helped launch their careers like the founder of Motown Record Corporation, Barry Gordy Jr. In our racial problems we can see further factors leading to the modern political left-right divide that has the USA on the brink of civil war. If you are going to have a civil war unrest you need some simplistic ideas which can segregate polarize the economically ignorant masses. To one economically ignorant horde of slightly smarter apes, the political left, Democrats, liberals, the political right, Republicans, conservatives is just the racist white man who uses capitalism to exploit and maintain the status quo for his benefit and Donald Trump and all the other white conservative leaders are the perfect embodiment of this fact. That's pretty much it. It is so-called identity politics, where the racist white man and his antiquated values religion oppresses or discriminates against various groups' identities, women minorities' gays, to make a profit and overturning such supposed political economic oppression is what is needed to fix the world's problems by sharing more wealth and funding social programs, competition less government monopolies, that treat everyone fairly equitably. Unfortunately yet understandably these fallacies have made it easy for people in Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and essentially the non-European world where many were victims of European imperialism, 
to naively equate racist European imperialism with capitalism. The fact that many whites understandably make the erroneous assumption that their blood race religion was a very significant factor in the recent emergence of civilization only helps add fuel to the left-right polarization hatreds. Many whites liberals, with the best of intentions, might be ashamed of the imperialist past of their ancestors or of the racism of their parents uncles friends etc. Or their own shameful preference for perhaps blue-eyed blondes and erroneously believe that such a past racism preference is a significant factor in the relative underachievement problems of other groups minorities. A well-intentioned economically ignorant person can find some racist CEO who discriminates based on race and voila. This racism is the root of the problems. This sort of collective sense of guilt is what allows Black Lives Matter rioters to destroy cities virtually unopposed. So we can see how economic ignorance inevitably leads both blacks and whites to increasingly see whatever racism might exist as an increasingly significant problem to fix, via massive government monopoly coercion of course as can be seen by today's Democratic Party's prominent focus on racial justice. Both groups are wrong. Although it is certainly true that there must be differences in mental ability just like there are differences in physical ones, whatever minute differences can exist are largely irrelevant. It should be easy to see that the explosion in relative human prosperity and technology mankind has stumbled upon during the last 200 years, has little to do with biological differences and much more to do with the expansion of the global division of labor and information free trade competition capitalism, etc. If a human being can grow up and learn something as complex as a language, which can take even the brightest of people years to master, everyone has more than enough intelligence to understand the basics of how freedom privatization free trade movement are the keys to rapid socio-economic progress. Clever economic education marketing is obviously the key. The overwhelming factor in the relative underachievement of minorities compared to whites, especially African Americans, is simply due to the fact that blacks find themselves, due to obvious historical factors like slavery, in an environment where the economic fallacies which lead to central planning socialism, take from others to redistribute equally fairly via huge monopolistic gov. Bureaucracies, are even more convincing viral. If white people everyone hates the rich capitalism and wants to see redistribution of wealth via government monopoly of experts as the solution to every problem, it makes perfect sense that such sentiment would be much stronger with blacks and minorities. For example, perhaps America's most famous black leader, Martin Luther King, like most other prominent black political leaders and intellectuals, had little understanding of economics, and for reasons already hinted at, his socio-economic views leaned more towards socialism. One of today's leading mainstream African-American intellectuals, Michael Eric Dyson writes, King also contended, in 1967, that the roots, of economic injustice, are in the system rather than in men or faulty operations. In a remarkable statement in a speech he gave to his staff in 1966, King laid out the ideological basis for his deepened assault on poverty, economic injustice, and class inequality, we are now making demands that will cost the nation something. You can't talk about solving the economic problem of the Negro without talking about billions of dollars. You can't talk about ending slums without first saying profit must be taken out of slums. You're really tampering and getting on dangerous ground because you are messing with folk then. You are messing with the captains of industry, now this means that we are treading in difficult waters, because it really means that we are saying that something is wrong. With capitalism, there must be a better distribution of wealth and maybe America must move toward a democratic socialism This statement is remarkable since King rarely allowed his positive response to democratic socialism to be recorded. His usual practice, according to one of his aides, was to demand that they turn off the tape recorder while he expounded on the virtues of what he called democratic socialism, and he said, I can't say this publicly, and if you say I said it I'm not gonna admit to it. King didn't believe that capitalism as it was constructed could meet the needs of poor people so understandably MLK had to keep his socialist socio-economic views under wraps but it was hard to conceal the fact that he was often surrounded by communists. Another famous American black leader, 
Malcolm X, sent a letter to President Truman letting him know that I have always been a communist. Perhaps the most famous international black leader, South Africa's Nelson Mandela who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993 is also a socialist ideologue. In a statement at the beginning of the trial that would send him to jail for 27 years he said, we all accept the need for some form of socialism to enable our people to catch up with the advanced countries of this world and to overcome their legacy of extreme poverty, I should tie myself to no particular system of society other than of socialism. The Black Lives Matter organization which has been taken to almost religious-like reverence by so many well-meaning white people is also understandably an economically ignorant communist organization. Black Lives Matter founder Patrice Cullors mentioned that we trained Marxists. These black leaders intellectuals should not be blamed for the fact that they have inadvertently pushed America in the wrong socio-economic direction, have helped keep Africa devastatingly poor, and via the ideologically Marxist communist Black Lives Matter organization are taking America towards a racial civil war. We want to understand the complex environmental factors that lead to the economic fallacies which then manifest themselves in the more obvious trivial identities of socialists, communists etc., and place the blame on such fallacies instead of blaming the current identities of people which can easily change with the proper understanding of economics. These men were courageous individuals with the best of intentions who knew their views would likely have them killed as happened with MLK and Malcolm X. We must always be aware of how difficult it can be to overcome economic fallacies and understand freedom. For example, the great free market black intellectual economist Professor Thomas Sowell still considered himself a Marxist even after getting a master's degree in economics from Columbia University. Sowell writes in his autobiography, The more other government programs I looked into, over the years, the harder I found it to believe that they were a net benefit to society. I had remained a Marxist, despite being at the University of Chicago, but now my experience in Washington began a process of changing my mind completely as to how to deal with social problems. Fortunately, it was a gradual process, so that I was spared the traumatic conversions which some other Marxists have suffered. African Americans during slavery obviously wanted freedom from bondage and the freedom to compete and keep the fruits of their labor. As they gained such freedom their socio-economic progress as measured by literacy, marriage rates, income, etc. was quickly catching up to those of whites and was higher in numerous black neighborhoods in Chicago, Atlanta, and many other cities. While under slavery, not only was there the obvious torture exhaustion associated with it, there was also a system that prevented the proper existence function of the family, and also contributed to the creation of a character which was in some ways dependent on slavery itself and ill-suited to freedom, self-reliance and competition in the marketplace. For example, Sowell writes, with many generations of discouragement of initiative and with little incentive to work any more than necessary to escape punishment, slaves developed foot-dragging, work-evading patterns that were to remain as a cultural legacy long after slavery itself disappeared. Duplicity and theft were also pervasive patterns among antebellum slaves, and these too remained long after slavery ended, as workers, blacks had acquired little sense of personal responsibility under slavery. Lack of initiative, evasion of work, half-done work, unpredictable absenteeism, and abuse of tools and equipment were pervasive under slavery, and these patterns did not suddenly disappear with emancipation, in the decades immediately after emancipation, when blacks first became responsible for their own health, death rates among Negroes rose from what they had been under slavery. But as later generations of blacks became more experienced and acculturated, their death rates declined absolutely, and the large gap between black and white death rates also narrowed, the masses of uncultured, ill-educated, rural southern Negroes who flooded into the northern cities were bitterly resented by blacks and whites alike. The Negro middle class and the northern Negro press denounced them as crude, vulgar, unwashed, rowdy, and criminal and as a menace to the standing of the whole race in the eyes of the larger white community. As already mentioned, freedom and competition is what has evolved our morals ethics culture to be hard-working, tolerant and treat everyone with respect and overcame the aforementioned problems created by slavery. 
Unfortunately blacks didn't just get increasing freedom, they also got constant social engineering socialism from well-intentioned whites which oftentimes did more harm than good. Frederick Douglass' advice below was just as important then as it is today, perhaps even more so today, everybody has asked the question. What shall we do with the Negro? I have had but one answer from the beginning. Do nothing with us? Your doing with us has already played the mischief with us. Do nothing with us? If the apples will not remain on the tree of their own strength, if they are worm-eaten at the core, if they are early ripe and disposed to fall, let them fall. I am not for tying or fastening them on the tree in any way, except by nature's plan, and if they will not stay there, let them fall. And if the negro cannot stand on his own legs, let him fall also. All I ask is, give him a chance to stand on his own legs. Let him alone. Frederick Douglass also said a few words that carry more wisdom than anything coming out of the mouths of all American psychiatrists combined, men are so constituted that they derive their conviction of their own possibilities largely from the estimate formed of them by others. During slavery, long after, and probably still to this very day, some black people must have felt that they in fact were inferior to whites. This was just inevitable understandable given that all the technology, the ability to read write and just about everything that was much more advanced compared to what blacks had achieved was associated with white people. And of course, the experts and the science of the day had all sorts of explanations as to why blacks were inferior and needed whites to make them more productive civilized. For example in 1851, American physician Samuel A. Cartwright hypothesized that a mental illness he called drapetomania caused slaves to flee captivity. Believe it or not, sometimes the established science foresee can be wrong. Given the deteriorating racial and economic situation brought about by economic ignorance, the public is looking for answers, unfortunately they are understandably drawn to the same simplistic fallacies which again we can summarize as capitalism, is the racist white man's tool to enrich himself at the expense of women, and minorities for example. Books like Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility are spreading the usual simplistic identity-based and anti-capitalist and thus anti-freedom and pro-coercion fallacies. For example, she writes, the US economy was based on the abduction and enslavement of African people, the displacement and genocide of indigenous people, and the annexation of Mexican lands, p. 15-16, wrong. Those things certainly occurred, but they were not the base or most important factors leading to the rising standard of living Americans, and the entire planet, would enjoy as US made discoveries and innovations spread globally. The US economy was based on capitalism albeit a very imperfect one of course, on a relatively strong respect for private property and the emergent competitive knowledge discovery and superior social order it leads to, as well as the identity of the fellow slightly smarter apes that best reflects the truth, that regarding the things that really matter all human beings are equal slightly smarter apes regardless of the cultural tribalistic baggage we have inherited from bygone centuries. Unfortunately D'Angelo and the well-intentioned people who always fall for some coercive monopoly central plan have transformed blacks from rapidly progressing free market competitors to being largely dependent on unproductive damaging government jobs, thus their wealth, is increasingly that which is coerced from others. Patrick J. Buchanan summarizes in an article titled Obama's Race-Based Spoils System the 29th of August, 2011 though only 12% to 13% of the US population, blacks hold 18% of all federal jobs. African Americans are 25% of the employees of Treasury and Veterans Affairs, 31% of State Department employees, 37% of the Department of Education, 38% of Housing and Urban Development. They are 42% of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, 55% of the Government Printing Office, 82% of the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency. According to the Washington Post, blacks hold 44% of the jobs at Fannie Mae and 50% of the jobs at Freddie Mac. The great African-American economist Walter E. Williams writes in his aptly titled article Does Political Power Mean Economic Power? While black politicians have preached that political power is a means to gain economic power, 
whether it has done so is a testable proposition. We only have to examine the socio-economic status of black Americans in cities where blacks hold considerable political power, cities such as Washington D.C., Newark, Philadelphia, Detroit, Cleveland, Memphis and others. What we'll find in those cities are grossly inferior education, welfare dependency for much of the population, unsafe neighborhoods and citizens, both black and white, who can't wait for the first opportunity to get out. D'Angelo's book and views which are the nearly inevitable result of the economic ignorance of your average mainstream intellectual reminds me of perhaps today's most famous biologist and evolutionary thinker, Richard Dawkins, and the very first paragraph in the first chapter, titled Why Are People? Of his seminal book The Selfish Gene which we quote in its entirety, intelligent life on a planet comes of age when it first works out the reason for its own existence. If superior creatures from space ever visit Earth, the first question they will ask, in order to assess the level of our civilization, is, have they discovered evolution yet? Living organisms had existed on Earth, without ever knowing why, for over 3,000 million years before the truth finally dawned on one of them. His name was Charles Darwin. To be fair, others had had inklings of the truth, but it was Darwin who first put together a coherent and tenable account of why we exist. Darwin made it possible for us to give a sensible answer to the curious child whose question heads this chapter. We no longer have to resort to superstition when faced with the deep problems, is there a meaning to life? What are we for? What is man? After posing the last of these questions, the eminent zoologist G. G. Simpson put it thus, the point I want to make now is that all attempts to answer that question before 1859 are worthless, and that we will be better off if we ignore them completely. Point. A social scientist who has zero understanding of how the real social order works and has co-evolved with our culture ideologies identities, in other words, someone who has no familiarity with the great economists and social thinkers of the so-called Austrian school, again, as G. G. Simpson put it are worthless and that we will be better off if we ignore them completely. After properly debating their ideas, and persuading others in the free marketplace of ideas of course. Thus Mises, history speaks only to those people who know how to interpret it on the ground of correct theories. Which explains the above mainstream erroneous Marxist way of looking at history as separate classes and now identities in some struggle and the usual capitalism is the white man's tool to oppress thus we must have coercive competition less experts run the world nonsense. We should add that the superior creatures from space Dawkins refers to would have also checked to see if we had discovered how natural selection had created, not just the biological evolution, genetics, which is mainstream, but also the market process. Anyone claiming to be an expert in natural selection and is only familiar with biological evolution, like the hordes of scientists who are constantly prescribing monopoly competitionless disastrous central plans, only knows half the story and can thus hardly say they really understand natural selection. Some Vital World War I History On June 28, 1914 in the city of Sarajevo, Gavrilo Princip, a young man looking to be a hero who was backed by the Black Hand, an organization with close ties to many within the Serbian government, killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This event can be seen as the snowflake that would set off an avalanche of events that would lead to the First World War, the rise of communism, the Second World War, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and many other events whose repercussions continue to affect us to this day. There are many vital lessons to learn from World War I. To make a long story very short. The Austro-Hungarian government had very good, and ultimately correct, reasons to suspect that the plot to kill the Archduke was hatched in Serbia with backing from high government and military officials. On July 23 Austria-Hungary sent an ultimatum with some demands to the Serbian government. Serbia agreed to most of the demands except for one which would allow Austro-Hungarian officials to conduct investigations in Serbia. Serbian Prime Minister Nikola Pašić had known about the plot to kill the Archduke and had made some half-hearted attempts to prevent it, he would have been in big trouble should the Austrians discover this, or worse, the Black Hand, 
and also needed to show himself as a tough guy for the coming election. Serbia's reply to the ultimatum was welcomed news by German ruler Kaiser Wilhelm II who upon learning about the reply stated that every cause for war falls to the ground and the few reservations which Serbia has made with respect to certain points can in my opinion surely be cleared up by negotiation. Unfortunately, bad timing, miscommunication, and the strong desire by some key players on all sides who felt like war was inevitable were too much to stop the momentum for war. Five days later on July 28 Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. On July 30, Russia began to fully mobilize its army against Austria-Hungary in order to help Serbia, and told the Austro-Hungarian army to stop. Military mobilization was a big deal for diplomats and military leaders because it could take many weeks to properly prepare and transport millions of men and armaments. If someone is about to shoot a person, does the person take the necessary preventive measures when the assailant fires the gun? Or when the assailant mobilizes by drawing the gun and aiming? On July 31 Germany, which was allied with Austro-Hungary and also rightly feared that the Russians and French might eventually use the conflict to ultimately harm Germany, gave the Russians 12 hours to demobilize and an ultimatum to the French to state, within 18 hours, whether France would remain neutral in a potential German-Russian war. As neither country complied with these demands Germany declared war on them. Ultimate glory-seeking war hawk and British First Lord of the Admiralty, Navy, at the time leading up to war, Winston Churchill, according to Professor Ralph Rako, quickly allied himself with the war party, and, during the crises that followed, fanned the flames of war. When the final crisis came, in the summer of 1914, Churchill was the only member of the cabinet who backed war from the start, with all of his accustomed energy. Asquith, his own prime minister, wrote of him, Winston very bellicose and demanding immediate mobilization. Winston, who has got all his war paint on, is longing for a sea fight in the early hours of the morning to result in the sinking of the Goban. The whole thing fills me with sadness. German bureaucrats had plenty of reasons for such a seemingly hawkish response. In 1871 the French had started and lost the Franco-Prussian War. Napoleon III wrote to Countess Louise de Mercy Argentor I acknowledge that we were the aggressors. And French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, in 1870 Napoleon III in a moment of folly declared war on Germany without even having the excuse of military preparedness. No true Frenchman, has ever hesitated to admit that the wrongs of 1870 were committed by our side. Dearly we have paid for them. The French invested heavily in the improvement of Russia's military, including a network of railroads to help mobilize Russian troops towards Germany. In January 1914 the French also gave Serbia a gigantic loan, twice the size of Serbia's entire 1912 budget, to help Serbia modernize its military. Germany's war plan was to hold off Russia on the east while quickly taking out France on the west and then finishing off Russia. In order to achieve this, German military leaders felt that the best way to defeat the French was by first quickly passing by neutral Belgium on France's northeastern border. Germany's invasion occupation of Belgium should not stigmatize the Germans as somehow more evil than other world powers like the British. The Germans simply saw this as a necessity and did not look forward to having to fight the Belgian army and had even promised to pay for all damage done by their army on way to France, but obviously and rightfully the Belgians resisted. As late as 1913 the French Supreme War Council was exploring a possible invasion of Germany through Belgium, but the idea was abandoned when the British opposed it. So things could have easily gone in the other direction depending on which group of ideologues opinion given a myriad of circumstances ends up deciding things. After some quick initial successes by the Germans which brought them within 43 miles of Paris, it became apparent that the war was not going to be a quick one with neither side having enough of an advantage to defeat the other and a more or less stalemate lasted for about three years. The three years of all-out warfare were destroying the productive order of all belligerents. In order to help finance their war efforts all belligerents abandoned the gold standard and resorted to the printing press. 
Russia about quintupled the money supply by January 1917. Prices naturally soared, in Simbirsk, for instance, a pair of boots that cost 7 rubles before the war cost 30 in 1916, in ivanovo Vosensensk, Calico products rose to 319% of their pre-war price in September 1916, horseshoe nails, which cost 3 rubles and 40 kopecks in 1914 rose, early in 1916, to 40 rubles. Russia was the poorest of the belligerents with a pre-war, 1913, per capita national product estimated to be $44, compared to $146 for Germany, $185 for France, and $243 for Britain. The socio-economic chaos caused by the pressures of war coupled with the incompetence, corruption and injustice of the Tsar's regime led to the Tsar abdicating his throne and the establishment of a provisional government, on March 14, 1917. British, French and American ambassadors rushed to influence the new government and keep Russia in the war. American President Woodrow Wilson's administration gave $325 million in loans, a huge sum at the time worth about $9 billion in 2023 dollars. But such monetary aid and encouragement is incomparable to the consumption destruction of the socio-economic order that war brings thus it only contributed to the continued deterioration of Russia which allowed Lenin to soon gain power. Again, War causes the social order to destroy itself from within as wealth order life is consumed by the military while nothing of life order sustaining value is gained in exchange leading to a continued shrinking of the economic pie, and the social order that replenishes it. For example, towards the end of war in Germany, metal was so scarce that everything possible, kettles and cooking pots, doorknobs, brass ornaments, telephone wire, and well over 10,000 church bells, was being confiscated and melted down for munitions. Buried pipes were ripped from beneath the streets. Ferdinand Grenard, a French diplomat in Russia at the time observed that, Russia's allies were blinded by their desire to keep Russia in the war at all costs. They were unable to see what was possible and what was impossible at the moment. Thus they only furthered Lenin's game by isolating the Prime Minister of the Provisional Government from the people to an even greater extent. They could not understand that in keeping Russia in the war, they had to accept the inevitable concomitant of internal strife by around this time the Germans helped, bring to Russia Vladimir Lenin, a communist ideologue who wanted Russia to get out of the war. His message of peace, land, and bread which focused on ending the war, redistributing land from the wealthier landowners to the peasants, and having the workers control the factories, instead of the obviously evil profit-seeking capitalist entrepreneurs, made him popular enough to have his Bolsheviks launch a successful military takeover of key institutions, and eventually, after a few years of bloody civil war, control what would be called the Soviet Union. The Germans bet on Lenin paid off. Lenin, truly and somewhat prophetically believing that a communist revolution would soon spread all over the world, made huge concessions to the Germans at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and thus took Russia out of the war. As Lenin said our revolution was born of the war. Lenin immediately tried to implement communism, and lead a worldwide revolution. He nationalized all industry, abolished private enterprise, and forced the collectivization of farms. Besides the shortages, increase in prices, and overall decline in living standards as tremendous amounts of wealth had to be diverted to feed an unproductive war industry, perhaps the biggest challenge the Germans faced was avoiding malnutrition starvation. The British had set up a naval blockade whose purpose according to Winston Churchill was to starve the whole population, men, women, and children, old and young, wounded and sound, into submission. The blockade was having the desired effect. As one German put it, soon women who stood in the pallid queues before shops, spoke more about their children's hunger than about the death of their husbands. Germans imported about a third of their food supply as well as nitrogenous and phosphatic fertilizers whose reduced supply made local food production less plentiful. It is estimated that the blockade, which was illegal according to international law, led to the deaths of 750,000 civilians. 
the blockade would eventually play a key role in helping Wilson's administration join the war. Wilson's administration adhered to the absurd notion that Germany should be held accountable for the deaths of Americans traveling in the war zone on British ships. American authority on international law John Bassett Moore remarked on the absurdity of such a policy when he stated, what most decisively contributed to the involvement of the United States in the war was the assertion of a right to protect belligerent ships on which Americans saw fit to travel, and the treatment of armed belligerent merchantmen as peaceful vessels. Both assumptions were contrary to reason, and to settled law, and no other professed neutral advanced them. On May 7, 1915 the Germans sank the British liner Lusitania leading to the death of 1,195 including 124 Americans. Among the reasons given by the Germans to justify this they mentioned how the ship was carrying 4,200,000 rounds of rifle cartridges, which was true, and that they placed an ad in the newspaper next to the ad that advertised passage on the Lusitania, that warned that this ship was liable for destruction. The bad press and diplomatic response created by this blunder on the part of the Germans led them to stop their unrestricted submarine warfare for over a year. By late 1916 the Germans were planning to resume unrestricted submarine warfare around the British Isles on February 1, 1917 with the hope that this would quickly cause the British to sign a favorable peace before the Americans could join the war and seriously affect its outcome. On January 16, 1917, British intelligence intercepted the Zimmerman telegram which contained information to be relayed to Mexico offering them assistance in reclaiming land lost to the USA during the Mexican-American War should the Americans enter the war on the side of the British due to Germany's decision to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. A few days after the Germans resumed unrestricted submarine warfare around the British Isles, the US ended diplomatic relations with Germany. On March 1 the British made public the contents of the Zimmerman telegram causing a storm of anti-German sentiment in the US and soon after, on April 6, 1917 the US declared war on Germany. Let's briefly go on a tangent and say a few things about the sheer carnage of World War I. Militaries, being the biggest and most tribal monopolies governments usually have, tend to be some of the most wasteful and slow-changing bureaucracies around. This was sadly on full display, in World War I and helped lead to even more unnecessary deaths. By the beginning of the 20th century the machine gun had already proven its worth making cavalry charges and frontal assaults disastrous tactics. As military technology improves, toughness, valor, determination, etc. become less and less important, wounding our manly pride, and especially that of those cavalry men who were at one point the most formidable fighting tools, men like Douglas Haig and John French. Instead of using their reason and putting their flamboyant cavalry riding years behind them for the benefit of superior fighting tactics, they spent their lives defending old techniques and downplaying the superior effectiveness of newer weapons like planes, tanks, and machine guns, at the expense of thousands of deaths. In his 1907 book Cavalry Studies Haig declared that the role of cavalry on the battlefield will always go on increasing. War historian John Ellis writes that according to, the British Cavalry Training Manual of 1907, it must be accepted as a principle that the rifle, effective as it is, cannot replace the effect produced by the speed of the horse, the magnetism of the charge, and the terror of cold steel. Luckily for the Germans, in the First World War, they used machine guns, pillboxes and barbed wire that seemed to have been immune to such awesome tactics. That it took the British generals so long to get this through their heads is partly explained by the fact that nearly all of them were cavalry men. Thus Haig, in 1904, attacked a writer who sneers at the effect produced by sword and lance in modern war, Surely he forgets that it is not the weapon carried but the moral factor of an apparently irresistible force, coming on at highest speed in spite of rifle fire, which affects the nerves and aim of the rifleman. But rare were the cavalry men who came on in spite of sustained machine gun fire. Haig, above all people, should have learnt this simple lesson. Yet in 1926, in a review of a book by Little Hard, Haig asserted that though there were some blasphemous spirits who thought that the horse might become extinct, 
at least on the battlefield, I believe that the value of the horse and the opportunity for the horse in the future are likely to be as great as ever, aeroplanes and tanks are only accessories to the man and the horse, and I feel sure that as time goes on you will find just as much use for the horse, the well-bred horse, as you have ever done in the past. British generals weren't the only ones so slow to change. Ellis continues, within each nation the army above all, nourished as it had been on the old ideals of personal combat, and honorable death, found it most difficult to face up to a concept of war in which death struck whole regiments at a time, delivered by an enemy one could not even see. While describing fighting near the French town of Luz which took place on September 26, 1915 Hochschild writes, the British, according to a German account, move forward in ten columns, each about a thousand men, all advancing as if carrying out a parade ground drill. Never had machine guns had such straightforward work to do, with barrels becoming hot, they traversed to and fro along the enemy's ranks, one machine gun alone fired 12,500 rounds that afternoon. The result was devastating. The enemy could be seen falling literally in hundreds, but they continued to march, as the survivors retreated, the Germans, in a moment of mercy rare for either side, held their fire. My machine gunners were so filled with pity, remorse and nausea, a German commander later said, that they refused to fire another shot. Back from our tangent about World War I carnage. With the US now on their side and over one million fresh and well-equipped American troops in France by early 1918, the French and British would see little need of discussing amicable peace terms, which brings us to the Vindictive Treaty of Versailles, and the rise of Hitler. On the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month, November, eleventh, 1918, an armistice was signed between the Allies and Germans thus bringing an end to the fighting and adding Armistice Day to many calendars. Sadly in the USA on 1954 it was changed to Veterans Day. Instead of remembering and trying to learn about this needless slaughter where everyone should have resisted being a soldier to begin with, like the tribalistic apes that we are, we changed it to celebrate people who just fight in wars, veterans, regardless of the utter stupidity all wars are. The Germans were greatly persuaded to put down their arms thanks to the goodwill displayed by American President Woodrow Wilson and his 14 points as delivered in a speech to Congress on Jan 8, 1918. One month later he would follow up with his Four Principles, speech where he said the following, There shall be no contributions, no punitive damages. People are not to be handed about from one sovereignty to another by an international conference. National aspirations must be respected, peoples may now be dominated and governed only by their own consent. Self-determination is not a mere phrase. All the parties to this war must join in the settlement of every issue anywhere involved in it. Every territorial settlement involved in this war must be made in the interest and for the benefit of the populations concerned, and not as a part of any mere adjustment or compromise of claims amongst rival states unfortunately for the Germans and millions who put their faith in Woodrow Wilson, little of Wilson's words would hold true. With respect to the British hunger blockade Professor Rako writes, yet the hunger blockade continued, and was even expanded, as the Allies gained control of the German Baltic coast and banned even fishing boats. The point was reached where General Herbert Plumer, commander of the British Army of Occupation, demanded of London that food be sent to the famished Germans. His troops could no longer stand the sight of hordes of skinny and bloated children pawning over the offal from British cantonments. A letter by Plumer which was read to US President Wilson, French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, and British Prime Minister David Lloyd George while they were in Paris, four months after the armistice, snobbishly deciding how to punish the German people by drawing up what would become the Treaty of Versailles, read as follows, Please inform the Prime Minister that in my opinion food must be sent to this area by the Allies without delay. The mortality amongst women, children, and sick is most grave and sickness due to hunger is spreading. The attitude of the population is becoming one of despair, and the people feel that an end by bullets is preferable to death by starvation nearly four months after the Germans put down their weapons, on March 3, 1919 Winston Churchill told to the House of Commons that, we are enforcing the blockade with rigor, 
Germany is very near starvation. The evidence I have received from officers sent by the war office all over Germany shows, first of all, the great privations which the German people are suffering, and secondly, the danger of collapse of the entire structure of German social and national life under the pressure of hunger and malnutrition. Now is, therefore, the moment to settle. To delay indefinitely would be to run a grave risk of having nobody with whom to settle, and of having another great area of the world sink into Bolshevik anarchy. That would be a very grave event. It is repugnant to the British nation to use this weapon of starvation which falls mainly upon the women and children, upon the old, the weak, and the poor, after all the fighting has stopped one moment longer than is necessary to secure the just terms for which we have fought. The most objectionable section of the treaty, Article 231, placed all the blame for the war on the German public and would be the basis for attempting to force the Germans to pay for all the loss and damage of the war, essentially partially enslaving the population for several generations. Besides having to pay for all war-related damages, six to seven million Germans, about ten percent of the population, would find themselves ruled by foreign governments as various sections of Germany were being sliced off. Alsace and Lorraine went back to French control, over three million ethnic Germans living in the Sudetenland, which was part of the now defunct Austro-Hungarian Empire, would become a minority in the newly created country of Czechoslovakia. The city of Danzig, along with East Prussia, whose population was 95% German was made a free city under the auspices of the League of Nations and cut off from the rest of Germany by the Polish Corridor which was a segment of land given to a recreated Poland so that it would have direct access to the sea. Since 1795 what used to be the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been absorbed by nearby Prussia, Russia and Austro-Hungary. The recreated Poland would now have nearly a million Germans as minorities as well as millions of Ukrainians. Ill-treatment of these Germans by the Poles would eventually trigger Hitler's invasion of Poland. The Rhineland, German territory on its western frontier, was to become a demilitarized zone administered by France and England. Germany was also essentially disarmed by being limited to an army of 100,000 troops. Germany's railroad network, so crucial of trade production would be gutted by giving up 5,000 locomotives and 150,000 railway cars. And much more. American legal expert James Brown Scott who was a member of the American delegation had a much better understanding of what was being committed and prophetically commented that the statesmen have made a peace that renders another war inevitable. David Lloyd George on another occasion mentioned that, we shall have to do the whole thing over again in 25 years. At three times the cost. Wilson's close aide, Colonel Edward M. House commented in his diary that the treaty is not a good one, it is too severe. I desired from the beginning a fair peace, and one well within the 14 points and one that could withstand the scrutiny of the neutral world and of all time. It is not such a peace. Britain's top military leader Douglas Haig wisely wrote his wife that it is important that our statesmen should, not attempt to so humiliate Germany as to produce the desire for revenge in years to come. When French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau handed German Foreign Minister Ulrich von Brockdorff Rontzau the terms of the peace, Ulrich replied, we can feel all the power of hate we must encounter in this assembly. It is demanded of us that we admit ourselves to be the only ones guilty of this war. Such a confession in my mouth would be a lie. We are far from declining any responsibility for this great world war. But we deny that Germany and its people were alone guilty. The hundreds of thousands of non-combatants who have perished since 11 November by reason of the blockade were killed with cold blood after our adversaries had conquered and victory had been assured to them. Think of that when you speak of guilt and punishment. Upon hearing this, the pomposity of the Allied leaders was on full display. Clemenceau was furious. Wilson exclaimed what abominable manners. The Germans are really a stupid people they always do the wrong thing. And British Foreign Secretary Lord Balfour said beasts they were, and beasts they are. Faced with these and other conditions Germany's first democratically elected Chancellor, 
Philip Scheidemann, refused to sign the treaty and resigned, but with the continued hunger blockade and communist revolutionaries, Jewish too unfortunately, gaining increasing control of Germany, the next German delegation finally agreed to the terms. The humiliation, terms of the treaty, and reparations payments imposed on a war-torn economy would be rightly seen by Germans as one of the main reasons for their economic troubles. Princeton University professor of economics Frank D. Graham commenting on the reparations situation wrote that, the history of reparations till the adoption of the Dawes Plan in 1924 is an almost incredible tale of stupid persecution, the Allies began by demanding the impossible, and they capriciously imposed sanctions when the impossible was not performed. The French also used black Senegalese troops to occupy parts of Germany which greatly humiliated the Germans and helped spike xenophobic hysteria which further helped spread the racist mindset that would lead to Nazism. Historian George Elmos writes, France used Moroccan and Senegalese troops in its Army of the Rhine, and when black troops occupied the city of Frankfurt am Main in 1920, a coordinated and massive German response was inevitable. For the first time, Germans were confronted with a large number of blacks, and in the role of occupiers. Racial fears, never far beneath the surface, were activated and indeed encouraged by the infant government of the new republic. The black rape of Germany might bring the defeated nation badly needed sympathy abroad. Even the basically decent social democratic leader Hermann, Muller exclaimed with indignation that Senegalese Negroes were profaning the University of Frankfurt and the Goethe House. It was against blacks, not Jews, that the ominous accusation of culture and, rape of culture, was first raised after the war. Racial fears were immediately linked to sexual anxieties, a common enough combination, but now increasingly emphasized because blacks were traditionally thought to be more potent than whites. Unhappy with Germany's efforts to pay reparations, Germans were defaulting on timber and coal shipments, French and Belgian troops occupied the Ruhr from 1923 to 1925 to extract payment by force. In the city of Essen, French soldiers shot 14 men who were trying to oppose some seizures. By French orders 80,000 workers had to leave the Ruhr region. The initial occupation of the Ruhr coincided with the latter stages of Germany's famous bout of hyperinflation where something that could be purchased with one German mark in July 1914 would cost 126 billion marks in November 1923. At times prices doubled every 49 hours. This occupation and economic chaos made it even easier for the Germans to increase their hatred towards the occupiers. Graham again writes that, the Reichsbank was finally reduced to making apologies for its inability to provide for a weekly output of more than several billion, or trillion, of marks of the required denomination and to an expression of its hope that this situation would be quickly remedied by an improvement in the speed of the printing presses. The printing presses did their bit. By the end of inflation the daily output of currency was over 400 quadrillion marks. From this chaos, with an unrelenting commitment to undo Germany's subservient status and overturn many of these obvious wrongs imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, Hitler rose to have the overwhelming support of his people and many world leaders like Churchill and David Lloyd George. Churchill said of Hitler in the 17th of September 1937 that, one may dislike Hitler's system and yet admire his patriotic achievement. If our country were defeated I hope we should find a champion as indomitable to restore our courage and lead us back to our place among nations. In an article written for London's The Daily Express on September 17, 1936, David Lloyd George who just 20 years earlier was doing everything in his power to defeat Germany in World War I mentioned the following about Hitler, I have now seen the famous German leader and also something of the great change he has effected. Whatever one may think of his methods, and they are certainly not those of a parliamentary country, there can be no doubt that he has achieved a marvelous transformation in the spirit of the people, in their attitude towards each other, and in their social and economic outlook. He rightly claimed at Nuremberg, that in four years his movement has made a new Germany. It is not the Germany of the first decade that followed the war, broken, dejected, and bowed down with a sense of apprehension and importance. 
it is now full of hope and confidence, and of a renewed sense of determination to lead its own life without interference from any influence outside its own frontiers. There is for the first time since the war a general sense of security. The people are more cheerful. There is a greater sense of general gaiety of spirit throughout the land. It is a happier Germany. I saw it everywhere and Englishmen I met during my trip and who knew Germany well were very impressed with the change. One man has accomplished this miracle. He is a born leader of men. A magnetic, dynamic personality with a single-minded purpose, a resolute will and a dauntless heart. He is not merely in name, but in fact the national leader. He has made them safe against potential enemies by whom they were surrounded. He is also securing them against that constant dread of starvation, which is one of the poignant memories of the last years of the war, and the first years of the peace. Over 700,000 died of sheer hunger in those dark years. You can still see the effect in the physique of those who were born into that bleak world. The fact that Hitler has rescued his country from the fear of a repetition of that period of despair, penury and humiliation has given him unchallenged authority in modern Germany. As to his popularity, especially among the youth of Germany, there can be no manner of doubt. The old trust him, the young idolize him. It is not the admiration accorded to a popular leader. It is the worship of a national hero who has saved his country from utter despondency and degradation, those who imagine that Germany has swung back to its old imperialist temper cannot have any understanding of the character of the change. The idea of a Germany intimidating Europe, with a threat that its irresistible army might march across frontiers forms no part of the new vision. Unfortunately the naive anti-Semitic and socialist fallacies Hitler understandably absorbed at the time obviously played a leading role once again taking the world to war. About 20 years later as World War II was nearing, in a June 24, 1939 article titled Children with Their Hands Chopped Off Joseph Goebbels summarizes much of the understandable German attitude about the treachery of British propaganda, and how they felt deceived at the end of the war. The war caught Germany entirely by surprise, proof that we had not wanted it. Then England got moving. English propaganda turned the whole world against us. One had not thought them capable of it. The experts found its planning and execution brilliant. English propaganda was limited to a few powerful slogans. With devilish depravity, they were spread systematically throughout the entire world and pounded into the brains of millions of people. At the end, they were helpless victims of mass hypnosis. There were really only a few slogans that the English spread throughout the world. They spoke of children's hands chopped off, eyes poked out, women raped, and old people tortured. Long years of anti-German propaganda campaign persuaded the whole world that Germany was a nation of barbarians, uncivilized and inhumane, and that it was the moral and cultural obligation of the rest of the earth to destroy Germany and to break its power. Only then could the world know peace and friendship. That made it easy for the rest of the world to join England in fighting Germany. We Germans had no idea how to respond. We watched the English campaign with honest stupidity. The good German citizen shook his head and wondered how anyone could lie like that. We suffered the consequences at the end of the war. During the last months of the war, England attempted to hammer into the minds of the German population the idea that it was fighting our government, not us. The English did not want to hurt the German people, their war propaganda said. The Kaiser had to go. Then the European nations could end the war. American President Wilson proclaimed his well-known 14 points. In brief, they announced that the Allies did not want to force peace on the Germans, that none of the warring countries should have to pay reparations, or be otherwise harmed, or lose national honor or territory. The Allies' only demand was to replace the Kaiser with a republic, after which peace with honor would follow for everyone. These stupid lies were brewed by the English. Wilson was simply the Foreign Office's loudspeaker. And good old Germany believe what England got the Americans to say. We fell into the trap. 
we did everything that England wanted, and had to pay the bill in the end. But of course, we all know that just like Hitler, Goebbels is a non-homo sapiens maniacal creature, and anyone who treats them as a fellow homo sapiens acting based on the ideas they absorbed at the time is obviously another evil anti-Semite. The Evil Huns Germans The Inevitable Emergence of Wartime Atrocity Myths We began the book by highlighting what is perhaps the best modern example of how totally clueless and tribalistic the slightly smarter apes are, the self-destruction of Europe via World War I 1914-1918 for reasons not one out of 100,000 people today knows. Freedom and the emerging worldwide division of labor and knowledge kept creating all this technology and amazing complexity. But the apes at the time had little clue how the market process works and much less how it had evolved largely independent of human reason, and sadly understandably they just used the technology to better organize the tribal slaughter. As they have been doing for generations, Mythical concepts like evil quickly segregated the apes into their respective tribes. The apes in the US, Canada, England believed myths and propaganda that portrayed the Germans as the evil Huns, apes so barbaric and somehow possessed by some militaristic spirit that out of sheer malice they would sinisterly bayonet and chop off the hands of Belgian babies and crucify Canadian soldiers. Below are some World War I anti-German propaganda posters. This was such a big deal that U.S. lawyer Clarence Darrow, who would eventually become known for defending John T. Scopes in the famous Scopes Monkey trial about teaching evolution in schools, went to France in 1915 offering $1,000, $30,000 in today's money, to anyone who could bring him one of the Belgian children who supposedly had their arms amputated by the evil Germans. Obviously he found no such cases, and even if he had, it still would have been a gigantic error myth to label the Germans in such a manner that could continue to slaughter. The fact that those creating the propaganda felt it would help, and that the masses tolerated it and were inspired roused by it, is just reflective of how the apes thought at the time. Just a couple hundred years earlier in 1693, Americans hung 19 people for witchcraft in the famed Salem Witch Trials. It just takes a while for the apes to properly see themselves as they really are. Although today's enlightened masses and intellectuals can find the World War I mentality backward, we remain lost in mythology when it comes to seeing all the human apes involved in World War II as equals because we all know that the World War II Germans and Hitler were the evil Nazis which is as mythical a bullshit as were the World War I myths. It is vitally important to keep in mind that labeling fellow Homo sapiens as some mythical monstrosity in war happens all the time in conflicts large enough simply due to pure probability and the still overwhelming religious mystical non-evolutionary mindset of most people. And that the formation of such myths, even if at times purposely designed by newspapermen or politicians, is something that should still be seen as an understandable and nearly inevitable myth formation and not a conspiracy. Consider the following. Among the thousands of violent encounters in a conflict as large as a war between nations, statistically you are bound to have many violent encounters from which eventually one or a few will lead to the formation of such myths. For example, a bomb will eventually damage a non-military target and kill a civilian. In retaliation a civilian could understandably snipe at an occupying troop which can then lead to a heightened state of fear alertness and a soldier mistakenly shooting a teenager which will lead a mother or old lady to understandably scream about how evil and cold-blooded the occupiers are. Even just a regular soldier, being the killer slightly smarter apes that we are anyway, regardless of nationality, may just enjoy sniping or killing a civilian. This still would not make the soldier, much less his entire nation, some bestial Huns or similar mythical non-evolutionary creation. Then we have the media quickly spreading the atrocity, and then of course the politicians conveniently picking up the story to gain sympathy for their heroic war against the evildoers monsters. Given the increasing tribalism nationalism, the arms manufacturers, already likely to employ people who have a more naive good versus evil mindset that justifies military spending and also profits from war, will have an easier time getting government money which also means more money for the campaigns of more simple-minded tribalistic good versus evil politicians.
who spread more naive tribalism through the media in an intensifying cycle of tribalism which attracts more money and wealth with which to spread more tribalism. Once the conflicts start the need for unity becomes even stronger and those opposed to it are easily branded as traitors, especially when these courageous people expose the errors or criminality of leaders pushing for war. Clear and level-headed thinkers who know that the enemy are just fellow human beings whose actions are oftentimes very reasonable given how they see things and far from some evil monsters are bound to be in the minority, and eventually branded as traitors, pro-Kaiser Hitler Putin, insert evil bad guy here. Once these voices are silenced then the apes just intensify the slaughter until one side claims victory to the war. In the US the Woodrow Wilson administration passed the Espionage and Sedition Acts which criminalized dissent. Today everyone knows that World War I was a total tribalistic slaughter, that the Germans had no desire to conquer anything and much less be some bestial Huns. Yet the necessary freedom of speech needed to discover and spread the right ideas, and overcome the various fallacies was destroyed. In any conflict, whether it is a family feud or a tribal slaughter, the apes have been naturally selected to attempt to persuade others to their cause group. And this obviously manifests itself in modernity via the use of the media and propaganda to rally the public in support of the great cause war. All action is based on knowledge, knowledge is expressed and described via language, and thus it is with language that we can see the formation of deep hatreds that can ultimately lead to wars. When World War I broke out, to most Americans the conflict was just a bigger version of one of the usual European scuffles which Americans wanted no part in and seemed so distant. If Germany had been some monstrous militaristic evil empire out to conquer the world the US would have joined the Allies immediately, but obviously it wasn't, regardless of the diplomatic blunders committed by a few of its bureaucrats. In 1908, a survey of how Americans viewed immigrant groups had ranked the Germans as the most admirable. The British won the media war. On August 5, 1914, a day after the British declared war on Germany, the British cut most undersea transatlantic communication cables linking Germany with the rest of the world. Historian Thomas Fleming writes, The New York Times reported the cutting of the main cables on August 6, 1914. The reporter dutifully noted that from now on, all word of happenings in Germany must pass through hostile countries, Russia on the east, France on the west, and England on the north. The Consul General of Germany's chief ally, Austria-Hungary, in one of the greatest understatements of the 20th century, told the Times, the cutting of that cable may do us great injury. If only one side of the case is given, prejudice will be created against us here. On August 2, 1916, a group of American correspondents in Berlin signed a protest complaining that their dispatches were constantly suppressed, mutilated or delayed by the London censor. Americans were not getting the vital half of the most important events of the war. Thanks to British propaganda, by the time the US entered the war, to many Americans Germany was no longer the land of so many of its own immigrants or the land of Mozart, Bach, and Beethoven, it was the land of the evil Huns. As Professor Gordon mentions, at all costs, Germany and the Allies were not to be viewed as mere rivals in quest for mastery of Europe. Quite the contrary, the British propagandists claimed that German policy followed a long tradition of savage militarism unparalleled elsewhere. They attempted again and again to portray the Germans as being beyond the pale of civilized humanity. But how could the Germans best be pictured as bestial Huns? Atrocities real or imagined proved the best means of creating the desired image. The British propagandists even stooped so low as to manufacture evidence in pursuit of their goal. Thus it was widely alleged that German troops had mutilated babies during their occupation of Belgium, these stories lack any basis in fact, and the British government admitted that it could not supply adequate documentation for them. Fortunately for the British, German propaganda proved unequal to the task. German pamphlets tended to be stiffly legalistic, and they proved no match for British appeals to passion. The April 17, 1917 edition of The Times, a British newspaper owned by Lord Northcliffe, ran a bogus story about Germans using human fat to make oils and soap, 
the same lies would resurface after World War II when Nazi Germany was wrongly accused of making soap out of Jews. On March 22, 1916, the British newspaper The Daily Telegraph published an article falsely claiming that the Germans had murdered 700,000 Serbs in gas chambers. An angry German wrote an open letter to the hated propagandist Lord Northcliffe, German propaganda was in spirit the propaganda of scholars, privy councillors and professors. How could these honest and unworldly men cope with devils of journalism, experts in mass poisoning like yourself? German propaganda, what there was of it, was addressed to the reason, to the intelligence, the conscience. How could such dry stuff as facts cope with the gaudy yarns, the hate hypnotism, the crude sensations you dished up? The German steadfastly refused to descend to your level. The bottom line is that we must always keep our eye on how various myths, not conspiracies, evolve, and how this is just part of all slightly smarter apes. A few quotes about war by the great Ludwig von Mises, society has arisen out of the works of peace, the essence of society is peacemaking. Peace and not war is the father of all things. Only economic action has created the wealth around us, labor, not the profession of arms, brings happiness. Peace builds, war destroys. Only one thing can conquer war, that liberal attitude of mind which can see nothing in war but destruction and annihilation, and which can never wish to bring about a war, because it regards war as injurious even to the victors. Modern war is not a war of royal armies. It is a war of the peoples, a total war. It is a war of states which do not leave to their subjects any private sphere, they consider the whole population a part of the armed forces. Whoever does not fight must work for the support and equipment of the army. Army and people are one and the same. The citizens passionately participate in the war. For it is their state, their god, who fights. Whoever wishes peace among peoples must fight statism. Economic ignorance as the root of antisemitism, and its disastrous repercussions like Zionism, World War II, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and coming final world war. Hayek, to men, the market economy is largely incomprehensible, and its results seem to them irrational and immoral. They often see in it merely an arbitrary structure maintained by some sinister power. Next we deal with one group of people where once again economic ignorance leads to their being mistaken as some sinister power with disastrous worldwide consequences. The Jews. Without an understanding of how natural selection has evolved our nature, and the Mises Hayek friend's explanation of the socio-economic order and its co-evolution with human nature and culture, generally speaking mankind is still stuck trying to make sense of our numerous socio-economic problems using the antiquated quasi-religious mythical concept of evil, Jews of course have their own recent quasi-religious concept of antisemitism, and or for the less religiously inclined experts. We have all sorts of psycho-babble nonsense leading to application of the madman label to our numerous economically clueless dictators bureaucrats with Hitler of course being the quintessential evil madman which is nonsense and reflective of just how immersed in mysticism even the civilized western world and its scholars remains. Hitler was a fellow homo sapiens who absorbed many erroneous ideas, we have to focus on the ideas instead of the simple-minded evil madman epithets. We have to look at the history of our conflicts and calamities in an evolutionary manner that puts the blame, not on any group or individual, but on understandable complex evolutionary factors and economic ignorance for which nobody is really to blame. The slightly smarter apes will never achieve peace and avoid what will surely be the final world war when their ideological toolbox is still based on such religious mythical good versus evil concepts which ultimately are about tribalistic blame and and finger pointing instead of careful and sympathetic blame free analysis which is what evolution provides. Religions are essentially complex culturally evolved software that help sustain the order of various groups of fellow homo sapiens. Whether one homo sapiens grows up to identify as a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim, or a Russian or an American, it all comes down to having parents and other surrounding homo sapiens inadvertently program you with such an identity. 
these identities are evolved, and not designed. It is as erroneous to say that Jews invented Judaism, as it is to say that Germans invented the German language. It is also an error to say that the Catholic Church in the 1400s, was a conspiracy of popes and clergy to control the masses. Sadly naive thinkers who have no familiarity with the evolution of culture understandably see conspiracy everywhere, which is obviously prevalent among so-called anti-Semites who naively confuse inadvertent Jewish influence emerging from complex evolutionary factors with sinister conspiracies. Let us very briefly look at the evolution of our Abrahamic religions. These softwares and their respective identities, beginning with Judaism, then Christianity, and lastly Islam, and their co-evolution has obviously played a leading role in the emergence of modern civilization, as well as our recent conflicts like World War II and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict which are both outgrowths of Jew-Gentile misunderstandings. We have to cut a few corners and fast forward from about 100,000 years ago where there were thousands of little ethnocentric tribes to about 2,000 years ago when some of these pockets were being integrated absorbed into growing empires. So we got Jews, one of these many ethnocentric groups' identities, then a Jew by the name of Jesus says he is the Son of God and a sort of cultural mutation of Judaism in the form of Christianity emerges. Christianity lost the ethnocentrism that Judaism contains, generally speaking your mother has to be Jewish, which encouraged members to proselytize and rapidly grow in numbers, spreading the great viral simple Ten Commandments, winning converts who are not supposed to kill each other thus trade relatively peacefully, inadvertently helping spread the market process and division of labor information. If we look at Christianity, some of its rules which differed from what was more mainstream at the time and inadvertently led to its growth were things like the prohibition of infanticide, condemnation of divorce, incest, marital infidelity and polygamy. In the Greco-Roman world where Christianity emerged, infanticide, especially of girls, was a common and accepted practice leading to populations of more males than females. For example, there were 131 males per 100 females in the city of Rome, and 140 males per 100 females in Italy, Asia Minor, and North Africa. The prohibition of infanticide would help Christian populations grow faster. These values rules coupled with the relatively higher status afforded to women made this new religious movement much more appealing to women, who would oftentimes convert their husbands thus helping the religion, and its values, spread. Did early Christian theologians know that such values would play a significant role in the growth of Christianity and its success? Did they plan this? I doubt it. Again, these things are indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design. Remaining an inevitably smaller ethnocentric ideology led to the history of ill-treatment friction expulsions Jews have experienced at the hands of the larger Christianity Islam. Unfortunate, but what can we do, we are slightly smarter apes after all. The best we can hope for is to become civilized slightly smarter apes, which we do by understanding what leads to civilization, private property, intellectual freedom and the selection of superior information truth and order that emerges from it. At around 610 AD, a great Arab merchant businessman, Muhammad, whose wife Khadija was Mecca's most prominent venture capitalist who invested in large trade caravans, was visited by the angel Gabriel, the same Gabriel mentioned in the Old Testament's book of Daniel, and given the word of God which became Islam's holy book, the Quran. The Quran treats Christianity's main prophet, Jesus, as well as Judaism's Moses as God's earlier prophets, but with Muhammad being the last prophet and having compiled the Quran directly from divinity, this makes it, according to Muslims, the correct superior interpretation of God's word. Islam saw Christians and Jews as people of the book, Al-Alkitab, or people who had been guided by earlier true prophets and worshipped the one true God according to Islam. This gave Christians and Jews and later other non-believers special albeit inferior standing in the Islamic world, they became demi or protected peoples. The economic policies of early Islam played an important role in its fast growth. According to tax historian Charles Adams, 
One of the reasons Islam spread so fast during its infancy was due to the relief of oppressive Roman taxation that converts would enjoy. Adam writes, in less than 120 years, with an offer of tax immunity, Islam spread very quickly, expanding into India in the east and coming to a halt at the Atlantic Ocean in the west. The main loser was Christianity, which was tied to the oppressive Roman tax system. No religion, before or since, has spread so far, so fast. Unfortunately, yet understandably given the ideological state of mankind at the time, the Quran has verses which are highly critical of Jews, to put it kindly. For example, thou wilt surely find the most hostile of men to the believers are the Jews and the idolaters, so it is very easy for Jews to point to such passages to justify their nearly intuitive belief that Islam is anti-Semitic. However, there is truth to that statement as well. It is understandable how Jews who don't believe that Muhammad was some legitimate prophet might offend Muslims. Consider the following. On October 16, 2010 Rabbi Ovodia Yosef, founder and spiritual leader of the largest religious political party in Israel Shas which won 11 of 120 Keset seats in the 2009 elections, and is also a former Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel which can be seen as the sort of Pope of the Sephardic Jews, said in a sermon that, Goyim non-Jews, were born only to serve us. Without that, they have no place in the world, only to serve the people of Israel, why are Gentiles needed? They will work, they will plow, they will reap. We will sit like an effendi and eat. That is why Gentiles were created, his funeral was attended by over 800,000 adoring slightly smarter apes who brainwashed themselves with a Jewish identity in Jerusalem, if this slightly smarter ape can advertise such views a decade into the 21st century just imagine what other rabbis in the even more mystical past would say about non-Jews and the understandable bad blood between them, and surrounding Muslims Christians. Little else needs to be said about the tribal ape identity in fighting between the various groups of slightly smarter apes. Since mankind, had little understanding of what caused disease and other natural phenomena it is also understandable how Jews would end up being blamed for things like the Black Plague and so on. Inadvertent over-representation in banking, finance, capitalism the classic and perhaps most important example of the co-evolution of the market process and culture can be seen with the emergence of modern banking finance. For example, Islam has strong prohibitions against charging interest usury which have short-circuited or greatly hampered the market process evolution in the Islamic world. The following passages from the Quran are perhaps the most relevant, that they took usury, though they were forbidden, and that they devoured men's substance wrongfully, we have prepared for those among them who reject faith a grievous punishment. 4 to 161 Those who devour usury will not stand except as stands one whom the evil one by his touch has driven to madness. That is because they say, trade is like usury, but Allah has permitted trade and forbidden usury. 2 to 275 Allah will deprive usury of all blessing, but will give increase for deeds of charity, for he does not love ungrateful and wicked creatures. 2 to 276 Christianity's New Testament seems more usury friendly via passages like Luke 19:23 why then didst thou not put money in a bank so that I on my return might have gotten it with interest but Luke 6:35 but love your enemies do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back could be used to support an anti-usury position which is what the church enforced for over a thousand years before eventually abandoning the strong anti-usury stand. When it comes to Judaism and the Old Testament, God's message is one that shuns charging interest between Israelites Jews but allows it to be charged to non-Israelites. The most influential verses are Deuteronomy 23:20. you may charge a foreigner interest, but not a brother Israelite. And Exodus 22:25. if you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not be like a moneylender, charge him no interest. This is a good example of mankind's tribal ethnocentrism shunning a practice which is believed to be bad within the group, but allowing its use with those outside the group. 
The 14th century French Jew Levi Ben Gershom felt it was good to burden the Gentile with interest because one should not benefit an idolater and cause him as much damage as possible without deviating from righteousness. A History of the Jews, p. 174, the few religious scriptures we have just read have had profound ramifications. In a Christian world that would excommunicate usurers moneylenders, Jews being immune to excommunication and facing no competition in finance banking from Christians since they were forbidden from entering the trade found an advantage as moneylenders bankers, although an advantage that also came with risky court battles as Christian creditors would sometimes try to play the charging interest is against God card when it came to paying their debts. The prevalence of Jews as moneylenders even shows itself in the Magna Carta, where there is a small section establishing some rules when dealing with Jewish moneylenders. Historian Paul Johnson writes, the Jews reacted by engaging in the one business where Christian laws actually discriminated in their favor, and so became identified with the hated trade of moneylending. Rabbi Joseph Colon, who knew both France and Italy in the second half of the 15th century, wrote that the Jews of both countries hardly engaged in any other profession Johnson mentions other ways in which Jews helped push the world in a more capitalist direction. One was financial innovation via their influence in the development of stock markets. Another was their stress on the importance of advertising. Better advertising speeds up competition and its spread of superior ideas products so it is a great boost to civilization order. Johnson also mentions how Jews were exceptionally adept at gathering and making use of commercial intelligence. For centuries Jews had evolved into a sort of extended family that covered much of the Western world, they ran sensitive and speedy information systems which enabled them to respond rapidly to political and military events and to the changing demands of regional, national and world markets. The September 27, 1712 issue of England's, Spectator described the Jews' influence as follows, they are so disseminated through all the trading parts of the world, that they are become the instruments by which the most distant nations converse with one another and by which mankind are knit together in a general correspondence. They are like the pegs and nails in a great building, which though they are but little valued in themselves, are absolutely necessary to keep the whole frame together. It was bad enough that they rejected the divinity of Christianity and Islam and practiced usury, but Jews were also fierce competitors who would upset Christian businessmen by disrupting their anti-competitive customs, all for the great benefit of the consumer and European social order and culture of course. Historian economist Werner Sombart mentions how according to the values at the time to take away your neighbor's customers was contemptible, unchristian, and immoral. For example, in 1745 to lose France, Christian traders complained that everybody runs to the Jewish traders. In Poland, 1619, difficulties and stumbling blocks are put in the way of merchants and craftsmen by the competition of Jews. In England, 17th century English merchant and one time governor of the East India Company Josiah Child mentioned, the Jews are a subtil people depriving the English merchant of that profit he would otherwise gain. 108, in Prussia, 1750 the merchants of our town, complain? That Jewish traders who sell the same goods do them a great harm, because they sell at a lower price. Mises writes, the Nazis have an ally in every town or village where there is a man eager to get rid of a Jewish competitor. The secret weapon of Hitler is the anti-Jewish inclinations of many millions of shopkeepers and grocers, of doctors and lawyers, professors and writers. Hitler, who like most popular leaders was simply the embodiment of the economic fallacies myths prejudices of the times, was of course a national socialist, who had little understanding of the vital role that economic freedom plays in society and erroneously saw things like the emerging stock markets and finance industry especially given the relative over-representation of Jews, as some gimmick scam plotted by them to the detriment of non-Jews. His fallacy's ignorance can easily be seen in numerous excerpts like this one from a speech given in Munich on July 28, 1922, 
the vast process of the industrialization of the peoples meant the confluence of great masses of workmen in the towns, parallel with this was a gradual mummification of the whole of the nation's labor strength. Share capital was in the ascendant, and thus bit by bit the stock exchange came to control the whole national economy. The directors of these institutions were, and are without exception, Jews. I say without exception, for the few non-Jews who had a share in them are in the last resort nothing but screens, shop window Christians, whom one needs in order, for the sake of the masses, to keep up the appearance that these institutions were after all founded as a natural outcome of the needs and the economic life of all peoples alike, and were not, as was the fact, institutions which correspond only with the essential characteristics of the Jewish people and are the outcome of those characteristics. Hitler, we should quickly add that Churchill, being a slightly smarter ape like Hitler and absorbing similar popular ideas of the times was just as, if not more, racist than Hitler and for draconian forceful sterilizations, I propose that 100,000 degenerate Britons should be forcibly sterilized and others put in labor camps to halt the decline of the British race. I am strongly in favor of using poisoned gas against uncivilized tribes, Mahatma Gandhi, ought to be lain bound hand and foot at the gates of Delhi, and then trampled on by an enormous elephant with the new viceroy seated on its back. Gandhiism and everything it stands for will have to be grappled with and crushed. I hate Indians. They are beastly people with a beastly religion. I do not admit that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America, or the black people of Australia, by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, has come in and taken its place. The excellent biography of Hayek, Hayek, a life, 1899-1950 by Caldwell and Hans Jörg, brilliantly summarizes the last 1,000 years of Jewish history in near Austria, though there always were periods of sheer terror for Jews who lived in Austrian territories, throughout the second millennium it was still regarded, at least in relation to many other places in Europe, as a relatively attractive region to settle. Often this was the result of self-interest on the part of their hosts. Rulers who sought social improvements recognized the economic value of having Jews in their communities, the Catholic Church banned usury, but Jews were permitted to engage in money and credit transactions that brought economic benefits to society while sidestepping the prohibition. This is not to say, of course, that the old types of religious-based antisemitism were extinguished. Particularly during times of economic upheaval or disasters like the Black Death, Jews were the first to be blamed, Shylock moneylenders were taking advantage of good Christians in bad times, the plague was caused by Jews poisoning wells in order to wipe out Christianity, the list of potential offenses and resulting retaliatory abominations goes on and on. The severity of the imposed restrictions depended largely on who sat on the Habsburg throne. It was not until the latter half of the 19th century that conditions looked like they might change more permanently for the better. Indeed, Franz Joseph's reign was viewed by many of the Jews of Austria as a kind of golden age. Reforms that had been passed earlier in the century were solidified and codified in 1867. By then Jews could own land and live where they pleased, they could enter professions, build factories, found banks, and even employ Christians as servants. Some were ennobled. Assimilation, for purposes of either marriage or career advancement, was commonplace. Acculturation proceeded apace. There were, though, some clouds on the horizon. The newer and often more efficient factories of Jewish industrialists competed with older Gentile establishments. Large retail distributors, the original department stores, many of them Jewish-owned, put pressure on small individual shopkeepers. Caldwell, evolution of the inadvertent overrepresentation in socialism and communism let us also briefly discuss some of the environmental evolutionary factors pressures which unfortunately attracted so many Jews to socialism communism with disastrous repercussions. How prevalent were Jews in spreading implementing socialist communist ideology? First of all there was Karl Marx, Socialism Communism's main intellectual who gave the movement enough of a naive intellectual aura to mislead hundreds of future would-be dictators intellectuals. 
Leon Trotsky born Lev Davidovich Bronstein, founder of the Red Army, second only to Lenin and most likely to succeed him as leader of the Russian Communists was also an ethnic Jew. Slurskin writes, at the first All-Russian Congress of Soviets in June 1917, at least 31% of Bolshevik delegates and 37% of Unified Social Democrats, were Jews. At the Bolshevik Central Committee meeting of October 23, 1917, which voted to launch an armed insurrection, five out of the twelve members present were Jews. Three out of seven Politburo members charged with leading the October uprising were Jews Trotsky, Sinoviev, and Grigory Sokonikov. According to Lenin, it was thanks to Jews that his Bolsheviks were able to take over the state apparatus in Russia. Lenin mentions, the fact that there were many Jewish intelligentsia members in the Russian cities was of great importance to the revolution. They put an end to the general sabotage that we were confronted with after the October Revolution. The Jewish elements were mobilized. And thus saved the revolution at a difficult time. It was only thanks to this pool of a rational and literate labor force that we succeeded in taking over the state apparatus Winston Churchill wisely recognized the tremendous role Jews have played in spreading civilization enabling ideas, as in the foundation of Christian Western morals the simplicity viralness competitiveness of the Ten Commandments, as well as disastrous ones as in the case of their large involvement in socialism communism. He writes, some people like Jews and some do not, but no thoughtful man can doubt the fact that they are beyond all question the most formidable and the most remarkable race which has ever appeared in the world, the conflict between good and evil which proceeds unceasingly in the breast of man nowhere reaches such an intensity as in the Jewish race. The dual nature of mankind is nowhere more strongly or more terribly exemplified. We owe to the Jews in the Christian revelation a system of ethics which, even if it were entirely separated from the supernatural, would be incomparably the most precious possession of mankind, worth in fact the fruits of all other wisdom and learning put together. On that system, and by that faith there has been built out of the wreck of the Roman Empire the whole of our existing civilization. And it may well be that this same astounding race may at the present time be in the actual process of producing another system of morals and philosophy, as malevolent as Christianity was benevolent, which, if not arrested, would shatter irretrievably all that Christianity has rendered possible. It would almost seem as if the Gospel of Christ and the Gospel of Antichrist were destined to originate among the same people, and that this mystic and mysterious race had been chosen for the supreme manifestations, both of the divine and the diabolical. There is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism, and in the actual bringing about of the Russian Revolution, by these international and for the most part atheistical Jews, it is certainly a very great one, it probably outweighs all others. With the notable exception of Lenin, the majority of the leading figures are Jews. Moreover, the principal inspiration and driving power comes from the Jewish leaders. Thus Chicherin, a pure Russian, is eclipsed by his nominal subordinate Litvinov, and the influence of Russians like Bakarin or Lunacharsky cannot be compared with the power of Trotsky, or of Zinoviev, the dictator of the Red Citadel, Petrograd, or of Krasin or Radek all Jews. In the Soviet institutions the predominance of Jews is even more astonishing. And the prominent, if not indeed the principal, part in the system of terrorism applied by the extraordinary commissions for combating counter-revolution has been taken by Jews. Churchill's essay Zionism vs. Bolshevism, 1920, Churchill's last sentence above refers to the most unfortunate over-representation of Jews within the communist nightmare, their over-representation in the top echelons of the Soviet Union's famed tyrannical secret police, the Sheka, later becoming the OPU, then NKVD. Slurskin writes that, in 1923, at the time of the creation of the OPU the Sheka's successor, Jews made up 15.5% of all leading officials and 50% of the top brass, four out of eight members of the Collegium's secretariat. Socially alien Jews were well represented among Sheker Ogpu prisoners, too, but Leonard Shapiro is probably justified in generalizing, especially about the territory of the former Pale, that anyone who had the misfortune to fall into the hands of the Sheker stood a very good chance of finding himself confronted with and possibly shot by a Jewish investigator. 
the Jewish century, p. 177, indeed, the Soviet secret police dash the regime's sacred center, known after 1934 as the NKVD dash was one of the most Jewish of all Soviet institutions. In January 1937, on the eve of the Great Terror, the 111 top NKVD officials included 42 Jews, 35 Russians, 8 Latvians, and 26 others. Out of 20 NKVD directorates, 12 60%, including state security, police, labor camps, and resettlement, were headed by officers who identified themselves as ethnic Jews. The most exclusive and sensitive of all NKVD agencies, the main directorate for state security, consisted of ten departments, seven of them, were run by immigrants from the former Pale of Settlement. Foreign service was an almost exclusively Jewish specialty, as was spying for the Soviet Union in Western Europe and especially in the United States. The Gulag, or main labor camp administration, was headed by ethnic Jews from 1930, when it was formed, until late November 1938, when the Great Terror was almost over. For a people who were sometimes seen as foreigners, socialism's international brotherhood, workers of the world, unite, was to be a popular rallying cry, would seem to have an additional appeal and be a perfect fit for a people who were already a sort of international family. Socialism's atheism would also do away with a major source of Jewish troubles now that everyone was supposed to be atheist irreligious in the new scientific and rational socialist world. The central and viral economic fallacy of socialism, that having smart people experts plan the social order would be better than letting selfish and greedy businessmen do so, needed the smarter and better educated to be the planners, and this is exactly what Jews were compared to the rest, at least in Russia, thus naturally rising to the top of the movement. Historian William Johnston writes that Jews had enjoyed many centuries of literacy before the rest of Europe started to become literate in the 18th century. Slurskin gives more detail, the Jews were, consistently and by a substantial margin, the most literate group in the Soviet Union 85%, as compared to 58% for Russians, in 1926, and 94.3%, as compared to 83.4% for Russians, in 1939, by 1939, 26.5% of all Jews had had a high school education as compared to 7.8% of the population for the Soviet Union as a whole and 8.1% of Russians in the Russian Federation. In Leningrad, the proportion of high school graduates among Jews was 40.2% as compared to 28.6% for the city as a whole. The number of Jewish students in the two upper grades of Soviet high schools was more than 3.5 times their share in the general population. Heim Weizmann recalls in his autobiography the simple fact that, the non-Jewish population had not the same overwhelming thirst for knowledge as the Jews, who were always knocking at the doors of the schools. This large participation association of ethnic Jews with socialism would have disastrous consequences for the majority of Jews who did not want to be a part of socialism or much less abandon their faith and traditions. As Lenin and Trotsky were launching post-World War I Russia into a civil war 1918-22 between the Communist Red Army and the White Russian Army which supported the Russian monarchy and old order institutions, Jews would pay a heavy price. Johnson writes that, the consequences for the Jews both immediate and long-term, both locally and worldwide, were appalling. The White Russian armies, seeking to destroy the Soviet regime, treated all Jews as enemies. In the Ukraine, the civil war developed into the most extensive pogrom in Jewish history. There were more than 1,000 separate incidents involving the killing of Jews. Over 700 communities in the Ukraine were involved and several hundred more in Russia. Between 60,000 and 70,000 Jews were murdered. In other parts of Eastern Europe, a similar identification of Jews with Bolshevism led directly to murderous attacks on harmless Jewish communities. They were particularly bloody in Poland after the failure of the Bolshevik invasion and in Hungary after the fall of the Bela Khan regime. They occurred intermittently in Romania throughout the 1920s. In all three countries the local communist parties had been largely created and run by non-Jewish Jews, 
and in each case it was the unpolitical, traditional, observant Jews of the ghettos and villages who paid the penalty. Again, it needs to be stressed, as Johnson just mentioned, in all three countries the local communist parties, had been largely created and run by non-Jewish Jews. Nazi, National Socialist, identity culminating in men like Hitler understandably emerged in Germany as a reaction to current events. For example, on November 7, 1918, just three days before the end of World War I, Kurt Eisner, a Jew, led a peaceful revolution which led to the brief existence of a socialist state in Bavaria, Munich being the capital. Eisner distanced himself from the Russian communists and wanted his government to somehow respect private property, but unfortunately after his assassination and a few changes in government, by April 12, 1919, a more hardcore communist party headed by Eugen Levin, another Jew, with direct ties to Lenin took over power and immediately began expropriating property, factories and so on. At the suggestion of Lenin, on April 30th, Levine had eight men who were prominent members of society shot to help show he meant business. Levine's short-lived communist government was ended by the Frey Corps, which were militias mostly made up of army volunteers who for a myriad of reasons were opposed to a communist takeover of their country, especially one that was orchestrated from Russia, and had such a high over-representation of Jews in their leadership. Earlier in Berlin too, Marxist Jews Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht had led another short-lived communist government. So again, it is understandable how the emerging Nazi identity would be both anti-communist with strong anti-Semitic tendencies as well and how so many like Hitler, Churchill and many Europeans came to associate equate Jews with communism. We are now in a position to fully appreciate Herzl's wisdom when he summarizes, we are what the ghetto made us. We have attained preeminence in finance, because medieval conditions drove us to it. The same process is now being repeated. We are again being forced into finance, now it is the stock exchange, by being kept out of other branches of economic activity. Being on the stock exchange, we are consequently exposed afresh to contempt. At the same time we continue to produce an abundance of mediocre intellects who find no outlet, and this endangers our social position as much as does our increasing wealth. Educated Jews without means are now rapidly becoming socialists. Hence we are certain to suffer very severely in the struggle between classes, because we stand in the most exposed position in the camps of both socialists and capitalists. One of the greatest ethnic Jews of all time, economist Murray N. Rothbard, explained the Jewish fervor for communism in the 1930s when he wrote the following, I grew up in a communist culture, the middle-class Jews in New York whom I lived among, whether family, friends or neighbors, were either communists or fellow travelers in the communist orbit. I had two sets of communist party uncles and aunts, on both sides of the family. But more important, the one great moral question in the lives of all these people was, should I actually join the communist party and devote the whole of my life to the cause, or should I remain a fellow traveler and selfishly devote only a fraction of my energy to communism? Rothbard essay Life in the Old Right, we must emphasize that socialist communist ideology, rooted on easy to absorb economic fallacies, was already occurring in the Western world and can be seen as an almost inevitable mistake as mankind tried to make sense of the workings of the social order economy which was quickly growing in bewildering complexity. Jews were inadvertently in a position to be more attracted to socialism and capitalism and be leaders in both. They obviously did not invent or plot socialism communism capitalism like Hitler and many others to this day claim. It could be said that they were naturally selected to be socialist capitalist finance leaders, thus giving the impression that they were its creators plotters. Jewish involvement in such movements was indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design. If the Jews were smart enough to plot the numerous things the non-Jewish world accuses them of, they would have been smart enough to realize that socialism communism was a disaster for Jew and non-Jew alike and have been telling everyone about fellow Jew Ludwig von Mises and have built him a 20 plus feet solid gold statue and placed it in front of the western wall. 
The fact that they have yet to do this is further evidence that Jews in general are as lost in ignorance and mythology as the rest which makes perfect sense since we are all just fellow homo sapiens. Also by being more likely to be atheists and thus freer from traditional religion-influenced morals which goes hand in hand with a Darwinian evolutionary outlook which is more tolerant and permissive of human nature, Jews once again found themselves leaders in the carnal pleasures associated with Hollywood, pornography, LGBT stuff, and the music industry which helps explain why Tel Aviv may be the gay capital of the world. As Marlon Brando put it, Hollywood is run by Jews. It's owned by Jews. Jewish involvement, influence, and potential overrepresentation in such movements industries is yet again, not part of some sinister conspiracy, but indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design, the unintended product of historical development. Evolution of Jew-Nazi hatreds leading to World War II. If the slightly smarter apes are once again going to segregate themselves for slaughter, we must look at the language and ideas that fuel the US versus them hate fist that precedes the slaughters. Let us briefly look at the deteriorating relationship and polarizing vilification between Hitler's government and Jews. Due to errors already discussed Hitler felt like Jews had a negative influence on Germany and, because of this it is understandable that Jews would detest Hitler and do whatever was in their power to help, bring down his government. One should be reminded of the fact that much of Europe, especially with the virulent spread of the atheistic communist ideology and its unfortunate yet very understandable association with Jews, would have its usual dose of discrimination against Jews, as well as sporadic outbursts of violence. And of course there was the older type of religious antisemitism like Jews having killed rejected Jesus, Shakespearean pound of flesh type of nonsense which hardly needs serious analysis, and we can attribute mostly to religious squabbles of the past which were fortunately losing their importance, but were still significant factors. By 1935 the Polish government would stop hiring Jews. According to historian David Irving, Poland's attitude was no more sympathetic. Ambassador Joseph Lipsky had assured Hitler, that if he ever succeeded in solving Europe's Jewish problem, Warsaw would happily erect a statue in honor of his achievement. Soon after Hitler was appointed Chancellor in January 30, 1933, but before he had dictatorial powers or any laws discriminating against Jews were passed, on March 27 American Jews headed by Rabbi Stephen S. Wise and thousands of other Jewish leaders, held mass rallies across the U.S. in over 70 locations like Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Baltimore, with New York's Madison Square Garden overflowing with over 50,000 supporters and its rally being broadcast worldwide ultimately having a whopping 1 million participants. They promoted a boycott of German goods and would try to use their influence on world governments to help bring down Hitler's government. Cyrus Adler, President of the American Jewish Committee was one of the many voices against such a direct confrontation with the German government. His committee's Jewish contacts in Germany were strongly opposed to such rallies. New York Supreme Court Justice Joseph M. Proskauer wisely expressed his concerns against causing more trouble for the Jews in Germany by unintelligent action. The British newspaper The Daily Express had a headline story about the event titled Judea Declares War on Germany. It mentioned that, the Israeli people around the world declare economic and financial war against Germany. 14 million Jews stand together as one man, to declare war against Germany. The Jewish wholesaler will forsake his firm, the banker his stock exchange, the merchant his commerce and the pauper his pitiful shed in order to join together in a holy war against Hitler's people. In retaliation, five days after on April 1st, Germany's Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels organized a one-day boycott of Jewish businesses which would be lifted if anti-Nazi protests were suspended which obviously did not happen. This would be the beginning of a political and propaganda war between organized Jewry, predominantly American Jews, and Hitler's government which would see German Jews lose more and more freedoms, and very important, would help Jews be increasingly seen as a dangerous fifth column to be interned during the war similar to how Japanese Americans were as the US fought Japan. 
A few days later on April 7 Germany would pass the law for the restoration of the professional civil service which would prevent Jews, as well as political opponents, from having many types of government jobs. Here are a few more statements from leading Jews at the time, long, long, long before the war broke out on Sep 1, 1939 or Jews were sent to ghettos or concentration camps. In a radio broadcast which was also printed in the August 7, 1933 edition of the New York Times, over six years before the war started, prominent Jewish lawyer and civic leader Samuel Untermeyer mentioned the following, each of you, Jew and Gentile alike, who has not already enlisted in this sacred war should do so now and here. It is not sufficient that you should buy no goods made in Germany. You must refuse to deal with any merchant or shopkeeper who sells any German-made goods or who patronizes German ships or shipping. We will undermine the Hitler regime and bring the German people to their senses by destroying their export trade on which their very existence depends. On January, 1934, over five years before start of war, Vladimir J. Batinsky, one of the most important and influential Jews of the 20th century wrote, for months now the struggle against Germany is waged by each Jewish community, at each conference, in all our syndicates, and by each Jew all over the world. There is reason to believe that our part in this struggle has general value. We will trigger a spiritual and material war of all the world against Germany's ambitions to become once again a great nation, to recover lost territories and colonies. But our Jewish interests demand the complete destruction of Germany. Collectively and individually, the German nation is a threat to us Jews. This was said at a time when Stalin's communist nightmare had just ended the massive Ukrainian famine, Holomonador, 3. 5. 5 million deaths, and Germany was still arguably one of the most culturally, morally, and technologically advanced countries in the world. This was understandably due to the horrendous economic ignorance affecting so many Jews at the time. One of the greatest ethnic Jews of all time, Murray N. Rothbard, explained the Jewish fervor for communism at the time, 1930s, when he wrote the following, I grew up in a communist culture, the middle-class Jews in New York whom I lived among, whether family, friends or neighbors, were either communists or fellow travelers in the communist orbit. I had two sets of communist party uncles and aunts, on both sides of the family. But more important, the one great moral question in the lives of all these people was, should I actually join the Communist Party and devote the whole of my life to the cause, or should I remain a fellow traveler and selfishly devote only a fraction of my energy to communism? Rothbard essay Life in the Old Right, these sorts of statements frequently blasted on leading newspapers in the USA and England for about six years, and their influence on sympathetic politicians, especially the already fiercely anti-German Roosevelt administration, Roosevelt had been assistant secretary of the US Navy during World War I, would eventually lead to war and painting the most draconian and barbaric Stalinist regime as a force for good. In September, 1935 via the racist and anti-Semitic Nuremberg laws and its disastrous clauses like marriages between Jews and citizens of German or related blood are forbidden, Germany would increase the polarizations, guaranteeing that countless politicians understandably looking to be heroic like Churchill in England and Roosevelt in the USA would do everything to stop his legitimate foreign policy goals of overturning various wrongs from the Treaty of Versailles. It is important to realize that pre-war Nazi Germany, even with its economically ignorant socialist central planning and anti-Semitic Nuremberg laws, was still a paradise of civility and prosperity even for Jews compared to Stalin's Soviet Union. With the exception of Hitler's public harassment of Jews, which to some degree was a reaction to Jury's sort of propaganda, and economic war against his government, which of course was an understandable reaction to Hitler's crass anti-Semitism, and millennia-long history of anti-Semitism, Hitler's Germany was far, far, far from the silly images of goose-tapping soldiers and a population under some evil spell. The Third Reich was overwhelmingly a Christian nation which promoted traditional conservative values of piety, the Church, and that inevitable watchful eye of an ever-present God that motivates people to do good and respect the Ten Commandments, etc. According to historian Richard J. Evans by 1939, 
95% of Germans still called themselves Protestant or Catholic, and so did the majority of the members of the National Socialist Party. Hitler mentioned in a speech on October 27, 1928 that we tolerate no one in our ranks who attacks the ideas of Christianity, in fact our movement is Christian. Hitler and his fellow ideologues did try to influence and control the church to various degrees leading to considerable bad blood between the Nazi government and the various religious structures, but the bottom line is that the general character of average Germans was still heavily influenced by Christianity and the worldly civilized values Germans have always been relative leaders in. A perfect example of the power of the church and the morals of the German public can be seen in the church's opposition to Hitler's euthanasia program that killed the mentally retarded. As knowledge of this program became known the church strongly opposed it and Hitler put an end to it due to such public pressure. As, Stalin's daughter, Svetlana Alilueva, who caused a worldwide sensation when she defected from the Soviet Union in March 1967 said there was no public in the USSR. The atheistic nature of the Soviet Union obviously played a role in making it so much easier to discard human life, and thus be tremendously deadlier. By the time the war had broken out on September 1, 1939, Hitler had been harassing Jews in Germany for about six years in order to get them to leave, but such harassment was incomparable to the death and terror Stalin had already caused in the Soviet Union. For example, due to the forced collectivization of farming and grain requisitions imposed on the western part of the Soviet Union, especially the Ukraine, about six million people starved to death in 1932-3 in a famine referred to as Holodomor which means killing by hunger in Ukrainian. Millions of people are starving in a country that could be a breadbasket for the world said Hitler in a speech on March 2, 1933. In his book Bloodlands, Europe between Hitler and Stalin Timothy Snyder compares the lethality of both regimes prior to war in 1938, Soviet terror, at this point, was not only on a far greater scale, it was incomparably more lethal. Nothing in Hitler's Germany remotely resembled the execution of nearly 400,000 people in 18 months, as under Order 00447 in the Soviet Union. In the years 1937 and 1938, 267 people were sentenced to death in Nazi Germany, as compared to 378,326 death sentences within the Kulok operation alone in the Soviet Union. Again, given the difference in population size, the chances that a Soviet citizen would be executed in the Kulok action were about 700 times greater than the chances that a German citizen would be sentenced to death in Nazi Germany for any offense. From June 30 to July 2, 1932, Hitler carried out a political purge known as the Night of the Long Knives which led to the deaths of at least 85 people within the upper ranks of the German government. Stalin's version of a political purge, at least his biggest one, was the Great Terror Purge which lasted from 1936 to 8 and led to the deaths of 700,000 to 1.2 million people. Bottom Line you were far better off being a Jew in pre-war Hitler's Germany than an average citizen in the Soviet Union, or a black person in the USA. Keep in mind that throughout all this time German citizens are well aware of the orchestrated vilification campaign by organized jury, and Joseph Goebbels would constantly remind them. Again, as J. Batinsky said five years before the start of the war and even before the Nuremberg Laws, Jewish interests demand the complete destruction of Germany. Collectively and individually, the German nation is a threat to us Jews. By October 27, 1941, just 11 days before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the 11th of July 1941, which would officially bring the US into World War II versus Japan and Germany, the maniacal non-homo sapiens portrayal of Hitler had reached the level needed to get the masses and glory-seeking politicians agitating for slaughter. Roosevelt made a nationally broadcasted speech where he mentioned that in the place of the Bible, the words of Mein Kampf will be imposed and enforced as holy writ. In his own words, your government has in its possession another document, made in Germany by Hitler's government. It is a detailed plan, which, for obvious reasons, the Nazis did not wish and do not wish to publicize just yet, 
but which they are ready to impose, a little later, on a dominated world, if Hitler wins. It is a plan to abolish all existing religions, Protestant, Catholic, Mohammedan, Hindu, Buddhist, and Jewish alike. The property of all churches will be seized by the Reich and its puppets. The cross and all other symbols of religion are to be forbidden. The clergy are to be forever silenced under penalty of the concentration camps, where even now so many fearless men are being tortured because they have placed God above Hitler. In the place of the churches of our civilization, there is to be set up an international Nazi church, a church which will be served by orators sent out by the Nazi government. In the place of the Bible, the words of Mein Kampf will be imposed and enforced as holy writ. And in place of the cross of Christ will be put two symbols, the swastika and the naked sword. Replace the Bible and all religions for an international Nazi church. When a whopping 95% of Germans were Catholics or Protestants. It seems hard to believe that the slightly smarter apes could believe such absurdities, but, we are what we are. Needless to say, just like with World War I, the ape hatreds understandably led to the evolution of a German or Nazi identity that was far more maniacal than the World War I Huns. It must be noted that the non-homo sapiens maniacal portrayal of Hitler and Nazi Germany existed long 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 before the Holocaust would take the vilification to whole new levels. Reason and a careful analysis of the fallacies leading to hatreds is no match for the tribalistic group formation the killer Homo sapiens have been doing for millions of years. Thus by October 27, 1941 the apes were already solidly behind mythical good versus evil, us versus them, patriot or traitor. The goal should be to understand and overcome the fallacies that lead to the hatreds which lead to the wars, not to pick a side regarding which group of fellow Homo sapiens one judges to have been more misguided, and then justify the slaughters. Sadly this is what reason clearly tells us, but again, reason is not what runs the world. Evolution of the Zionist identity and resulting Israeli-Palestinian conflict and civilization ending ramifications. Part 1. Let us look at Zionism, the idea that the fellow Homo sapiens who have absorbed a Jewish identity, should live in their own country which eventually became today's Israel. Both antisemitism and Zionism are rooted in the same intellectual error, that the Homo sapiens who have absorbed a Jewish identity are so different from the other Homo sapiens that they must leave the real thousands of towns and synagogues where for hundreds of years, they were an integral part of Western civilization to create a country, Israel, based on religious mythology, among other fallacies, in an area already populated by others who had a different identity, Muslims, Christians, and fellow anti-Zionist Jews, and for numerous understandable reasons were adamantly opposed to the creation of, and potentially living under a, Jewish state. What creates socio-economic harmony is neither the coercive central planning by expert smiths associated with communism, which fooled many bright and well-intentioned people to disaster, nor the need to remove Jews from their surroundings which is what the naive antisemites may prefer, nor the need to create your own ethno-state which is the foundational error myth of Zionism. By the late 1800s, as reason was replacing religious mysticism squabbles, as the idea that all Homo sapiens should have freedom and the same individual rights was spreading, things were quickly improving for all Europeans and especially Jews. As the church and its monarchical rulers were being replaced by nationalist representative governments, the idea of Jewish nationalism understandably emerged. Also as this increase in freedom inadvertently led to superior competitive knowledge discovery which led to Europeans increasing their dominance of the world, so did the potential influence of European Jews. Given their ill-treatment in the form of pogroms and legal restrictions as well as some religious zeal, eventually the idea of having their own country state gained enough traction, a traction which understandably increased as Hitler rose to power. Theodore Herzl, the sort of father of political Zionism, envisioned this country in Palestine which contained many ancestral Jewish sites like Jerusalem. At first Zionism was wisely rejected by most Jews. The rabbinical establishment in Munich, Germany, where Herzl wanted to hold the first Zionist Congress, 
strongly rejected the idea so the meeting was moved to Baal, Switzerland 2931 SD-8-1897. They told him, how can one speak with people who on the one hand are fanatics regarding Jewish nationhood and, on the other hand, complain that the Austrian government required a baptismal certificate from the candidate for the position of secretary of Bukovina. If the Austrian Jews support the efforts of the Zionists, then they should not complain that they are treated by the government like foreigners and are barred from public office. We, however, can say to our fellow countrymen with complete conviction that we comprise a separate community solely with respect to religion. Regarding nationality, we feel totally at one with our fellow Germans and therefore strive towards the realization of the spiritual, and moral goals of our dear fatherland with an enthusiasm equaling theirs. Eighteen hundred years ago, history made its decision regarding Jewish nationhood through the dissolution of the Jewish state, and the destruction of the temple. This makes perfect sense. German, Polish, Russian, Spanish Jews spoke German, Polish, Russian, Spanish, and for centuries their identities had evolved in those locations where their synagogues had been built and they made real tangible contributions to the evolution of Western civilization. Until the last couple of centuries most people had never even seen a map and their identities were tied, not to a nation, but to a local town or village. The cultural concept of a nation as we currently treat it, did not generally arise until maps, better communication, faster transportation, etc. allowed our more local tribal identities to be expanded to now include much larger groups. This of course has led to bigger and bigger tribalistic national and then world wars. Being ignorant of how socio-economic prosperity arises from simple economic freedom, the main Zionist ideologues like Herzl, Jabotinsky, Max Nordau, and Benjamin Netanyahu's dad, Benzian Netanyahu, understandably made the mistake of believing that their own ethnostate, thus Zionism, was the key to prosperity. While praising the perceived greatness of Herzl, Benzian writes a bunch of nonsense regarding what makes a nation great, he, Herzl, knew that not on the basis of physical power, nor on the basis of building houses or buying up tracts of land, would a nation gain what it yearned for. A nation gains what it yearns for only on the basis of an undetectable and unquantifiable transformation in its spiritual life, character and outlook. At the very moment a downtrodden nation wholeheartedly believes in its own power and greatness, at that moment it is assured of acquiring power and greatness in practice. Of course, it is necessary for that belief to be general and overwhelming, and it is necessary for it to be based on the existence of real strengths, although such strength might be concealed within the nation and not easily discernible to all. But a nation which does not believe in its ability to achieve great things, will never achieve them. The most awesome national power is the belief in those abilities, and only this power can pave the road to both liberation and a magnificent future. Herzl knew this secret of human nature. He knew that at the very moment when, to use the prophet Zephaniah's aphorism, the weakling will say, I am strong. At that moment he becomes, strong in practice. If a nation says out of conviction, I am strong and forceful, then it becomes strong and forceful. This is the law of greatness, and this is the law of liberation, there is no other. The above law of greatness and everything else is understandable economically ignorant nonsense. As with socialism, Jewish nationalism via Zionism was just another economically ignorant set of myth which understandably lured more and more fellow homo sapiens who had absorbed a Jewish identity. We already mentioned how freedom and the competition that grows from it was shaping the relatively ethnocentric identities of all peoples and turning us into worldly citizens. During the early days of Zionism, Jews were divided into the Zionists and anti-Zionists, the Simulationists. Heim Weizmann, the leading Zionist figure after Herzl's death in 1904, lamented how assimilated Jews were dead against Zionism, and correctly identified Zionism as a primitive tribalism, for assimilated Jews, they looked upon it, as a primitive tribalism. They felt themselves, called upon to rescue Judaism from Zionism, these people are dead against Zionism, 
Zionism is not meant for those people who have cut themselves adrift from Jewry. Of course. That rapidly increasing number of very well-educated cosmopolitan assimilated Jews spread all over Europe USA just wanted to be fellow human beings or equal world citizens, free of ancient tribalisms mysticisms identities. Unfortunately, for very understandable reasons factors for which nobody is to blame and are ultimately rooted in economic ignorance, like a rocket that is just about to reach orbit but runs out of fuel and comes crashing down to earth, Zionism would inadvertently pull Jewish identity and all of Western civilization back to an increasingly ethnocentric identity worldview with disastrous consequences. Instead of having an identity or culture that could spread the truth, that freedom and individual rights were increasing and anti-Semitism, along with slavery, unequal treatment of women, etc., was decreasing, we now had the evolution of a Zionist identity that would be incentivized and grow by doing the opposite, by bringing attention to, amplifying and attempting to eradicate anti-Semitism, not by understanding its numerous underlying fallacies, but by violence, force, vilification, separation, etc. A process that could only lead to polarizations like World War II and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Just like the Christianity of the Spanish Inquisition would evolve, so would Judaism become sort of Zionized. Wanting to win the support of Jews everywhere for their first world war against Germany, on November 2, 1917, via the Balfour Declaration, the British government officially made it a policy to help create a national home for Jews in Palestine. Former Prime Minister James Balfour mentioned in a cabinet meeting that, the vast majority of Jews in Russia and America now appear to be favorable to Zionism. If we could make a declaration favorable to such an ideal, we should be able to carry on extremely useful propaganda in both Russia and America. British Prime Minister during World War I Lloyd George added that, the Zionist leaders gave us a definite promise that, if the Allies committed themselves to giving facilities for the establishment of a national home for the Jews in Palestine, they would do their best to rally to the Allied cause. What about the 700,000 or so Arabs who already inhabited Palestine? When the First World War ended, 1918, and the victors, British French US, were deciding what to do with the acquired lands, Palestine, in order to better understand the wishes of the local population regarding the possibility of creating a Jewish state in the land, the USA organized the King Crane Commission. Among their findings recommendations were, we recommend, serious modification of the extreme Zionist program for Palestine of unlimited immigration of Jews, looking finally to making Palestine distinctly a Jewish state, the fact came out repeatedly in the Commission's conference with Jewish representatives, that the Zionists looked forward to a practically complete dispossession of the present non-Jewish inhabitants of Palestine, by various forms of purchase. It is to be remembered that the non-Jewish population of Palestine, nearly nine-tenths of the whole, are emphatically against the entire Zionist program, there was no one thing upon which the population of Palestine were more agreed than upon this. To subject a people so minded to unlimited Jewish immigration, and to steady financial and social pressure to surrender the land, would be a gross violation of the principle just quoted, and of the people's rights, it is to be noted also that the feeling against the Zionist program is not confined to Palestine, but shared very generally by the people throughout Syria, as our conferences clearly showed. The peace conference should not shut its eyes to the fact that the anti-Zionist feeling in Palestine and Syria is intense and not likely to be flouted. No British officer, consulted by the commissioners, believed that the Zionist program could be carried out except by force of arms, that of itself is evidence of a strong sense of the injustice of the Zionist program, on the part of the non-Jewish populations of Palestine and Syria. Decisions, requiring armies to carry out, are sometimes necessary, but they are surely not gratuitously to be taken in the interests of a serious injustice. For the initial claim, often submitted by Zionist representatives, that they have a right to Palestine, based on an occupation of 2,000 years ago, can hardly be seriously considered, the places which are most sacred to Christians those having to do with Jesus and which are also sacred to Muslims, are not only not sacred to Jews, but abhorrent to them. It is simply impossible, under those circumstances, 
for Muslims and Christians to feel satisfied to have these places in Jewish hands, or under the custody of Jews. In fact, from this point of view, the Muslims, just because the sacred places of all three religions are sacred to them, have made very naturally much more satisfactory custodians of the holy places than the Jews could be, in view of all these considerations, and with a deep sense of sympathy for the Jewish cause, the commissioners feel bound to recommend that only a greatly reduced Zionist program be attempted by the peace conference, and even that, only very gradually initiated. This would have to mean that Jewish immigration should be definitely limited, and that the project for making Palestine distinctly a Jewish commonwealth should be given up. A group of prominent Arab Muslims and Christians sent a letter to the Paris Peace Conference, 1919, expressing their opposition to Zionism. The principles of justice and equity cannot admit of the crushing of a nation by an influx of a greater number of another foreign nation that will assimilate her. The country is ours and has been so of old. We have lived in it longer than they did, and have worked in it more than they did. Our historical and religious relations with it, we Muslims and Christians, far exceed those of the Jews. Therefore, their claim to their ancient historical rights in the country do not give them the right of appropriating it, inasmuch as in our historical rights we Arabs cannot justify our claims in Spain, our old home, where our rule and glory flourished for eight centuries and this gave birth to the modern civilization of Europe. Does justice then allow of the violation of the rights of the majority? But the imperialist attitude of the British Europeans is perfectly captured by former Prime Minister Lord Balfour who said at the time, I am quite unable to see why heaven or any other power should object to our telling the Muslim what he ought to think and, for in Palestine we do not propose to even go through the form of consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants of the country though the American, King Crane, Commission is going through the form of asking what they are. The four great powers, Britain, France, Italy and the United States, are committed to Zionism. And Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age-long traditions, in present needs, and future hopes, of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. If the Palestinians' natives had some form of truly representative government the Zionist era could have been prevented, but to a significant degree this was not to be thanks to Zionism's perhaps most influential ally, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill grew up with many influential Jewish acquaintances which was a result of his father Lord Randolph Churchill's numerous Jewish friendships. On one occasion when Lord Randolph was asked why he did not bring over some of his Jewish friends to a party he replied, comma, I did not think they would be very amused by the company. Historian Martin Gilbert summarizes, Winston Churchill's commitment to Jewish rights, to Zionism, and ultimately to the State of Israel never wavered. In 1922, he established on the bedrock of international law the right of Jews to emigrate to Palestine. During his meeting with David Ben Goyon in 1960, Churchill presented the Israeli Prime Minister with an article he had written about Moses, praising the Patriarch. In between these events he fought harder and more effectively for the Jewish people than the world has ever realized. During the First World War, serving as First Lord of the Admiralty, Churchill faced a growing shortage of acetone, which was needed as part of the process used to make cordite, an essential naval explosive. Heim Weizmann just happened to be a chemist and was able to solve this problem thus increasing his influence with leading British authorities. When Prime Minister David Lloyd George asked Weizmann what he wanted for payment, according to Lloyd George, Weizmann said the rights to Palestine. During the years 1920-1922 Churchill was the colonial secretary allowing him to call the shots in the British-controlled Middle East. On May 12, 1921 Palestinian representatives, sent the colonial office resolutions asking for representative government, and the annulling of the Balfour Declaration, but on May 31 Churchill told the British cabinet that, he had decided to suspend the development of representative institutions in Palestine owing to the fact that any elected body would undoubtedly prohibit further immigration of Jews by 1939 the British were no longer in favor of a Jewish state or distinctively Jewish national home as had been implied by the Balfour Declaration, 
but were now in favor of a single Palestinian state where Jews and Arabs would get along as equals. On May 23, 1939 Churchill gave a speech in the House of Commons attacking this change in policy. He said, to whom was the pledge of the Balfour Declaration made? It was not made to the Jews of Palestine, it was not made to those who were actually living in Palestine. It was made to world Jewry, and in particular to the Zionist associations. It was in consequence of and on the basis of this pledge that we received important help in the war World War I, it is important to note how Churchill is admitting that Zionist Jews helped them win World War I against Germany. About a month earlier on April 1, 1939 that crazy and irrational maniacal non-human Hitler gave a speech where he mentioned what right, for example, has England to shoot down Arabs in Palestine just because they defend their homeland, who gives them this right? In his classic essay written in 1923 titled The Iron Wall, leading Zionist Vladimir Jabotinsky writes, we hold that Zionism is moral and just. And since it is moral and just, justice must be done, no matter whether Joseph or Simon or Ivan or Ahmet agree with it or not. There is no other morality. The socialists, fooled themselves into morally justifying the coercion and killing of the non-socialists, and understandably the same would increasingly happen with the Zionists. A bunch of largely secular atheistic racist white Europeans, many who were thoroughly convinced they were superior to the Arabs, culturally they are 500 years behind us dash Jabotinsky, trying to carve themselves a country in Palestine due to anti-Semitic fallacies in Europe, was a mistake. Let us now somewhat pause our discussion solely focused on Zionism and resulting Israeli state and look at World War II which was overwhelmingly the continuation of the fallacies and hatreds that fueled World War I as well as polarizations arising from Jew-Gentile misunderstandings and the expanding Zionist mindset itself. World War II begins and escalates towards total slaughter. Most historians today and wise politicians during the lead-up to World War II felt like Hitler's demands that Danzig should be reunited with Germany were very reasonable and legitimate goals. For example, former U.S. President Herbert Hoover criticized the Roosevelt administration's virulent anti-Hitler stance when he wrote, Another action by Mr. Roosevelt was his influence upon the Poles not to negotiate the question of Danzig. The adamant attitude of the Poles against negotiations received support from the Washington administration. The separation of the German city of Danzig from Germany, had long been a cause of agitation by the Germans. Both were a part of vengeance and there was merit in the German claims. I had stated at one time that they should be corrected. British Ambassador in Berlin, Neville Henderson, in a letter to Sir Horace Wilson who was British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's close advisor writes, I regard Hitler's proposals as a fair basis of negotiation and in my innermost heart I regard the Poles as exceedingly unwise to make enemies of Germany, and as dangerous allies for us. I am personally convinced that there can be no permanent peace in Europe until Danzig has reverted to Germany. The Poles cannot be masters of 400,000 Germans in Danzig, ergo Germany must be. I fear that we are again on a bad wicket as we were over the Zudeten. Hitler's success at overturning some of the wrongs of the Treaty of Versailles, such as reuniting the Zudetenland Germans and previously Austrians who overwhelmingly welcomed the move, was of course propagandized by many, especially Jews for understandable reasons, as the result of some militaristic evil madman bent on world conquest similarly to how the Kaiser had been wrongly cartoonishly portrayed in World War I. The combination of bad blood remaining from World War I 20 years earlier, the understandably bad publicity given Hitler's crass anti-Semitism, the 1935 racist and anti-Semitic Nuremberg laws, and the government-sanctioned cruelty of events like Kristallnacht, November 9 10, 1938 where thousands of Jewish properties were vandalized had the obvious effect of turning Jews and those who rightly sympathized with their suffering against him making it nearly impossible to undo the wrongs of the Treaty of Versailles without sparks that would eventually lead to war. Regarding U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, who was obviously one of the main protagonists in the war, historian Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr., himself a Jew, noted that no president had appointed so many Jews to public office. 
No president had surrounded himself with so many Jewish advisors. Roosevelt's numerous leading Jewish friendships like Rabbi Stephen S. Wise president of both the American Jewish Congress and the World Jewish Congress at the time, Supreme Court Justices Louis Brandeis and Felix Frankfurter, Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau Jr., senior U.S. Treasury Department official and Soviet spy who was such a close friend of Roosevelt, that he actually lived in the White House, Harry Dexter White. Brain Trust members like banker James Warburg and lawyer Benjamin Cohen, and many more friendships, coupled with the understandable desire to be seen as a great leader of the free world against the dictators who were obviously mistreating a historically powerless minority, would fuel a certain naive idealism leading him to encourage both the English and Poles not to give in to Hitler's legitimate demands. British Secretary of Foreign Affairs Lord Halifax, although initially sympathetic to Hitler's foreign policy, understandably became much more bellicose towards Hitler's demands after the anti-Semitic riots of Kristallnacht, and later became one of the leading statesmen blocking a reasonable diplomatic resolution and leading to war. Again, the stupidity of things like the Nuremberg Laws, the numerous Jewish friendships of both Churchill and Roosevelt, and their understandable desire to be seen as great leaders in some great moral crusade of good versus evil would both solidify a bond between them, and unfortunately mistakenly prevent Hitler from overturning the legitimate wrongs of Versailles. Understandably, American Jews' cry for war against Hitler would reach fever pitch and play an important role in both, preventing diplomacy from avoiding war, and then further escalating the war by bringing the US into the conflict. On February 9, 1938, almost seven months before the outbreak of war, the Polish ambassador in Washington, Count Jerzy Potocki, reported back home to the foreign minister in Warsaw on the Jewish role in influencing American foreign policy, the pressure of the Jews on President Roosevelt, and on the State Department is becoming ever more powerful, the Jews are right now the leaders in creating a war psychosis which would plunge the entire world into war and bring about general catastrophe. This mood is becoming more and more apparent, in their definition of democratic states, the Jews have also created real chaos, they have mixed together the idea of democracy and communism and have above all raised the banner of burning hatred against Nazism. This hatred has become a frenzy. It is propagated everywhere and by every means, in theatres, in the cinema, and in the press. The Germans are portrayed as a nation living under the arrogance of Hitler which wants to conquer the whole world and drown all of humanity in an ocean of blood. In conversations with Jewish press representatives I have repeatedly come up against the inexorable and convinced view that war is inevitable. This international jury exploits every means of propaganda to oppose any tendency towards any kind of consolidation and understanding between nations. In this way, the conviction is growing steadily but surely in public opinion here that the Germans and their satellites, in the form of fascism, are enemies who must be subdued by the democratic world. Under Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal's December 27, 1945 diary entry also documents the immense pro-war ideological role Jews and America Roosevelt played, played golf today with Joe Kennedy. I asked him about his conversations with Roosevelt and Neville Chamberlain from 1938 on. He said Chamberlain's position in 1938 was that England had nothing with which to fight, and that she could not risk going to war with Hitler. Neither the French nor the British would have made Poland a cause of war if it had not been for the constant needling from Washington. Chamberlain, he says, stated that America, and the world Jews had forced England into the war. In his telephone conversation with Roosevelt in the summer of 1939 the president kept telling him to put some iron up Chamberlain's backside. With increasing ill-treatment of the Danzigers at the hands of the Polish authorities, who thanks to recently acquired defense guarantees by England and France could increase their jingoism, and negligence of Hitler's legitimate concerns, Hitler finally invaded Poland on September 1, 1939, and his ally Stalin would also invade Poland on September 17. Referring to Hitler, famed British war historian B. H. Liddell Hart wrote, At first he did not think of moving against Poland, even though she possessed the largest stretch of territory carved out of Germany after World War I. Hitler was inclined to accept Poland as a junior partner for the time being, 
on condition that she handed back the German port of Danzig and granted Germany a free route to East Prussia through the Polish corridor. On Hitler's part, it was a remarkably moderate demand in the circumstances. But in successive discussions that winter, Hitler found that the Poles were obstinately disinclined to make any such concessions, and also had an inflated idea of their own strength. Even so, he continued to hope that they would come round after further negotiation. As late as March 25 he told his army commander-in-chief that he did not wish to solve the Danzig problem by the use of force. The Polish guarantee was the surest way to produce an early explosion, and a world war, it incited Hitler to demonstrate the futility of such a guarantee to a country out of reach from the West, while making the stiff-necked Poles even less inclined to consider any concession to him, and at the same time making it impossible for him to draw back without losing face. Why did Poland's rulers accept such a fatal offer? Partly because they had an absurdly exaggerated idea of the power of their out-of-date forces, they boastfully talked of a cavalry ride to Berlin. Partly because of personal factors, Colonel Beck, shortly afterwards, said that he made up his mind to accept the British offer between two flicks of the ash off the cigarette he was smoking. He went on to explain that at his meeting with Hitler in January, he had found it hard to swallow Hitler's remark that Danzig must be handed back, and that when the British offer was communicated to him he saw it, and seized it, as a chance to give Hitler a slap in the face. This impulse was only too typical of the ways in which the fate of peoples if often decided. Professor Denson writes, the real irony of the beginning of World War II is that it started over Danzig and the Polish corridor question, which both the British and French political leaders found to be the most indefensible part of the treaty and one which most needed to be revised peacefully. Hitler made numerous offers to the Allies and to Poland for settlement of the corridor question, one being to take Danzig back and letting the people inside the corridor remain subjects of the Polish government. Another offer was to let the people within the corridor vote on which government they wanted. The British and the French, who were formal allies of Poland, pushed the Poles to accept these offers from Hitler. Britain and France also requested that President Roosevelt push the Poles to accept Hitler's offers, but Roosevelt refused even to discuss the matter with Poland's representatives. The Polish government arrogantly refused even to reply to these offers, and Hitler finally attacked Poland on September 1, 1939. Because of their treaty obligations, France and England then declared war against Germany on September 3 but refused to assist Poland in any way. Hitler had not expected the British and French to go to war over a treaty provision that they knew and declared to him to be completely unfair to Germany, and to her people located in Danzig and the Corridor. The French and British war on Germany was called the phony war because there was little activity on either side. However, in April and May of 1940, the Germans shocked the world by defeating the French in about 35 days of combat, and drove an allied army of 335,000 men, who were mostly British, to the beach at Dunkirk where they were hopelessly trapped. Hitler gave orders to allow the helpless British army to escape in order to demonstrate dramatically that he had no quarrel with the British and desperately wanted to negotiate a treaty with them. He thought that a massacre at Dunkirk would inflame British public opinion and preclude a settlement with them. However, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister on May 10, 1940, and not only did he refuse to negotiate, but he immediately initiated bombing raids on German cities and civilians. War propaganda by the Allies, including America, has always stated that Hitler started the bombing of cities with his attack on the British city of Coventry, but the records now clearly indicate that Churchill initiated this. Taylor, the British historian, comments on this propaganda by stating that there was almost universal belief that Hitler started the indiscriminate bombing of civilians, whereas it was started by the directors of British strategy as some of the more honest among them have boasted. During the summer of 1940, after the bombing of civilians in German cities by the British, Hitler again tried desperately to reach a settlement with Churchill, but Churchill flatly refused to negotiate. It was not until November 1940 that Hitler retaliated by bombing British civilians and cities that were not military targets, such as Coventry. Next we discuss a bit of World War II history in chronological order. 
August 23, 1939, Hitler and Stalin agree to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. A week before Hitler invades Poland, Hitler and Stalin agree to a deal where they would not fight each other, this was made public to the world, and dissolve Poland thus undoing its recreation brought about by the Treaty of Versailles, this was not made public. Hitler felt like with such a deal the British and French would really have to be out of their minds by agreeing to come to a surrounded Poland's aid and thus fighting both Germany and the Soviet Union. Stalin basically wanted all the land that Russia had controlled since 1772, and by encouraging Hitler to potentially fight with the imperialist capitalist powers of England France US it would ultimately make it easier to spread communism. Besides the carnage, Stalin's plan worked. Schultz Ronhoff, September 1, 1939, Hitler invades Poland. With ethnic Germans living in Polish territory subject to increasing acts of violence given the political tensions, and little progress made in peacefully solving the Danzig issue with the Poles now that they have firm British, French, and American support, Hitler throws in the towel and invades Poland from the west. It is vitally important to understand the seemingly obvious fact that Hitler invaded Poland, not due to some evil madman attempting to conquer the world as simplistic Zionist sort of mythology portrays things, but as Hitler's perceived need to solve the Danzig issue by force. Vladimir Putin, whose Russia suffered so much in the war summarizes in his famed interview with Turka Carlson, in 1939 after Poland cooperated with Hitler, Hitler offered Poland peace and a treaty of friendship. An alliance demanding in return that Poland give back to Germany the so-called Danzig Corridor, which connected the bulk of Germany with East Prussia. After World War I this territory was transferred to Poland. Hitler asked them to give it amicably but they refused. Poland turned out to be uncompromising and Hitler had nothing to do but start implementing his plans, war, with Poland. Two days later on September 3 England and France declare war on Germany. Two days later on the 5th, leading Jewish figure Heim Weizmann, would declare in the London Times, I wish to confirm in the most explicit manner, the declaration which I and my colleagues made during the last months, and especially in the last week, that the Jews stand by Great Britain and will fight on the side of the democracies. Our urgent desire is to give effect to these declarations. We wish to do so in a way entirely consonant with the general scheme of British action, and therefore would place ourselves, in matters big and small, under the coordinating direction of His Majesty's government. The Jewish Agency is ready to enter into immediate arrangements for utilizing Jewish manpower, technical ability, resources, etc. On September 17, after signing a ceasefire with Japan, the Soviet Union invades Poland from the east. England and France do not declare war against the Soviet Union although it too obviously invades Poland. It was Hitler who was relentlessly trying to undo the Treaty of Versailles, and always having to resort to threats of physical force in order to get his way. Also, obviously, Hitler's crass antisemitism would ensure that Jews spread a fanatical hatred of Hitler. Poland surrenders on 27th. The phony war begins, where having achieved his goals Hitler hopes that cooler heads will prevail and the hostilities can end without further escalation. More insight into how Hitler saw things and his hopes of averting a world war can be seen in the following passage by Albert Speer who was Hitler's main architect and close acquaintance, Hitler's view that the West would once more give in to his demands as it had done at Munich was supported by intelligence information, an officer on the British general staff was said to have evaluated the strength of the Polish army and come to the conclusion that Polish resistance would soon collapse. Hitler thus had reason to hope that the British general staff would do everything in its power to advise its government against so hopeless a war. When, on September 3, the Western powers followed up their ultimatum with declarations of war, Hitler was initially stunned, but quickly reassured himself and us by saying that England and France had obviously declared war merely as a sham, in order not to lose face before the whole world. In spite of the declarations there would be no fighting, he was convinced of that, he said. He therefore ordered the Wehrmacht to remain strictly on the defensive. He felt that this decision of his showed remarkable political acumen. 
During those last days of August Hitler was in an unwanted state of nerves and at times completely lost the reassuring air of infallible leader, to his round table he explained of course we are in a state of war with England and France, but if we on our side avoid all acts of war, the whole business will evaporate. As soon as we sink a ship and they have sizable casualties, the war party over there will gain strength. Even when German U-boats lay in a favorable position near the French battleship, Dunkirk he refused to authorize an attack. April 9, 1940. Germans foil Churchill's Operation Wilfred in order to prevent Churchill's plan, Operation Wilfred, to cut off iron ore supplies to Germany by the illegal mining of neutral Norwegian waters, Germany invades Denmark and Norway and deals England a mini defeat. Although this was Churchill's plan, the political fallout over this defeat brings down the Chamberlain government and on May 10 Churchill becomes Prime Minister. War hysteria created an environment that favored a militarist mindset, and this led to the sort of natural selection of Churchill who was the number one war hawk. On the same day Germany invades France, thus bringing an end to the phony war, and defeats France in about 46 days. It was time for Churchill to live his life's ambition to command great victorious armies in battle. In Hayek, A Life, 1899-1950 Caldwell and Hansjörg Wright, with newly acquired airbases in France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, the German war machine and its bombers were suddenly much closer. Hitler was hoping to negotiate a peace with the British as he had with the French, but Winston Churchill, Prime Minister only since May 10, the very day the invasion began, was immovable. His We Shall Fight on the Beaches speech before the House of Commons on June 4, 1940, made clear that negotiation was not in the cards. Real war had begun. April to May 1940. Soviets commit the Katyn massacre. The Soviet Secret Service, NKVD at the time, executes over 15,000 prominent Poles, army officers, priests, intellectuals, etc., and disposes of their bodies in the Katyn forest. July 8, 1940. Churchill, bring him Hitler, back on July 8, 1940 Churchill writes to the Minister of Aircraft Production, when I look around to see how we can win the war I see that there is only one short path. We have no continental army which can defeat the German military power. Should, Hitler, not try invasion, of Britain, there is one thing that will bring him back and bring him down, and that is an absolutely devastating, exterminating attack by very heavy bombers from this country upon the Nazi homeland. We must be able to overwhelm them by this means, without which I do not see a way through. We cannot accept any aim lower than air mastery. With respect to Churchill's escalation of the bombing and Hitler's desire to avert war with England, Boog, Krebs, and Vogel write, the Royal Air Force meanwhile began its air raids on targets in Germany east of the Rhine on 5 May 1940 because of the totally inadequate bombsites of the Bomber Command bombers and the resulting horrendous inaccuracy, these strikes had the effect of terror raids on towns and villages, even though they were intended to be directed against military and industrial targets. The Luftwaffe made its first raids on military and economic objects in England only about seven weeks after the conclusion of the French campaign. As Hitler was still hoping Britain might give in, he expressly forbade attacks on London and against civilian targets. Crews were punished if they did so nevertheless, deliberately or unintentionally. It was in this situation that, during the night of 24-5 August 1940, a few German bombs were inadvertently dropped on the London area. Even British press at the time described the damage as exceedingly slight, and the official British history later confirmed that this had been a mistake by a German bomber. Churchill, however, exaggerated and exploited this incident to bring about a further escalation of the bombing war by ordering air attacks on Berlin. One British RAF member described a bombing operation as follows, Normally it was not difficult to find the target area, but almost impossible to be anywhere near a specific target, so we just dropped the bombs at an estimated position and hoped for the best. I very much doubt if we ever hit a specific target only one in five planes was able to drop its bombs within five miles of intended target. Arthur Bomber Harris, 
the eventual head of British Bomber Command, saw civilian death as necessary, encouraged, and totally justified. He wrote that, it should be emphasized that the destruction of houses, public utilities, transport and lives, the creation of a refugee problem on an unprecedented scale, and the breakdown of morale both at home and at the battlefronts by fear of extended and intensified bombing, are accepted and intended aims of bombing policy. They are not by-products of attempts to hit factories. September 4, 1940 Hitler's speech about Churchill's nighttime terror bombing and subsequent blitz on September 4, 1940 Hitler gave a speech and said, It is truly magnificent to see our Volk at war and its total discipline. We realize this all the more in a time when Mr. Churchill is demonstrating to us the use of his invention, the nightly air raid. He does not do this because air raids at night are particularly effective, but because his air force cannot penetrate German airspace during the day. While the German pilots, the German planes, fly over English land day by day, no Englishman has yet managed to as much as cross the North Sea by daylight. That is why they come at night and drop their bombs you know it well indiscriminately and without plan on civilian residential centers, on farmsteads, and villages. Wherever they see a light, they drop a bomb. The inaccurate nighttime British bombers kept on coming. Churchill succeeded at bring him back when on September 7 Hitler began the famous blitz where many British cities would be frequently bombed for eight months, till May 11, 1941, leading to the deaths of 40,000 people. Yet these bombings were still not purposeful annihilations of civilians. This is less than 170 people per day in one of the biggest metropolis, London, in the world with 8.5 million inhabitants at the time. Hayek, who was living in London during the Blitz writes to his friend, economist Fritz Mockloop, on October 13, 1940, life here in London is amazingly unchanged. Some night, sick, have been unpleasant, and once or twice even we out here have had bombs uncomfortably close. But on the whole, the effects of the German attacks are, at least in the part of London which I regularly see, extraordinarily small. I think any visitor who did not know would think that London had been bombed for one night rather than for one month. In Operation Gomorrah which began on July 24, 1943 and lasted just eight days, the British and US bombed Hamburg and tied the Blitz by also killing over 40,000 people, 5,000 per day, and injuring another 30,000 with many more left homeless. At the time it had been the most intense and deadly bombing in history and would later be called the Hiroshima of Germany by some British officials. But by this time the British and Americans were not needlessly slaughtering fellow Homo sapiens, they were slaughtering the progenitors and offspring of the evil Nazis. June 22, 1941 Hitler invades the Soviet Union. Historian Timothy Snyder nicely captures Stalin's thoughts at the outbreak of war when he wrote, in agreeing to divide Eastern Europe with Hitler, he hoped to divert the armed conflict to Western Europe, where Britain and France would have to deal with the Germans. From a Soviet ideological perspective, this meant that the contradictions of capitalism were working themselves out on the battlefield, with help of a nudge from Soviet diplomacy. From Stalin's tactical perspective, the best way to fight a war was to allow others to bleed themselves white, and then move to take the spoils. From Hitler's perspective and intelligence he decided to invade the Soviet Union by surprise before Stalin could move to take the spoils as he was planning. A few days later on the 26th, former U.S. President Herbert Hoover, while preparing a speech to the American people, writes to his friend John C. O'Loughlin, I am convinced Germany will defeat Russia, and dispose of that infecting center of communism. And I am convinced that at the end of the campaign, which I think will move rapidly, that Hitler will propose terms to the British that they will accept. On the 29th Hoover begged his fellow countrymen not to enter the war and aid the tyrannical Soviet Union. Lots of wisdom in this long quote, Hoover said, Six weeks ago I made a statement to the American people upon the relation of the United States to this war. That address has received large approval. It has naturally been disliked by the extremists. That is the psychosis of war. 
that disease has two outstanding symptoms. Those who catch it lose their reason in the fever of emotion. And in that fever intolerance rises to a pitch where it seeks to frighten men from free speech by defamation, the last seven days that call to sacrifice American boys for an ideal has been made as sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. For now we find ourselves promising aid to Stalin and his militant communist conspiracy against the whole democratic ideals of the world. Collaboration between Britain and Russia will bring them military values, but it makes the whole argument of our joining the war to bring the four freedoms to mankind a gargantuan jest. We had better refresh our memories a little. Four American presidents and four secretaries of state beginning with Woodrow Wilson refused to have anything to do with Soviet Russia on the ground of morals and democratic ideals. They even refused diplomatic recognition. They did so because here is one of the bloodiest tyrannies and terrors ever erected in history. It destroyed every semblance of human rights and human liberty, it is a militant destroyer of the worship of God. It brutally executes millions of innocent people without the semblance of justice. It has enslaved the rest. Moreover, it has violated every international covenant, it has carried on a world conspiracy against all democracy, including the United States. And do I need to prove that it continued doing this down to seven days ago? When Russia was recognized by the United States in 1933, the Soviets entered into a solemn agreement that they would refrain from any propaganda, any organization or in any way whatsoever to injure the tranquility, prosperity, order or security in any part of the United States. Seven years later, the Dyes Committee reported unanimously and specifically that the Communist Party in the United States is a Moscow conspiracy, masked as a political party, that its activities constitute a violation of the Treaty of Recognition, that under instructions from Moscow the Communists had violated the law of the United States, that throughout the entire time they had been supplied with funds, from Moscow for activities against the American people and the American government. The Dyes Committee only confirmed what most Americans already know. Is the word of Stalin any better than the word of Hitler? On August 22, 1939, Stalin entered into an agreement with Hitler through which there should be joint onslaught on the democracies of the world. Nine days later Stalin attacked the Poles jointly with Hitler and destroyed the freedom of a great and democratic people. Fourteen days later Stalin destroyed the independence of democratic Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Ninety days later on came the unprovoked attack by Russia on democratic Finland. Is that not aggression and is not every case a hideous violation of treaties and international law? Stalin has taken advantage of the very freedoms of democracy to destroy them with the most potent fifth column in all history. He contributed to the destruction of France. He has daily implanted class hate in America and a stealthy war against our institutions, if we go further and join the war and we win, then we have won for Stalin the grip of communism on Russia and more opportunity for it to extend in the world. We should at least cease to tell our sons that they would be giving their lives to restore democracy and freedom to the world. But by June 1941 it was too late, the remaining hatreds towards Germany from World War I, the fascination and sympathy people had towards communist socialist ideology, of which Mises writes, it is on the complete victory of the socialist idea in the last decades that the great power of Russian Bolshevism rests. What makes Bolshevism strong is not the Soviets' artillery and machine guns but the fact that the whole world receives its ideas, sympathetically, and the understandable anti-Hitler psychosis Jews were spreading just expanded the good versus evil mentality in war. It goes without saying that Churchill and Roosevelt immediately offered help to Stalin whom they would affectionately refer to as Uncle Joe. As Churchill said, I have only one purpose, the destruction of Hitler, and my life is much simplified thereby. If Hitler invaded hell I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. U.S. aid to the Soviet Union won the war for Stalin and the communist expansion that followed the war. As Stalin himself admitted when he said without American production the United Nations allies, could never have won the war by the end of the war America delivered over 400,000 jeeps and trucks, 
10,000 tanks, total German tank production for 1943 was 11,601 tanks, 10,000 artillery pieces, 14,500 aircraft, 35,000 motorcycles, 2.6 million tons of petroleum products, gasoline and oil, 4.4 million tons of food, entire factories were shipped too, and much more. The initial invasion of eastern Poland by the Soviets and then its invasion by the Germans as they invaded Russia helps highlight the horrible luck Jews had by their association with both capitalism and communism. Snyder writes that, Jews provided the connection between peasants and markets, countryside and city. In other words, much of what Soviet officials would see as speculation, profiteering, and the like was commercial activity usually carried out by Jews. In Poland's Volhynia district, for example, 75% of the registered traders, 14,587 of the 19,337, were Jews, the ceaseless Soviet propaganda against commerce as such was, in fact though not in intention, directed against Jews, and weakened their standing. As the Soviet secret police, NKVD, swept in, Many of these businessmen capitalist exploiters would surely meet a horrible fate either by shooting or deportation to the dreaded Soviet labor camps gulags. Then as the Germans swept in, it would be the special German units known as the Einsatzgruppe which tasked with eliminating the Polish and Soviet power structures that would kill many Jews due to their association with communism. Contrary to many myths surrounding and exaggerating the suffering of Jews in World War II, the German Einsatzgruppen were never specifically tasked with the annihilation of Jews, Jews were simply one of the many victims associated with their larger task of dismantling German opposition. Snyder, who is Jewish and serves on the Committee on Conscience of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, explains, sometimes the Einsatzgruppen who followed the Wehrmacht into the Soviet Union are presented as unstoppable agents of evil with an unambiguous program of total killing. In this argument, the men of the Einsatzgruppen knew from the beginning, regardless of whether or not there was a plan, that they were supposed to kill all of the Jews. An image emerges of the Einsatzgruppen as special anti-Semitic units with perfect knowledge and exclusive responsibility. But this was not, in fact, the case. The Einsatzgruppen had orders to shoot some Jews from the beginning, but not to shoot them all. Their initial instructions mentioned Jews as one category among others. Their basic task at the beginning of the invasion of the Soviet Union was to demolish the state, as they had done in Poland. Thus their targets were groups thought to be mainstays of the Soviet regime. In Poland this had meant educated Poles, in the Soviet Union this meant, as the Nazis saw matters, communists and Jewish males, the myth of their Einsatzgruppen, Total responsibility arose during post-war trials. September 10, 1941. Heim Weizmann sends a letter to Churchill mentioning how Jews helped England defeat Germany in World War I by bringing the United States into the war and how they will help England do the same thing again, two years have passed since, on the outbreak of the war I offered to His Majesty's government, on behalf of the Jewish people, the fullest active support of Jews in Palestine and throughout the world. I have spent months in America, traveling up and down the country, and clearly searching the American scene. Forces over there are finely balanced, the position is uncertain. There is only one big ethnic group which is willing to stand, to a man, for Great Britain, and a policy of all-out aid for her, the five million American Jews. From Secretary Morgenthau, Governor Lehman, Justice Frankfurter, down to the simplest Jewish workman or trader, they are conscious of all that this struggle against Hitler implies. It has been repeatedly acknowledged by British statesmen that it was the Jews who, in the last war, effectively helped to tip the scales in America in favor of Great Britain. They are keen to do it, and may do it, again. Again, totally understandable from a Jewish identity perspective. These five million highly educated, motivated, scared, and understandably vengeful people would intensify the naive good versus evil mindset needed to both start and eventually bring the US into the war. Again, not their fault. An understandable reaction to anti-Semitism. The chicken came before the egg, or wait, no. 
the egg came before the chicken. September 11, 1941. Charles Lindbergh provides much needed wise advice. We quote from a marvelous speech given by American hero at the time, the first man to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, Charles Lindbergh. A day after Weizmann's letter to Churchill letting him know how the Jews are keen to push America into a world war again, two years into the war, but about three months before the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941 which would bring the U.S. into the war, Lindbergh wisely and compassionately advises Americans, especially Jews, to stay away from the conflict, bold emphasis mine, when this war started in Europe, it was clear that the American people were solidly opposed to entering it. Why shouldn't we be? We had the best defensive position in the world, we had a tradition of independence from Europe, and the one time we did take part in a European war left European problems unsolved, and debts to America unpaid. National polls showed that when England and France declared war on Germany, in 1939, less than 10% of our population favored a similar course for America. But there were various groups of people, here and abroad, whose interests and beliefs necessitated the involvement of the United States in the war. I shall point out some of these groups tonight, and outline their methods of procedure. In doing this, I must speak with the utmost frankness, for in order to counteract their efforts, we must know exactly who they are. The three most important groups who have been pressing this country toward war are the British, the Jewish and the Roosevelt administration. As you all know, we were left with the depths of the last European war, and unless we are more cautious in the future than we have been in the past, we will be left with the depths of the present case. If it were not for her hope that she can make us responsible for the war financially, as well as militarily, I believe England would have negotiated a peace in Europe many months ago, and be better off for doing so. England has devoted, and will continue to devote every effort to get us into the war. We know that she spent huge sums of money in this country during the last war in order to involve us. Englishmen have written books about the cleverness of its use. We know that England is spending great sums of money for propaganda in America during the present war. The second major group I mentioned is the Jewish. It is not difficult to understand why Jewish people desire the overthrow of Nazi Germany. The persecution they suffered in Germany would be sufficient to make bitter enemies of any race. No person with a sense of the dignity of mankind can condone the persecution of the Jewish race in Germany. But no person of honesty and vision can look on their pro-war policy here today without seeing the dangers involved in such a policy both for us and for them. Instead of agitating for war, the Jewish groups in this country should be opposing it in every possible way for they will be among the first to feel its consequences. Tolerance is a virtue that depends upon peace and strength. History shows that it cannot survive war and devastations. A few far-sighted Jewish people realize this and stand opposed to intervention. But the majority still do not. Such reasonable and unfortunately prophetic statements led to accusations that Lindbergh was an anti-Semite even though, as his wife would tell a journalist in 1980, in the 45 years I lived with him I never heard him make a remark against Jews, not a crack or a joke, neither did any of my children. December 3, 1942. Weizmann, this war is our war, and that it is waged for the liberation of Jewry. After the war broke out, Heim Weizmann mentioned the obvious, this war is our war and that it is waged for the liberation of Jewry. In a speech on December 3, 1942, in New York he mentions, we are not denying and are not afraid to confess that this war is our war and that it is waged for the liberation of Jewry. Stronger than all fronts together is our front, that of Jewry. We are not only giving this war our financial support on which the entire war production is based, we are not only providing our full propaganda power which is the moral energy that keeps this war going. The guarantee of victory is predominantly based on weakening the enemy forces, on destroying them in their own country, within the resistance. And we are the Trojan horses in the enemy's fortress. Thousands of Jews living in Europe constitute the principal factor in the destruction of our enemy. There, 
Our front is a fact and the most valuable aid for victory. April 1943, Germans discover the Cut-In Massacre. The Germans discover the Cut-In Massacre and invited the Red Cross and Polish delegations to document verify. The Poles were obviously outraged and bitterly complained to Churchill about the Soviets who are now allied with England. Churchill says the Bolsheviks can be very cruel and tells the Russians we shall certainly oppose vigorously any investigation by the International Red Cross or any other body in any territory under German authority. Such investigation would be a fraud and its conclusions reached by terrorism. Today everyone knows, as confirmed by Mikhail Gorbachev, that Stalin had ordered the massacre for which the Germans were blamed for at the Nuremberg trials as Churchill kept quiet. Can you guess who was the lead judge from the Russian delegation during the Nuremberg trials who fraudulently blamed the Germans for the cut-in massacre and more? Yup, Andre shoot these rabid dogs. Vyshinsky. May 22, 1943, the Hollywood film Mission to Moscow is released, to movie theaters across the US this film was pro-Soviet Union propaganda which had been requested by Roosevelt himself and was based on a likewise titled book by US Ambassador to the Soviet Union Joseph E. Davis who was one of Roosevelt's strongest admirers of Stalin and the Soviet Union. The movie showed how Stalin's Moscow show trials were fair and needed to purge the various saboteurs, and how wonderful the Soviet Union, and Stalin were contrary to what the unenlightened Americans thought. Robert Buckner, the film's producer, mentioned that the film was an expedient lie for political purposes, glossily covering up important facts with full or partial knowledge of their false presentation. On July 8, 1943 in New York City's Polo Grounds Park, Jews Solomon Mikhoels and Itzik Pfeffer, Leaders of the Soviet Union's Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee held the largest pro-Soviet rally ever held in the U.S. with over 50,000 attendees. Ironically both men would later be killed by Stalin once he too wanted to curb Jewish influence. Mikhoels was killed on Stalin's orders, and his death made to look like a car accident. Pfeffer's death was part of one of Stalin's many anti-Jewish purges, which came to be known as the Night of the Murdered Poets where many of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee's leaders were killed. Soviet Jews' inevitable interest, and sympathy with Zionism, and then the creation of Israel, displeased Stalin leading to increased anti-Semitism within the Soviet power structure. When his daughter confronted him about her ex-husband's, Jew, father's troubles, Stalin told her, that first husband of yours was thrown your way by the Zionists, you don't understand. The entire older generation is contaminated with Zionism, and now they are teaching the young people too. In Rosemary Sullivan's book Stalin's Daughter she writes, Stalin was hoping that the new Jewish state would take a pro-Soviet stance, but when Israel leaned toward America, he was furious, it was clear to Stalin that Russian Jews who enthusiastically supported Israel were dangerous Zionists. They had friends and family ties in the United States, if war with America broke out they would betray the USSR, articles began to appear in Pravda, in 1948 accusing literary, music and theater critics, most of whom were Jewish of ideological sabotage. They were branded as rootless cosmopolitans, they were persons without identity and passportless, wanderers. Jews were disloyal by definition. Jews resisted the Soviet project of complete assimilation of national, ethnicities, they identified themselves as Jews. In 1952 twelve members of the Jack would be executed Solomon Mikhoels and Itzik Pfeffer were two victims of this mini-purge of the Jack. Another mini anti-Jewish purge which fortunately did not become a gigantic pogrom due to Stalin's death was the so-called Doctor's Plot which took place between 1952-3. Paranoid about many Jewish doctors being part of a conspiracy to ill-treat Soviet leadership amongst other reasons, Stalin had many arrested and tortured to uncover the plot. According to Nikita Khrushchev, Stalin encouraged the interrogators to beat, beat and, beat again and planned on growing this purge into much larger Jewish deportations. October 1944. Churchill's Naughty Document. Churchill seals the fate of millions with scribbles on a napkin in a meeting in Moscow with Stalin. 
the Soviet Union would be allowed to control 90% of Romania, and 75% of Bulgaria, 50% each in Hungary and Yugoslavia. These percentages would eventually become 100% communist rule. Churchill referred to his napkin as a naughty document. February 4-11, 1945, Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt meet in Yalta to discuss the post-war world order. By this time Germany was retreating on all fronts and virtually defenseless from allied indiscriminate civilian terror bombing, which had been British policy since February 1942. So by the time the Big Three met at Yalta in February 1945, Germany was a sitting duck and Hitler was just three months away from his suicide. Wanting to aid his great friend Uncle Joe Stalin, Churchill ordered the destruction of yet another city, Dresden. From the 13th to the 15th of February, four raids with over 1,200 heavy bombers delivered about 4,000 tons of bombs and incendiary devices. The firestorm by itself incinerated about four square miles in the heart of the city and ultimately about 25,000 died in the bombing. Of a total of 796 British bombers that participated in the raid, only six were lost, with three of those hit by friendly bombing by bombs dropped by aircraft flying over them. The bad press created by such barbarism so late in the war was hard to avoid even when aided by wartime jingoism. Churchill sent a secret memo stating, it seems to me that the moment has come when the question of bombing of German cities simply for the sake of increasing the terror, though under other pretexts, should be reviewed, I feel the need for more precise concentration upon military objectives such as oil and communications behind the immediate battle zone, rather than on mere acts of terror and wanton destruction, however impressive. While at the Yalta conference Churchill gives a toast in Stalin's honor, it is no exaggeration, when I say that we regard Marshal Stalin's life as the most precious to the hopes and hearts of all of us, I walk through this world with greater courage and hope, when I find myself in a relation of friendship and intimacy with this great man, whose fame has gone not only over all Russia, but the world. About a year earlier on January 24, 1944 Churchill wrote to Stalin, I am sure you know that I would never negotiate with the Germans separately and that we tell you every overture they make as you have told us we never thought of making a separate peace even in the year when we were all alone and could have easily made one without serious loss to the British Empire and largely at your expense. As this statement shows, Churchill was well aware of the fact that Hitler never wanted a war with England, and could have easily ended the conflict. Churchill got to fulfill his life's ambition to command great victorious armies in battle. And be a hero to Jews. Earlier at the Tehran Conference on November 28, 1943, Churchill and Stalin had invaded neutral Iran, Roosevelt had been reminded of the horrific nature of Stalin and his regime by former U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union William Bullitt. Roosevelt replied, Bill, I don't dispute your facts they are accurate. I don't dispute the logic of your reasoning. I just have a hunch that Stalin is not that kind of man. Harry Hopkins says he's not and that he doesn't want anything but.